Good morning, everybody. My name is Marcel Hemier. I'm the Inspire Program Manager. What an honor and treat to be with you all. In the DC area yesterday was cold and rainy and dreary. You guys know what I'm talking about. This morning I woke up to a glorious sun, a wonderful, beautiful, crisp winter day. What a day to be inspired. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, that's right. Welcome, everybody. This is HUD headquarters. Again, my name is Marcel Hemio. I'm the Inspire Program Manager. On behalf of the Inspire team and on behalf of the REACT organization and the rest of HUD, if you are not a HUD member, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. We have a great program for you today on the rollout and status of the Inspire policy standards, scoring, operations, and IT work. Each of these work streams are focused on a priority at HUD, the health and safety of our residents. I'll go over a few housekeeping items you'll see on the screen here. For one, um, that you, you see how to connect to Wi-Fi. The restrooms are at the end of the hallway. Uh, if you didn't see them, just either go left or right outside those doors. Um, coffee, food, etc. cetera, uh, you'll find across the way at L'Enfant Plaza and then We'll give you an hour for lunch to get to know each other, to get to know us, and look forward to more of that conversation later on today. Um, also, we are going to be using QR codes today for some polling questions. If you haven't used QR codes, it's okay. We'll walk you through it and make sure that you can give us the kind of feedback that's going to help us improve both as a program and as a presentation type session. Also, we have attendees both with us in person, as you see here at the Brook Monday Auditorium, as well as attendees online. For those online, we're using a Teams Live link. You can send questions via that chat, and we will receive, and we will address them as we can. Um, and if for some reason your question is, is, uh, is long and lengthy, go ahead and send us an email at inspire.hud.gov, and we'll make sure we get to it. Um, as you might expect, with so many people here in this room and also the kind of questions that we've been getting at the other sessions, we may not be able to answer all questions, but we'll try to summarize and aggregate where we can. And if there's some that require more time, we'll get to them back uh, later. But I just want to make sure that we, do, uh, we will acknowledge them. Before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge several colleagues joining us today, including Regional Administrator for HUD's Mid-Atlantic Region, Matthew Heckles. Deputy Regional Administrator in Region 3, Ryan LaFollette. Ryan. Uh, Washington, D.C. Field Office Director, Marvin Turner. Thank you for your leadership and for where we are at today. Now, I would like to introduce one of my heroes, Ms. Dominique Blum, who has served as the General Deputy Assistant Secretary of HUD's Office of Public and Indian Housing since July 2017. Ms. Blum, is responsible for administering and managing a range of programs for low-income families, including the Public Housing Program, Housing Choice Voucher Program, and programs that serve Native Americans totaling more than $37 billion in annual funding. The mission of the Office of Public and Indian Housing is to ensure safe, decent, and affordable housing for low-income families to create opportunities for residents, self-sufficiency, and economic independence and ensure fiscal integrity by all program participants. Please help me to welcome Ms. Dominique Blum. Thank you, Marcel. You bet. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's terrific to be here with you today because we are getting ready. We are getting ready for Inspire. It is right around the corner. Who knows when we're starting public housing inspections? What's the month that we're starting public housing inspections? It's July. I'm giving you three months extra time to get ready. July is when we're starting inspections for public housing. October is when we're starting inspections for multifamily. All right, we've got six months to get ready for public housing, nine months to get ready for multifamily. It's the reason we're on the road, doing this road show to make sure that you your partners are all ready for the launch of Inspire. It's been a long time coming. We've been working on this for over four years. Those of you who have been in the demonstration, thank you very much. We've learned a ton 
from those of you who have offered up your properties and your expertise so that we could continue to refine what Inspire is. You've also given us a lot of feedback on the standards themselves, right? Iteration after iteration that we've posted on our website and in the Federal Register, you've told us what we should change, what we should modify, so that we're getting it right with the standards for Inspire. As we turn back the clock four years ago, why did we embark on Inspire? Two reasons. One, we were hearing from mayors, from local officials, from local stakeholders, from the press. There were properties in bad conditions. Right? Roaches, infestations, health hazards, and yet those properties were passing. They were passing the physical inspections. Right? The score wasn't reflecting the true nature of those properties. Second reason, I heard from you. You said, I've got well-managed properties. They're good properties, residents are safe, and yet I'm getting a mediocre score, or I might even get a failing score. Why? Because HUD, you're making deductions for vegetation on the outside of buildings. You are taking deductions for cracks in sidewalks. Right? Reasons that you were getting right, a bad score because of things that didn't really matter. Right? Those two reasons. That's why we're changing Inspire and going to Inspire. The score of the property needs to reflect the true condition of those properties, your properties. If they're well-performing properties, they should score high. If they're poor-performing properties, they should score low. Right. In the end, what we want are scores that reflect the true condition of properties. We want the score to reflect where people are living the apartment that they're living in, the townhouse that they're living in, the home that they're living in. Where they are living is what's important. And are the residents that we serve living in safe and healthy conditions? That's the point of Inspire. Focusing on the right place, where they live, and making sure we are judging and assessing properties for the right things. So that in the end, the score reflects the true condition of those properties. Right. And for those of you who are here today, I'm going to submit most of you are well-rounded, caring property managers, and your properties are in good condition. That's how you operate your business. We want to make sure that score reflects that. So today is about getting ready. It's also about hearing from you. This is going to be a dialogue today. Let us know what we still need to improve because we're getting ready. We want to make sure we get this right. And come in July, we're coming to visit on public housing. In October, we're coming to visit on multifamily. Thanks again for coming today. Thanks for the dialogue that we'll have. And we, together, will launch Inspire this year. Thanks, everyone. All right. OK. Thank you, Ms. Blom. Next, I would like to introduce Ms. Michelle Perez, the Assistant Deputy Secretary for the Office of Field Policy and Management. In this role, Ms. Perez oversees the department's regional and field offices as they deliver on HUD's mission to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality, affordable homes for all. Ms. Perez launched her civil service in HUD's Midwest Regional Office in 1999 and brings 25 years of experience at the field and headquarters levels of service-driven agencies where she has led programs and directed operations across government, nonprofit, and philanthropic organizations. Please help me to welcome Ms. Perez. Hello and good morning. I am very happy to be here. Uh, as Marcel and Dom has already explained, 
I am both inspired and ready to get to work today, because um, I couldn't start the presentation without saying those things. Um, I am particularly pleased. I know that uh, recognition was given to both uh, Matt Heckles, the regional administrator, as well as Marvin uh, and Ryan, but I also wanted to note just a couple more folks from the FPM team, to include Robert Ford, the Philadelphia Field Office Director, Maria Bynum, the Wilmington Field Office Director, as well as Stephanie Stats, the Baltimore Field Office Director. Um, so please know that along with me, all of us in the FPM family serve as your partners in the field, on the ground, in the places in which you work. Uh, as the Assistant Deputy Secretary for HUD's Office of Field Policy and Management, um, we serve very much as HUD's front door in the 64 field offices, uh, regional and local offices across the country. That's a really important and significant role, I think, relative to the subject that we're talking about today. This is the eighth of 15 sessions that are happening around the country that are talking about what the new INSPIRE standards will be, what they mean to you, and more importantly, what they mean for the people who live in HUD-assisted housing all across the country. To the folks who are most in need of housing support, how is it that we, as the US federal government, and how is it that you, our partners in this work, hold ourselves accountable to the expectations that the people who depend on us, who rely on us, how do we deliver that support? How are we ensuring both to them, to each other, and to the communities in which they live that their quality of life is equally important to every single one of us? On behalf of Secretary Fudge, I can share with you that she is absolutely deeply committed to the quality of housing across the country. She has challenged us not only to say that we have an obligation to provide safe, decent, and quality housing, but we must consistently and continuously improve that work, continuously strive to honor that commitment for the people who we serve. And I want to be intentional on this point. That is the priority of why we're all here in this room and online joining to ensure that we deliver on that promise, that commitment, and that accountability. Across the nation, FPM works closely with HUD program offices to include the Office of Public and Indian Housing and REAC office to provide services and to ensure the safety. But none of that can happen for all of you Chicago fans. You know, we just can't do it alone. Uh, it does require the partnership of every single one of you in this room who have joined and those who have yet to join the remaining sessions across the country to better understand and to have a conversation about what's ahead of us. We are uniquely positioned in Office of Field Policy and Management to hear from those stakeholders, the press, mayors, local elected officials, advocacy groups, developers, and thousands of HUD residents who call us every day to let us know what's going on in their communities. This is a whole of government approach. In addition to the formal roles of oversight and compliance, HUD provides a through line of protection for residents working collaboratively across all of our different stakeholder groups. INSPIRE is evidence of that commitment. For the first time, all HUD programs will be held accountable to one set of inspection standards, ensuring more equitable outcomes in an effort to create quality, affordable housing. And what that means plainly, folks, is homes for the families who live in them. INSPIRE will provide a more accurate snapshot of HUD's properties, allowing us to deliver on the administration, on our secretaries, and the agencies promised to improve resident health and safety. You're in for a treat. I know you battled the throngs of folks at the front door to get into this room uh, and gone through security. Uh, but you're here now, and you are going to hear about policy, standards, the scoring model. This really is going to be a profound day for HUD and for everyone here today. Know that we're also working to protect families who are already living in the homes by awarding grants to help make homes safer against lead and other safety hazards, such as radon. We have also recently announced that we will be moving away from natural gas appliances in HUD-assisted properties for safety and for a greener footprint as part of HUD's climate action plan. I mention all of this because INSPIRE is truly an all-hands-on-deck effort for HUD. Not only are we pulling together here at HUD to make sure that we are successful in this effort, but we are going to need collaboration 
from everyone here today, housing authorities, multifamily property owners, and agents. And that is our call for the day, collaboration. So in closing, collaboration on safe and stable and affordable housing for all is a noble goal. And I am excited about the prospect of actually working today and for the long haul as we continue this nine month stretch uh, to ensure that that collaboration is maintained and continues at the pace that is necessary. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so honored to be a part of this presentation and I hope you have a productive and really thought provoking and inspiring, oh, I did it again, day ahead. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, all right, here we go. Thank you, Ms. Perez, that was awesome. At this time, I would like to introduce Ms. Ashley Sheriff, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of HUD's Real Estate Assessment Center, or REAC as we call it. Ms. Sheriff works with many talented, dedicated team members to improve the quality of affordable rental housing for several million households. She has worked with government agencies at all levels and several nonprofits in the housing, education, disaster recovery, healthcare, energy, and agriculture industries for over 18 years. Since Ms. Sheriff began working for HUD in March 2020, she has supported multiple initiatives, including implementation of the CARES Act. Prior to coming to REAC, Ms. Sheriff served as the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for PIH's Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs. Over the course of her career, Ms. Sheriff has briefed the White House Domestic Policy Council, Secretaries, Deputy Secretaries, and Assistant Secretaries of HUD, Governors of the State of Ohio, and other elected officials uh, of affordable housing, educational, and public health policy issues. Also, what I deeply aspire or admire about Ms. Sheriff is that Inspire is transformative. And it takes a certain type of leader to lead in a transformative environment. You have to have a light touch. You have to have a hard touch. You have to have everything in between. And at the core of what Ms. Sheriff brings to this program is her love of people. And that to me means a lot to me because I know I make mistakes in this program. But Ms. Sheriff has been kind enough to give me a second chance at many of these things because she knows I'm not gonna let that mistake happen again. And she does that with me. She does that with the other Inspire leaders that will be speaking today and for that, I am deeply, deeply uh, just thankful for Ms. Sheriff's presence. Let me introduce to you a great patriot, Ms. Sheriff. All right, welcome. You guys made it through security. You got into the Brook Mondale Auditorium. Um, and we're just so honored to have you here today and um, just so um, excited to talk about INSPIRE. Um, we love our acronyms in the government. Uh, INSPIRE, for those of you who don't know what it stands for, is the National Standards for the Physical Inspection of Real Estate. Um, but before I jump into today's program, uh, and you're gonna hear from lots of great speakers, lots of very knowledgeable speakers, about Inspire, and we're so excited to share the most information we've shared about Inspire uh, to date with you all today. I, I wanna say thank you. Um, thank you for what you do day in and day out. Um, and I know that that thanks and that gratitude extends all the way up to our secretary and deputy secretary. Um, this industry is not for the faint of heart. Um, we do it because we care about people. We do it because we're passionate about taking care of some of our nation's most vulnerable but resilient families. And um, it, it takes guts, it takes heart, and so thank you. Um, we share many objectives and many commitments. Um, you all in housing families and we all at HUD. And for those that are stakeholders and partners to those that provide housing locally, I, I wanna say thank you as well. Um, I believe our objectives are very much aligned. I believe our commitment and passion is very much aligned. Um, we all take great pride in the housing that we provide 
to those families that are in desperate need of it. Um, and so I just wanna say thank you for what you do day in and day out. It's been especially tough um, the last three or so years, as I think everybody knows. We're very well aware of the staffing challenges that you all face, the supply chain challenges that you all face. And it may seem like Inspire is a lot right now. Um, it's a big change. We haven't updated our physical condition standards in 24 years. The housing quality standards that apply to the voucher program are even older than that. They were developed in the 70s. And so it is a big change, but it's an important change. Um, we've learned a lot over the last 24 years. Um, we've learned a lot over the last 40 years since HQS was created about what constitutes health and safety in the built residential environment. And so this is a necessary change. And as um, our General Deputy Assistant Secretary and PIH, uh, Dominique Blum, stated, um, we've heard from all of you over that time period. You haven't always been thrilled with our physical inspection protocols. <laughs> and we hear a lot about that at the Real Estate Assessment Center. Um, we hear, I probably hear it three to four times a week. I get a call from a PHA staff person or a property owner or agent representative that says, you know what? I think my property should score better. I, I, I take good care of it. Um, we also hear those scenarios where, unfortunately, it doesn't happen often, but we have properties under our Uniform Physical Condition Standard, or UPCS, that score zero points on units, zero out of 35 points of their unit component, and they still get a passing inspection score. They get 65 out of 100 and passing 60. So there are those scenarios that happen, and it's important that we do what we can to update our physical condition standards to keep residents safe, but to also accurately reflect the true condition of housing. This will also hopefully help us continue to make a compelling case to those that provide funding for these housing programs that, you know what, we need, we need help. You know, many of our properties are significantly aged and we have not necessarily been able to always keep um, pace with the deferred maintenance that's required. Um, but we need to have an accurate picture of what our portfolio looks like, and we need to take advantage of the best thinking and best science that we have available to us to understand what are the conditions of that housing, what are the hazards that impact residents. So we're gonna talk about all that today, um, and like I said, we're gonna go into details that we've never gone into, into before, um, so we're excited about that. Um, this is about getting you ready for Inspire. And I know that we don't have every last detail finalized or public yet. Um, Tara's gonna talk at great length about our policy and regulatory process. But I'm excited because we are gonna share far more information about Inspire than we have yet to date. And we are making tremendous progress towards being able to implement Inspire later this year. So with that, um, we've got a packed agenda today, um, but we'll move through it. Um, and and I, I would just say, right, this is your opportunity to ask questions. Please don't be shy. Let's keep this interactive. Ask tough questions. We want to hear them. Um, and we want to hear your feedback about what you think makes sense about Inspire, maybe some things that you don't think make a lot of sense about Inspire. Um, because that regulatory and policy process isn't done yet, we still have room for improvement. And so, in addition to helping to get you ready for Inspire, we really wanna hear from you today. So, um, we're gonna, um, after I kind of open us up and talk a little bit about Inspire, I'm gonna turn it to Tara to talk about policy. Um, we're then gonna turn to our standards. Um, and our standards have been out in the public domain now for um, over two years, actually close to three. Um, and um, they have evolved over that time period. We received over 300 comments on our standards notice when we published it this summer. Um, standards are always a fun, robust conversation and, and we encourage you to be lively. Um, sometimes we get into some really technical details about the standards. Um, and so this is your opportunity to learn more. Um, Cliff is gonna lead you through that. He's our standards lead. Um, and then after lunch, we're gonna talk about scoring. Scoring is probably top of mind for most of you. Um, everybody's wondering, am I gonna do better under Inspire? Am I gonna do about the same? But what does the scoring look like? And, and how will the score accurately reflect property conditions? 
Um, and then we are going to um, talk about uh, what happens when we go live with Inspire, uh, when we start those public housing inspections in July later this year, when we start those multifamily inspections in October later this year. Um, inspections are operations heavy uh, activities, um, process heavy activities, um, and it also requires good robust information technology. Um, and so we'll talk about that uh, towards the end of the day today. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with any final questions that you may all have and uh, get you on your way. So when we've gone out to the other cities on this Inspire Get Ready session series, um, we found that people's knowledge about Inspire runs the gamut. Um, some people um, have consumed all of the information that's publicly available. They can ask questions about very detailed standards. They know how the standards have evolved and changed from UPCS to Inspire, uh, at least the standards that are proposed. Um, and other people are just learning, and that's okay too. Um, you know, we've all been very, very busy the last three years. Um, you all have been uh, moving heaven and earth to keep families housed, and maybe Inspire wasn't you know, front of mind for you, and that's okay too. Um, but this is your opportunity to learn more. So when we think about Inspire at the Real Estate Assessment Center, or REAC, um, we put together this word cloud of some of the themes or concepts that we think are vital and important to Inspire. Um, and I'm only gonna focus on three of these, um, but you can see in that large green lettering, health and safety is first and foremost among those priorities and concepts that we think about. I mentioned that our standards that have covered the vast majority of HUD rental housing assistance, they're a little out of date. Um, the Uniform Physical Condition Standard was created in 1998. Housing quality standards were created in the 70s. Although we've made updates to those standards from time to time, we haven't made wholesale updates to those standards. Additionally, there are two different sets of standards. We've learned so much since the 70s about what constitutes health and safety in the built residential environment. We've learned so much since 1998 about things like environmental hazards that were not necessarily well known in the late 90s. We've learned that moisture can lead to mold. Sometimes that mold can be toxic. And so we need to think about do our standards accurately reflect what are the true hazards to residents? Congress gives us billions of dollars annually to administer rental housing assistance programs. And they require and demand, rightfully so, that that public investment, that public trust that they've given to HUD, and by extension to those of you that participate in HUD programs, that it provides quality, safe, healthy housing. And so Inspire for me, Inspire for our team at REAC is first and foremost about keeping residents healthy and safe. Like I said, they may be some of our nation's most vulnerable and resilient families, but they also deserve quality, safe, healthy housing. And we know that you share that commitment with us. Um, the next word I'm going to talk about is resident. So yes, um, Inspire is resident focused. Some people have said over the years that the Uniform Physical Condition Standard is an asset based standard. And I'm not going to go into that, but we know and we've looked at the data. We've actually gone back and looked at 40,000 Uniform Physical Condition Standards uh, inspections that, that we've conducted. That you could lose in some cases, up to 15 out of 100 points for one site-based defect. Well, where do residents spend the most time? We hope that you maintain wonderful outdoor areas for your residents to enjoy, and that's critically important. But residents spend the most time in their units. And so Inspire improves, enhances, and strengthens our physical condition standards by focusing on residents, by focusing on where they spend the most time, which is in their units. I've been asked by members of Congress, 
Ms. Sheriff, how can a property score zero points on units and still pass one of your inspections? Hard to argue with that, right? Probably shouldn't happen. Really shouldn't happen at all. Um, so under Inspire, we are moving the focus into the units, into the common areas where residents spend most of their time. That doesn't mean that we won't continue to look at health hazards that may be outside. We will. Um, but you know what? Should you really lose 15 points on one site-based defect? Or should you be evaluated on the condition of the units, the condition of the areas where residents spend their most time? And the last word I'm going to focus on are the last two words are continuous improvement. So 24 years, and I'm focusing on UPCS here, is a long time to go without making meaningful updates to our standards. Like I said, we've learned a lot over that time period. And part of the reason Spire probably feels very big to a lot of you is because we haven't made the incremental changes that we've needed to make over that time period. Under our Inspire proposed rule, we will be updating our physical condition standards, or at least revisiting them, every three years. Um, this should hopefully result in a more gradual evolution of our standards that takes advantage of the best thinking, the best science, the best research. Um, but beyond that, I hear pretty much every time I come to one of these events, pretty much every time I speak at a conference, pretty much every day via email, <laughs> there's lots of things React could be doing better. And we agree. We agree with that. Um, our technology could be better. Our responsiveness could be better. Our entire inspection program could be better. And so when I think about Inspire, I don't think just about new standards. I think about a wholesale improvement to our inspection program. One of my favorite stories maybe not so favorite, funny stories, I'll just say. Came into the office about three months after March of 2020. There was a stack of manila envelopes, literally as high as this podium. Not joking. I don't know how they were stacked. Somebody must have been like a Jenga expert at stacking manila envelopes. But they were stacked, sure as day. Does anybody guess what they were? appeals. And some of those manila envelopes were three inches thick. Why should we, in 2023, be requiring you to send three inches of paper to react for an appeal of a single defect oftentimes? It's crazy, right? So Inspire is also about continuous improvement. We at REAC, we need to continually do better continually make sure that not just our standards reflect the most recent thinking about what constitutes health and safety, but our entire inspection operations can continue to improve and be better. Um, you all deserve a great customer experience with us, and we take that very seriously. And so when I think about Inspire, I think, how can we not just make things better for residents? How can we make it better for all the stakeholders that are party to our inspection program. So, um, Marcel had mentioned that we are gonna do QR codes today. These are vital for us. Also, we, we, we hope that they keep, them inter keep it interactive. Um, so, um, you can use your phone, um, and we have folks that will be uh, available around the room to help folks out. Hopefully, you can get a good scan of the QR code. Um, it helps if you've logged into Wi-Fi, but you don't have to log into the Wi-Fi. And there's, as you can see on the, the slide, some additional tips for Android phone users. Um, these QR codes, these polling questions that we're gonna do throughout the day are gonna help us learn a lot more about you, help us tailor our, our, our program to you all, and help us improve our Get Ready sessions moving forward, so. So the first QR code usually takes the longest, but once you get the hang of it, it'll go a little quicker throughout the day. Um, so we're going to give you plenty of time with this first one to get a good, clean scan of this QR code and uh, answer the questions. Uh, one of the questions uh, that you'll be asked is, is kind of what your knowledge level is. Um, what would you like to hear about today? Um, so 
Um, if you could all take a couple of minutes and do that, that would be great. Um, and we have, like I said, we have folks that um, are available throughout the room that can help you if you're having um, some challenges getting, getting the questions to pop up. Okay, see people still tapping away a little bit, so we'll give you uh, a minute or so. Okay, we will start to go over the results here. think we're good. Hopefully I get somebody to pull up the results here in a second. Okay, first question. Have you navigated to the Inspire web, web page located at hud.gov? Um, it looks like um, a significant number of you have, uh, 110. Um, some folks haven't. That's okay too. And some folks didn't even know there was an Inspire website. Um, you can get to it from HUD.gov. Um, you can also, at least what I typically do, is go straight to Google and type in Inspire, uh, and that'll take you directly to the main Inspire page. Um, there's also a jump to box on HUD.gov that you can get to Inspire uh, as well, the Inspire website as well. Um, this question's really helpful because it, it, you know, it helps us understand, you know, if you've been to the Inspire webpage, which is where the vast majority are of our Inspire content is located um, and will continue to be located, including in the future, where you'll be able to access training for Inspire. And we know that training is vitally important to you all. Um, we obviously need to do a little bit more work to continue to publicize that we have an Inspire website. Um, but if you haven't been to the Inspire uh, website at hud.gov, we strongly encourage you to do so. Um, there's a ton of awesome information out there and on that website that'll help you get ready. Okay, so what um, group are you affiliated with? So um, these get ready sessions are targeted to all stakeholders of our inspection program. And um, we've got a great cross section here today. Um, we've got um, some contract inspectors um, and thank you for what you do. You're vital partners to us. Um, we couldn't do our inspections without your assistance um, and support. Um, we've got uh, 66 folks representing public housing agencies, uh, 25 representing property owners and agents. Um, we've got some, a lot of HUD folks here today and some industry folks. Um, and as folks know, um, we all rely on a lot of partners uh, to help us uh, in the administration of housing. So we've got some of our other stakeholders here today. And I just want to say thank you to you all for being here. Um, so which topics are of the great, greatest interest to you? Um, so um, policy and regulatory process, 100. Not surprisingly, scoring 145, usually the top vote getter on this question. Uh, 128 for standards, that's usually the second top vote getter. That's what we've seen as we've gone across the country. Um, and, uh, but there's lots of topics you guys are interested in learning about, and we'll talk about those, including software integration and inspector training. So we cover all of those topics in today's program. So, uh, and if we miss anything, like I said, don't be shy. You know, feel free to ask us questions. Say, hey, Ash, hey, Tara, hey, Marcel, can you talk a little bit more about this? Uh, and we'll be happy to address that. Doesn't matter what topic we're on throughout the day, any question is fair game, and uh, we'll be happy to, to take a stab at it. 
Okay. Um, and here are some more details. Um, yep. And I think we can probably go back to the slide deck. Okay. Great. So now that you've all got the hang of the QR codes, we'll be doing this throughout the day. Um, and like I said, it, it helps us tailor uh, our program today. It's also going to help us improve our program in the future. Um, so we have um, a value statement that applies to Inspire that, that we all um, kind of live and breathe and, and eat and sleep at REAC. Um, and and I, I've already touched on some of these concepts, but um, for us, that value statement is about transforming how HUD manages the quality of affordable housing units with stronger standards, better inspections, greater insights, and healthier and safer homes for residents. Um, Inspire encompasses all of those themes, right? Um, it starts with the foundation of stronger standards. Stronger standards, ideally, and will lead to better inspections. But it's also gaining insight, using data, right, to improve housing. Um, and that's not something we've always been great at at HUD, using that information, using that data. Our inspections generate millions of data points every year. Um, and a single one of those data points, in all seriousness, could be the difference between life and death in our housing. Um, and so that's the last theme. Coming back to what we were talking about earlier, creating healthier and safer housing for residents. So um, some basics about INSPIRE. Once again, the National Standards of the Physical Inspection of Real Estate. Um, is gonna strengthen our physical condition standards, both the uniform physical condition standards and the housing quality standards in a number of ways. First, you know, prioritizing those deficiencies, those defects that matter the most, those that apply to the health and safety of residents. So we can say things like overgrown vegetation, they're going away. Um, things like cracked sidewalks that are not a tripping hazard, they're going away. We wanna focus on those standards, those potential deficiencies that our inspectors observe while performing an inspection that have a substantive impact on health and safety. They could have even a life or death impact on health or safety, or a severe non-life-threatening defect. And we'll talk about those new categories of defects as we move on through today's program. We're updating not one, but two physical condition standards. The housing quality standards, which was created in the 70s, and it has been updated routinely over the years, probably a little more frequently than the uniform physical condition standards, which apply to our public housing and multifamily, our fixed asset programs. But Inspire focuses on both. Like I said, we've learned a lot since HQS has been created. We've learned a lot since UPCS has been created. It's important that our standards reflect what we've learned. When the Uniform Physical Condition Standard was created 24 years ago, across many communities nationwide, it was viewed as the more stringent standard. We've done research, we've looked at a number of jurisdictions nationwide. UPCS isn't the most stringent standard in a lot of communities anymore. A lot of your local governments have updated their standards a lot of local and state governments have implemented things like National Fire Protection Act 72, which is in housing quality standards, but wasn't in the uniform physical condition standards. Um, and so it's important, right, that we keep pace with what the latest thinking is in terms of, of, of standards and what makes sense. Um, I mentioned it focuses on the areas where residents spend their most time, which is in the units. Uh, we think this is vitally important. In fact, Congress has said to HUD, we can't have an inspection program, we can't have standards anymore where a unit can be a, f a failing or units can be failing and that property still pass an inspection. And we agree, um, that doesn't make any sense. Dominique touched on this this morning, uh, a little bit ago, providing a more accurate score for property conditions. Um, if you're in housing, if you're subject to REAC inspections, um, you know, you may have had those 
inspections where you have a property pretty well maintained. It's traditionally maybe scored, for example, in the 80s, four or five inspections in a row. And then you get an inspection and it drops to the 60s. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I have the same routine maintenance program in place that I've had for years. How did I go from an 80 to a 60? What happened? Um, and so it's important, right, that our scores accurately reflect the conditions of the properties. On the flip side, as Dominique mentioned, we have properties, and I've been to many of them, that pass, probably shouldn't. Um, and sometimes those properties are properties where under the uniform physical condition standard, for example, you know, folks max out those areas that are not inside the unit. They max out site, they max out building exterior. But meanwhile, you walk into the units, the units don't really seem to be passing. So it's critically important that under Inspire that our inspection assessment, our inspection score provides an accurate representation of the property. Um, and then this is an important theme, a really important theme. Congress also asked HUD, why do you have two physical condition standards? One that applies to your fixed asset programs like public housing and multifamily, and one that applies to your unit-based programs, primarily the tenant-based rental assistance program, but also some of the CPD grant programs, community planning and development grant programs. And I've been asked by members of Congress, Ms. Sheriff, can you tell me which resident is safer, the one living in a voucher unit or the one living in a public housing unit? Hard to say, because the standards are different. While there's a lot of overlap between the two, it's hard to say. Plus, one standard is scored on a zero to 100 point basis, the others pass fail. And so Congress and HUD agrees, we should have one standard that applies to all rental housing assistance. Uh, and we think this will benefit you ultimately, right? It's gonna be hard to adapt, but I've talked to some folks as we've gone across the country and they've said, you know what? It's gonna be great about having one standard. I only have to train my inspectors and my maintenance people on one standard. Uh, and so we think this will, will become administratively less burdensome when we have one standard that cuts across all HUD rental housing assistance programs. Um, and then lastly, incorporating resident feedback regarding the condition of units. Um, this is another area where we at HUD have over the years collected resident feedback in a number of ways. Um, but it's been a while since we've kind of formally collected it. A lot of our resident feedback comes in through our Office of Field Policy and Management. Um, and Michelle talked about FPM, the Field Policy and Management offices, the 64 nationwide, kind of being the front door of HUD. Well, they're working on enhancements and, and have achieved some success in collecting and organizing and thinking through resident feedback. Um, but we need to, at HUD, talk to each other, right? We need to use the feedback they're collecting. So if we got a hot property that's been identified, we go do something about it, right? We go inspect it if 30 residents have called up and complained about infestation or bed bugs or something like that. Um, we're also looking at other mechanisms for collecting resident feedback. Uh, once upon a time, we had something on the public housing side called the Resident Assessment Survey or the RAS Survey. Um, when we moved to our current version of FAS under the interim rule, we got rid of that survey. Um, and we've been asked, why HUD did you get rid of that survey? Um, that was a great way of collecting resident feedback. Um, so I'm not saying we're gonna do a survey, but it's important, the theme that's important, right, is making sure that we are listening to residents, hearing about the condition of their properties, hearing about how HUD programs are working or not working for them, and actioning that. So resident feedback is a critical component of Inspire as well. So um, a few themes um, that we think about also at, within REACT when we, we, we think about Inspire. Um, so you all know, right, inspections are very people-centric. We perform inspections to keep people safe. But there's so many other people involved in the inspection process. Maintenance people who work 365 days a year responding to work orders. Inspectors that you all hire, that we hire. 
that go out and perform inspections. The same maintenance people that then address those work orders, right? Inspections are very people heavy. And so as we've approached Inspire, we are taking a people-centered approach. How does Inspire impact all of those stakeholders to the inspection process? And how do we make it better? How do we make our inspection program better for every single one of those stakeholders? To me, what will be success is if, you know, two to three years after we implement Inspire, people are saying, you know what? You've improved. You've made it better. Especially if residents say our housing's getting better. If members of Congress are saying, you know what? We got a more accurate picture of what the housing conditions look like. Maybe that affects policy. Maybe that affects funding. But I want every stakeholder, I want the maintenance supervisors, the maintenance workers, the inspectors, the PHA staff, the property owner agent staff, the PBCA staff to say, I'm having a better experience with your inspections. Inspections are very people oriented. Of course, it's still about the properties as well, right? We're evaluating a physical asset and we need to make sure that that physical asset is safe. Um, Sometimes that's a whole property, right, in the public housing and multifamily worlds. Sometimes it's a unit and the common areas that residents traverse to get to their unit. So even in the voucher program, if the elevator doesn't work in the building and there's elderly people that are holding that voucher, that's a problem. Um, so we need to make sure, right, the properties are healthy and safe. Um, I also wanna focus on increased inspection consistency. This has been a long-term complaint, long-term area of feedback for REAC. Um, if I get a certain inspector to show up, I get this score. If I get another inspector to show up, I get this score. Now, there may be some good reasons why the score changes, right? Our assets are aging, they're deteriorating, there's deferred maintenance, but consistency is important. People have to have faith and trust that our inspections are resulting in accurate assessments of the properties, right? And so under Inspire, we'll be doing a number of things that we think will improve inspection consistency, beginning with, for example, better, more well-written standards, written in plain English. Um, and Cliff will talk about that at great length later today. We actually hired a linguist to help us with our standards so that you didn't have to be a maintenance supervisor to understand what the standard meant. Um, and so by having clear standards, that's a foundation for improved consistency, that any two inspectors can understand and interpret the standard the same way. But there's a number of other things that we're gonna be doing, like training, like using information technology to lead to consistent evaluation, consistent responses, when we're performing inspections. And then lastly, programs, right? Um, our colleague who you'll hear from later today, um, Kevin Laviano, we were at, uh, he's the deputy program manager for Inspire. We were at our Kansas City uh, get ready session um, in early November and he said at the beginning of his section, he covers IT and operations, he's like, <laughs> and I think it was just this moment of like just pure honesty. He's like, this is a, he's like, this is big. He's like, this is huge. Um, and it is, um, but in a good way, right? Um, this covers 37,000 assets across public housing and multifamily. It covers 2.4 million voucher units. It covers tens of thousands of additional CPD program units. Um, and so Inspire, I mentioned, is about aligning our standards, aligning our approach, so that we can say with certainty that all residents of HUD housing, regardless of which program they're served by, are subject to the same standards. The same standards apply for health and safety. So to us, this is about covering all of those rental housing assistance programs. Okay, so how are we getting there? Um, 
so we're, we're doing this, right? We're, we're getting together. We're having fun, hopefully, this morning. We're going to have fun the rest of the day. Um, it's about listening. Um, Dominique had mentioned that we've put out um, our rule. We got over 700 comments on it. We put out our standards notice this summer. We got over 300 comments on it. Those are 1,000 plus comments we have to formally respond to. But those comments come from people, right? So we're here with you all today to hear from you, to learn more, to understand what things you're thinking about, what questions you have, what concerns you have, maybe even what anxiety you have about Inspire. And that's perfectly acceptable. It's a big change. Um, but we've also been engaging experts. We've been engaging some of you all. Um, we've had a number of industry sessions, 40 plus, um, where we have been talking to representatives of housing organizations. Um, we've also had a number of resident sessions where we've talked to residents and heard from them about how they want their housing to be, how they want their housing to get better what they observe day in and day out, what their kids and grandparents are subject to living in our housing. So we've engaged experts, we've engaged residents, we're engaging all of you out on this, these get ready sessions. Uh, and we're here to prepare you all um, as well. While we may not have all the answers today, um, our regulatory and policy framework is evolving quite rapidly. And as soon as we finalize aspects of it, we're gonna to continue to get you ready. We're gonna to continue to prepare you. Um, our first training modules have now been completed. Uh, our quality assurance inspectors at REAC are getting trained. Training is coming to the public very soon as well. And Kevin and Marcel will talk about that later today. Uh, process, right? You all know inspections are very process oriented, right? Um, and so we've identified 13 big process areas that relate to our inspections, from how frequently we schedule inspections, all the way through what happens when there's an appeal and we need to adjudicate that appeal. I can tell you for each one of those 13 process areas, we've made significant improvements and enhancements. Like I said, Inspire is not just about new standards, not just about new scoring, it's not just about alignment, it's about improving everything that we're doing, making our inspection program better for all of you, making it better for residents. Technology, let's be blunt, nobody's gonna confuse us with Samsung or Amazon or Apple. Um, we're, we're HUD, um, we're in the housing business, we're not in the technology business. Um, but you know what, our technology can, should, and will get better for inspections. I can promise you that because I've already seen the technology. Um, and we expect that our technology partners, your technology partners, they're going to even build better mousetraps because they're the ones that are in the business of providing technology. But one of the key things that Congress said to us as we've gone down this Inspire road is you need to make your technology better. They've given us funding for that, which we're very grateful for. We've had some two pretty good budgets in FY21 and 22, and actually a pretty good budget in FY23 to make technology enhancements. Uh, but they've also said, right, that for those of you that can't afford to buy third-party technology, right, HUD, you've gotta provide the technology to some of those smaller, maybe some of those medium, maybe even some of those large um, housing operators that need an inspection technology. Um, and so they've given us funding to provide licenses for our new inspection app. Um, and uh, we are going to be working with um, also uh, the industry um, that provides technology solutions um, for housers, for those that participate in HUD housing. Um, and we look forward to helping them be successful and helping them get products to market that um, meet your business needs. Okay. So... Um, the rule and the standard. So Tara is going to go into great detail about this, um, but Inspire starts with what we call our, our rule, right? Our rulemaking. Um, and that's the framework for how Inspire works. And we published that draft rule in January of 2021. 
Um, I mentioned we received over 700 comments, of which we legally have to respond to all of those. Um, some of the things that, that the rule includes, um, and I, well, before I jump into that, um, beyond the rule, the rule is the framework, at least the way I like to think about it. But the meat and potatoes is in what we call our subordinate notices. Um, so standards were published this summer. The standards notice was very detailed. Um, scoring is coming to a theater near you very, very soon. Um, we just completed the departmental, or we're almost complete with the departmental clearance process. Um, and then lastly, our administrative procedures notice, um, which covers kind of all the nuts and bolts of inspections to how frequently they, they occur, um, to you know, what happens on the day of inspection, to what are the procedures and what are the grounds by which you could appeal an inspection, for example. Um, but the rule, um, as mentioned, first requires all standards to be the same across HUD's rental housing assistance programs. Um, and while there are some what we call adaptations of those standards, um, because HUD programs work a little bit differently, right? The voucher program's a unit-based program. Public housing and multifamily are fixed asset-based programs. Um, CPD has some single room occupancy programs. Um, oh, and I see you have a question. So I'm going to repeat the question. I think I heard it all. Um, so with the new administrative procedures notice, is that going to help management agents better understand the kind of the, the, all the details and logistics of the inspection program? Is that kind of an accurate? and give them guidance to help themselves um, prepare for the inspections, including residents. So yes, um, so hopefully everybody heard that. Um, and we're gonna, we have mics, so we'll be sure to kind of go through, but I'll, I'll try to repeat all the questions. The other speakers today will try to repeat all the questions. Um, yes, so we want the administrative procedures notice and the way it's written and the associated training to kind of be a, how do I, what, what do I need to know about inspections? How do I prepare for inspections? What do I do on the day of inspection? What can I do after an inspection? Um, and we want it to be very transparent, right? So people very plainly understand what is entailed kind of A to Z from an, when we come out and do an inspection, if that makes sense. And then we want to, of course, provide and we will be providing associated training. We actually already have a training vendor on board to not just train people on like the standards and the details of all the standards, we will be providing that training, but also, you know, what do I do and how do I prepare for an inspection? Marcel and Kevin are actually gonna be talking about that later today too. Um, so uh, we're starting to get into that because we've done over 2,000 Inspire demonstration inspections. And for those of you that have participated in the Inspire demonstration, thank you very much. We've learned so much by virtue of those 2,000 demonstration inspections that we've taken that knowledge and tried to um, include it in the module, uh, the IT and operations module this afternoon of things, even like what are the most common defects that we're seeing? Um, and you know, what, what are some of the new defects that we're seeing because of the new standards? So we wanna help you prepare. Okay, great question. Okay. Um, so the rule also specifies the manner and time frame um, by which uh, certain uh, health and safety deficiencies um, need to be remediated. Um, under UPCS, we essentially had two categories of defects. Under Inspire, um, we're gonna have three, uh, and Cliff will go into that later. Um, the two kind of categories that we've had are, are kind of this exigent health and safety category, which are those deficiencies you need to correct within 24 hours, and then everything else. Under Inspire, we have a little bit more gradation. So we still have 
the similar concept to exigent health and safety. We call them life-threatening defects. But we have a new category called severe non-life-threatening defects. Um, and then we also have um, moderate defects, which need to be corrected within 30 days. Um, and then we will have what we call low defects um, that are, you know, those defects that, that won't create a major issue for resident health and safety, but we want you to be aware of them. Um, and we'll talk about how those categories of deficiencies work throughout the day today. We'll also talk about how we'll treat them from a scoring standpoint as well. Um, it requires an annual self-inspection um, and reporting requirement. Um, we've had annual self-inspections um, that have been required as part of the public housing program for some time. Uh, multifamily um, has not had that necessarily. They, they, they uh, many multifamily property owners agents, of course, conduct annual inspections. Um, and there are circumstances from a regulatory standpoint where multifamily POAs, property owners, agents are required to do self-inspections. Um, but uh, Inspire is about alignment, right? So um, we are also, in addition to trying to align the standards, align our approach to inspections um, across all rental housing assistance. And so um, there is now a new annual self-inspection requirement that Tara will talk a little bit about. Um, the rule outlines the INSPIRE framework. Like I said, I like to think of it as the umbrella um, with those three subordinate notices, standards, scoring, and administrative procedures that are the meat and potatoes that are below that. Um, the proposed rule has been out in the public domain for some time. Um, you know, I think we can safely say, um, like I said, we got 700 plus comments. We've made some improvements and enhancements uh, to the rule. Um, but I would just say, and this is, this is a, a little bit of a hint, the final rule is not going to be terribly different from the proposed rule. So if you want insight, you want guidance into what you're seeing, um, well, while we have taken those 700 plus comments and made some changes um, and some important changes, um, the proposed rule is out there. If you haven't looked at it recently or at all, take a look at it. Uh, standards, similar. We will be making some changes to the standards based on public comments. Um, but the standards have been out in the public domain for two, two plus years. Um, take a look at those standards if you haven't already. The most recent version of the standards, version 2.2, is up at the Inspire website. It's the version that was published this summer. Um, that's a good place to start, right? If you want to know more about Inspire, the rule and the standards, which are already out there, granted they're not quite final yet, a lot of great information in those that'll help you get ready and understand what to prepare for for Inspire. Um, and then lastly, a revised approach to scoring to promote these policy objectives. And we'll talk a lot about scoring this afternoon. But um, a couple just kind of previews. Uh, we want the scoring to be more transparent, easier to understand. We want you to be able to understand how you got your score without hiring a PhD rocket scientist. Um, we also want to make sure, as Dominique pointed out this morning, that the score accurately reflects the condition of the property. And we'll talk about the ways in which we think our new scoring methodology, our proposed scoring methodology, will do that this afternoon. Um, so, um, and here's a little bit more. Um, so some other things about scoring, right? Um, we're getting rid of some of these cosmetic deficiencies or appearance deficiencies, some of which have had and can have under UPCS a significant impact on your score. Um, so those are going away. The deficiencies we care the most about and that should have the most impact on your score are the health and safety deficiencies. Um, higher weight placed on where those deficiencies are located, right? So health and safety defect located inside a unit is going to count more than a health and safety defect located on the site. Simplified scoring, I mentioned this already, more transparent, more simplified scoring. Um, we want you to be able to figure out how you got your score. We want you to be able to actually potentially calculate your score yourself if you're doing a pre-inspection or a self-inspection. Um, this will also help us in terms of your, like I said, your self-inspections, your compliance, preparing for inspections, um, I've heard a number of folks over the years say, you know what, we think the scoring methodology 
is an I gotcha methodology. Or it's, it's, it's purposely designed to be opaque. So you don't quite understand how you get your score. We want you to understand how you get your score because that will drive how you approach your maintenance, how you approach your capital expenditures, how you approach what you focus your attention on. And we want you to focus your attention on those life-threatening or severe non-life-threatening defects, particularly in the unit. Um, we will be maintaining the 100-point scale. It's been around for a while. Uh, but we'll also be maintaining pass-fail on the voucher side, because that's also been around a while. And we'll talk about that this afternoon. So one other nuance about Inspire um, that we think it's important to highlight, right, is when Inspire becomes effective, both the Uniform Physical Condition Standard and the Housing Quality Standards, they're going to be what we call sunset. They're going away. We're putting them on a cruise. We're going to give them a Mai Tai or a margarita or whatever their drink of choice is, and we're going to send them off into the sunset, and they can live out the rest of their days um, talking about what a great run they had at HUD. Um, and Inspire will become the new standard of the land. Um, and so uh, Tara will talk a little bit more about that during standards, but it's important, or during uh, the policy piece, but it's important to note that once Inspire goes live, July 1st for the public housing portfolio, 10-1 for the other rental housing assistance portfolios, those previous standards that apply will be going away on that cruise off into the sunset. So some recent Inspire achievements. Uh, gosh, I, I love doing this slide because we update the numbers. So we're, we're up to about 2,400 uh, Inspire demonstration inspections. Uh, and once again, thank you if you participated in that. Those have been invaluable. Um, we've learned so much that has informed every aspect of Inspire as a result of those demonstration inspections, and they've been critical to our learning process. Um, but what has gotten a little bit less fanfare is we've done over 9,000 Inspire voucher demonstration inspections, and we've learned a ton from those as well. And we're continuing to do demonstration inspections, both of public housing and multifamily properties, as well as voucher properties. Um, in fact, in February, we're going to be doing some of that work out in Chicago, working with them. We're going to be working with some other housing agencies nationwide um, to help educate folks and to continue to learn more, right? I mentioned continuous improvement and how that's a core concept of Inspire. Um, we're continuing to learn every single day. Um, I mentioned we've developed process models covering 13 big areas, 220 sub-processes. Every single one of those 220 sub-processes has been addressed, enhanced, ideally what we hope to be optimized. Um, and then we've developed our initial federal IT application. Um, we're using it for our Inspire demonstration inspections, both on the public housing and multifamily side as well as the voucher side. Um, and if you were an early demo participant, you know, we, we've heard some feedback and some folks have said, you know, the earliest versions of the software, you know, could be better. Um, we've actually do releases of the software every three months. And I've talked to some people that had properties in the very early part of the demonstration and then who recently had a demonstration inspection. And they're like, holy cow, Ash, the technology's gotten even better. Like, it, it just keeps, keeps getting better. Like I said, nobody's going to confuse us with Samsung or Apple, but it's important that we continue to improve our technology. Um, we've hosted uh, close to 40 virtual workshops, and uh, we're on our uh, eighth uh, Inspire uh, Roadshow or Get Ready session. Um, we've talked to over 1,400 attendees. Um, you know, these have included executive directors, chief operating officers, all sorts of stakeholders across um, our HUD housing programs. Um, and then conducted four customer experience workshops for HUD staff. We're also going to be doing some customer experience workshops for housing stakeholders uh, through our Inspire pilot. Uh, we're also going to be doing some resident uh, engagement coming up, um, including uh, at some of our upcoming stops in New York and Chicago. So uh, we are all about engagement. We want to get out there. We want to talk to you. Most importantly, we want to hear from you. Um, and so don't be shy today. 
Um, and then we've conducted eight of our Get Ready sessions with over 764 participants. I think today is the ninth. Um, so exciting stuff, and we got a packed house today, so great to see everybody. Um, thanks for giving us another sellout. Some key dates uh, that we need to think about. Um, so we're, we're in the midst of winter, um, you know, and uh, we are on the cusp of uh, publishing uh, four really big documents coming up. One is going to be our final rule. Um, the second is going to be our final standards notice. We published the draft notice uh, over the summer. Uh, got, like I said, 300 plus comments. We've been working on addressing those comments. Um, both the rule as well as the standards are uh, nearly complete in their final form, and so those will be coming out very soon. Uh, We'll also be publishing our scoring notice. Uh, hopefully by the end of the month, um, we are just wrapping up departmental clearance. Um, I know this is the one that everybody is eager to, to hear about, eager to read. Don't be shy. Let us know what you think about our scoring. We'll talk about scoring uh, today as well. Uh, so we'll give you some previews of what we are proposing in that scoring notice. Uh, but that'll also be coming um, in the winter to spring timeframe. Um, also, um, our administrative procedures notice. Um, this kind of covers all of the nuts and bolts, like I said, of inspections, you know, how frequently they occur, what to expect on the day of inspection, um, you know, what the notification period looks like, you know, what the appeals process looks like, what our quality assurance looks like. Uh, lots of important details in that administrative procedures notice that we encourage you to check out. Also, we hope we don't have to use it very frequently, but enforcement is covered in the administrative procedures notice as well. Um, so sometimes, right, we do have to undertake enforcement uh, when we have particularly bad properties or consistently bad properties, um, or unfortunately, sadly, bad actors from time to time. Um, winter, spring, oh, well, before I get to winter, spring, um, Inspire training will be beginning very shortly. We've actually started some of the internal training with our quality assurance inspectors. We plan on rolling out that training publicly um, very shortly. Um, that will be the first versions of that training will be self-paced, web-based training. If you really need help getting to sleep at night and you want to learn more about Inspire, uh, it'll be on that web uh, at HUD, both uh, on uh, available through the HUD Inspire website as well as through HUD Exchange. So, um, and, and Marcel and Kevin will talk a little bit more about that later this afternoon. Um, as we move into the spring, uh, we should be publishing final versions of um, the, what we call the, the big four, the rule, standards, scoring, administrative procedures. Um, we'll also be continuing to do ongoing training. We're going to be using also um, the last set of demonstration properties to do uh, a dress rehearsal, so to speak. If you've been to a, a soft restaurant opening, right, we want to make sure, um, and we have 200 properties identified uh, for this, what we call the pilot later this spring. Those will be our, basically, if we were doing a live Inspire inspection, this is what it would look like. Only. We won't be quite live at that point in time, but it'll give us our last opportunity to work out any of the kinks and make sure that Inspire is working very, very well by the time we get to July 1st. Um, so in the summer, uh, a couple things. Dominique mentioned big milestone, big date, July 1st, 2023. Public housing inspections begin. Um, but also, we will be piloting um, some of our new resident feedback mechanisms. Uh, as a pilot, it won't be nationwide at that point in time, but um, I mentioned that Congress has said we want you, HUD, to figure out a way to incorporate resident feedback into Inspire. So we'll be um, beginning to kind of roll out um, some ideas about resident feedback in the summer. Um, and then October 1st, 2023, Inspire goes live, becomes effective for all the other HUD rental housing assistance programs, uh, multifamily, um, our voucher program, uh, as well as CPD uh, and healthcare programs as well. Um, some people might be wondering, well, why is public housing July 1st and why is multifamily October 1st? Uh, when our secretary announced that we were resuming inspections, um, which we resumed June 1st of 2021, we've gone a long time, 15 months without inspecting any properties. And in some cases, we've gone four to five years without inspecting some properties. 
So we committed to doing one last uniform physical condition standard inspection for all the public housing and multifamily properties. Public housing only has about 7,000 properties. Multifamily has 30,000. We will be done with our final uniform physical condition standard inspections of public housing this spring. Let me repeat that. We will be done with uniform physical condition standards of public housing properties this spring. We will be done with uniform physical condition standard inspections of multifamily properties this fall. So all of those 37,000 properties will have gotten their last UPCS inspection sometime between June 1st of 2021 and October 1st of 2023. And then we'll be ready. We'll be ready for Inspire. And we're gonna transition to the new Inspire inspection program, the new Inspire standards. Um, so we're gonna sound like a broken record today, but health and safety, health and safety, health and safety. Um, that's what Inspire is all about. Um, we also think Inspire is very people-centered. Um, we're thinking about all the stakeholders that are impacted by our inspections, the residents, the maintenance folks, the owners, operators of housing, um, and so many other folks that are stakeholders of the inspection process. Um, Inspire is more than just standards, more than just scoring. It's a wholesale redesign of our inspection program. And we hope, like I said, that you're gonna find that the new program addresses a lot of the concerns that you've identified over the years. You know, things like, why do I have to submit a three inch manila envelope to Hugh Ash to get an appeal thought about? Um, alignment, that's another key theme, right? Inspire aligns our standards across all of our programs. Um, continuous improvement is another area that we talked about. We don't wanna just launch this thing and not do anything with it for 24 years. We want to keep improving. We want to keep learning. We want to keep evolving. Um, and then lastly, Inspire will also be modernizing our inspection te technology. So we think lots of improvements, lots of enhancements coming um, that will benefit residents. Um, and I want to come back to that value statement I talked about, right? To me, better standards, better inspections, better data, better, healthier, safe housing. So with that, we will open it up for questions and feedback. Oh, and if you could wait for the mic, at least for us up on stage, it's hard, it was hard for me to hear that one question, so. And the webcast folks. Oh, and the webcast folks also. There's also a mic in the center of the room too, if folks wanna come up. All right. Hello. Hey. So uh, I um, operate multifamily uh, properties. We have about 70 properties that have been in the INSPIRE demonstration program. We've been inspected. Um, so I have a lot of questions. So I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure how quickly I need to get these. But <clears throat> um, under the, you had mentioned this earlier, but under the REACT inspection, uh, one finding such as a trip hazard uh, could have a huge point deduction mm -hmm. and skew your score. Yep. Um, so some are almost, like you said, 15 points. Yep. Is, is there a maximum point deduction limit for a single defect under INSPIRE, or is there anything in INSPIRE that would stop a single finding from distorting our overall score? Yeah, good, <clears throat> good question, um, and hopefully everybody heard that. Thanks for using the mic. Um, so we've and I'll, we'll talk about this um, a little more this afternoon, um, but we looked at um, and did some analysis around this concept of kind of big point deductions resulting from a single defect. Um, additionally, we've also looked at um, this kind of what we call the, the single unit phenomenon uh, where we've heard from folks that one bad unit could tank the entire score for the property. Um, I. I I can't say what we're proposing. I, I, we'll talk a little bit about what we're proposing this afternoon. Actually, we'll talk quite a bit about what we're proposing this afternoon. Um, we're not proposing at this point in time, and, and Tara will also say uh, during her, her session, um, 
we're going to have to talk a lot about proposing, we're thinking, <laughs> we're considering. Um, we're not proposing a specific cap for any particular type of deficiency other than the category that deficiency is in. And so there's going to be essentially 12, I'll just say categories, based on the type of defect and the location of the defect. And for one of those types of defects, there's going to be what we call a defect impact weight related to that deficiency. Um, and so under UPCS, because of the, I'll just say the wonkiness of the scoring, you could have the same defect located at two different properties. And I'll, I'll give you the example of a site defect, for example. One of those properties that would result in a 15 point deduction, another property would result in less than a point deduction, depending on what other observable characteristics there are at the property. Under Inspire, that same defect, doesn't matter whether the property is large, doesn't matter whether the property is small, would have the same impact weight, right? So whatever that impact weight is, it is across all 37,000 properties nationwide. The defect weight doesn't vary depending on the property characteristics, if that makes sense. And so in essence, there is a cap on how much a single defect could result in a point deduction for a given property. And we'll talk more about that this, in great detail. <laughs> Hi, I'm, my name's Ken Morton. I work mostly in the servicing mortgage industry. Yeah. Um, two things. Number one, there's currently an ideal future date set up in the, in the multifamily side yeah. where it's plus or minus, and it depends upon your score. Um, how is that going to get integrated into the program? So for instance, maybe that's an easy answer. I don't need to explain. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we will have something similar to the concept of an ideal future date. Mm -hmm. It'll actually probably work almost the same, if not the same. Okay. Um, so I can say we are proposing to maintain 321. So if you achieve a 90 or above, you could go three years between inspections, um, 80 or above two years, anything less than 80 annually. Um, we would then kind of base that quote unquote ideal future date. And I don't know if we're gonna retain that terminology or not. We probably will, because people are familiar with it. Um, and this will be detailed in the administrative procedures notice. But it would set, be set up similarly, right? So if you scored a 91 and your inspection was January of 2023, your ideal future date would be January of 2026. Um, of course, it's important to note that HUD retains the legal and regulatory authority to come out, even, even for properties that score above a 90, if, if we have some concerns and we need to come out before that ideal future date, we could come out before that ideal future date. But we would still have that same or similar concept. On the public housing side, since I know we have representatives from both programs here, um, the ideal future dates are um, going to continue to be tied to FAS or the public housing assessment system in some way. Um, although we are giving ourselves a little more flexibility. Um, so I know it's probably not so much a dirty little secret, but um, HUD fell behind on inspections for a long period of time. Uh, we had a backlog even before the pandemic. Uh, we were supposed to inspect the properties close to that ideal future date and didn't um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we're, we're trying to give ourselves a little bit more flexibility um, from a timing standpoint, at least in the early going of Inspire, where that ideal future date could occur within about a six month window. Okay, so everybody that has a current ideal future date will probably keep that date and then it'll roll into, so somebody that did score in the UPCS uh, a 90, yep. say in June of this year, yep. probably won't have their Inspire or won't have their Inspire, except for the, yeah. if you have to go out there. Sure. Uh, okay. That's, that was it, thank well, you. Well, and thank you for saying that because <laughs> this is a point I make later in the day that even in year one of Inspire, the vast majority of properties will not get their first Inspire inspection because of 321. And we're basing 321 off of the last UPCS inspection. So for example, in the public housing portfolio, we're only estimating that about 2,200 of the 7,000 properties will get their first Inspire inspection in year one. Multifamily, it's a similar proportion, so about a third, maybe a little bit less on the multifamily side, will get their first Inspire inspection in the 12 months after we go live. So, great question.
so shorter, so it has to come down. <laughs> but um, could you speak a bit more to the housing choice vouchers? And I know you have talked about the multi-housing, the public housing, mm -hmm. timelines. Could you speak a bit more to, to the vouchers? Yeah, so um, great question. Um, and Tara, I'll also feel free to jump in here if you'd like. Um, so uh, for the voucher program, from the timing standpoint, um, we are proposing to implement Inspire October 1st, 2023. What that'll mean from a, a voucher standpoint is that uh, public housing agencies that administer um, housing choice vouchers will have to begin to use the Inspire standard beginning October 1st, 2023 to evaluate the condition of voucher units. Um, and Tara will talk more about this. Uh, but one of the things that we've done with Inspire, um, and you're going to hear the term alignment a lot, is we've also aligned Inspire with other programmatic regulations, um, including the Housing Opportunities Through Modernization Act. Um, and there's a list of life-threatening defects in HOTMA um, that would result in a unit failing a voucher inspection. And so um, Inspire adapts those, um, that list of life-threatening defects under HOTMA. Um, and, but, but, but operationally, if you're a public housing agency that's administering a voucher program, um, you will be expected to begin voucher inspections using the Inspire standard on 10-1. Um, we will be providing training. There's actually already training on HUD Exchange on Inspire for the voucher program um, that Kevin and his team put together. Um, and so um, while that training is, I think, about a year old now, um, and things are changing a little bit. Um, that training is very, very helpful in terms of preparing for voucher inspections under Inspire. Um, additionally, we're going to be doing some additional work um, out in the field with some housing agencies um, to better understand and better educate and train folks on how voucher inspections under Inspire will work. Um, and we are planning on involving um, third-party software vendors in some of those efforts um, so that they can see and get ready for the technology and the changes. Because we know a lot of folks that administer voucher programs, you know, use an integrated housing operations software package. Um, so you'll go out and do your own inspections. You'll write work orders based on um, those inspections. And so we want to make sure that um, we're preparing not just you, but your technology partners um, so that they can um, update their products and be prepared for when you have to do Inspire inspections for voucher units. Um, but in the event that you don't use one of those third-party software vendors, um, the Inspire technology and the Inspire application will also be available um, and we'll be providing training on how to use that inspection app to conduct voucher inspections. Um, once that technology is published publicly. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. So uh, just to add on the voucher program, you covered 99% of it. I would say if you work in the voucher program, all of today is relevant today, except scoring. Um, you can you know, check your email during scoring. <laughs> uh, but please stick with us because you'll see housing authorities can adopt that software that we're going to talk about in the afternoon, and you can use it for your own monitoring and metrics. Um, and so we'll make sure we'll cover those things. There are still, as Ash mentioned with HOTMA, there's some things that apply to voucher only in HOTMA um, that we had to make sure we covered, and it doesn't necessarily apply to public housing and multifamily if we could give flexibility. Um, and that acceptability criteria variations, those regs, they were retained. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Tara. Hi, Ash. Um, Hi. Pratima Damani from SP Group. A quick question regarding self-inspections. Yeah. You mentioned self-inspections, and I was wondering what would be the reporting requirements, and how would that work with the 321? Are there reporting requirements related to self-inspections? Um, could you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, great question, Pratima. Um, and thank you for your partnership on the demo. So um, I, I, um, I, you know, I, we are, so when the, Rule was published as proposed in January of 2021. Some of you may remember that um, there was quite a bit of detail around self-inspections. And one of the proposals in that proposed rule was, would HUD, for example, consider 
only performing inspections every five years, for example, if we collected self-inspection results. Um, and so I would just say that there are likely two potential use cases for self-inspections. Um, and I would, I would stress before I, I say what those two use cases are, that, that we're not right now um, preparing to collect tons and thousands of self-inspections from folks, right? So if you were doing self-inspections in the voucher program, you're gonna do that self-inspection and you're gonna keep those results locally, right? Um, but regulatorily, uh, or from a regulatory standpoint, you know, HUD does retain the ability to come out and review self-inspection results if we were to so desire. The two use cases that we would potential, potentially look at collecting self-inspection results, I think, um, and we're still having internal discussions about this, um, are high-performing properties, as mentioned in the rule, right, where you say, hey, if, if a property is scored really well and consistently really well, would REACT still come out every three years, or could it maybe be every five years if we're collecting self-inspection results? Um, so that, that, that was in the proposed rule already. I think the other use case is in the situation of troubled properties, and both public housing and multifamily will occasionally require self-inspection results to be shared with HUD if there is a troubled property. Um, and so I think that that's the other likely use case that you would see where we would be collecting potentially self-inspection results. Um, we will have the ability from a technology standpoint to collect those results, um, but the vast majority of properties, they're gonna go out and do their self-inspections and they're never gonna send that information to HUD. Hi, Angela. Hey, regarding the appeal process. Yeah. Um, in the Office of Healthcare, you know, we've been struggling with that because of the window egress issues. So typically what our borrowers do is they gather all the documentation, it's stored, it's given to React, so it goes into the database. So with us moving into Inspire, will those appeals automatically be populated into the new system? So great, <laughs> great question. Because <laughs> we're getting a lot of questions about that, so I just want to be clear. Um, so, um, and Marcel and Kevin will definitely cover this in a little bit more detail okay. later today. But we are looking at um, adopting and implementing um, what we call smart appeals. Um, and um, that would be a category of kind of those smart appeals would be those items or areas, and we, we, we see this all the time, property has to submit them every single time they get inspected, right? And we always grant it. We grant it 100% of the time, um, and we want to stop doing that. That's a burden on the property ownership management. Um, if we know that we're going to grant the appeal every single time, we grant it the first time, or we will just go back and look at our results under UPCS <laughs> and, you know, essentially, um, lock that into Inspire. Um, I would say that is an area, just to be, be fair, um, that might not be ready quite on day one, um, but that is something that we will be implementing as soon as we can, because it's a, it's a hassle for the property ownership and management. It's a hassle for us at REACT, frankly. Um, and then additionally, all appeals um, will uh, at, at some point under Inspire, um, probably pretty close to day one, be submitted electronically, um, we would, where we would not require there to be any manila envelope <laughs> envelopes sent to, sent to HUD. Um, and uh, ideally, we're going to use something like radio buttons where you'll be able to go in and see your inspection results and say, bam, I want to appeal this one and you just upload your documentation, whether it's a photo or something else. But then we're gonna create a, a catalog of these appeals that we know that we're gonna grant every year. Also then tell the inspectors ahead of time, don't cite this. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, so RPHA has a um, 
and, and I'm sure we're, we're not unique in this, we have a, um, a significant number of scattered site properties which mm -hmm. we own and operate as public housing. And I'm just wondering how, um, how, how, does, how does Inspire work in that context when you have something that's different from a, a conventional uh, multifamily site where you may, you may have issues that while they may be impacting the housing authority's unit are not something that the housing authority would be able to fix because it's um, it's a, a sidewalk issue that we that the the city wouldn't would have to take care of or it's something on a neighbor's property that is impacting our property yep great question about scattered site properties um, we're actually evaluating some of those issues and we've received comments on that in the standards notice and otherwise um, there's a lot more public property associated typically with scattered site properties. Additionally, um, you know, and I'll just use the example of a duplex. Sometimes, you know, the PHA owns and operates the one half of the duplex, but the other half is a privately owned property, right? And you have a shared roof. And so there are some complexities and challenges presented by scattered site properties um, that we are trying to and thinking about addressing and inspire in a variety of ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's even some things in terms of um, the, the unit density of the property and, and what applies, you know, from a single family versus a multifamily standpoint. So um, we are evaluating certain things that may apply uniquely to scattered site properties. I'll just add to that to make sure you stay for the scoring session. I think you'll see um, scoring will be a little bit different. You know, it, First of all, again, it's going to be focused on health and safety. So a cracked sidewalk, unless it's a clear trip hazard to go into the unit, wouldn't be cited the same way under Inspire that it was under UPCS. Um, and then you'll also see sampling is not, it's going to change a little bit, but probably stay mostly the same for those scattered sites. But it, it's the focus on the unit, the interior conditions over the exterior uh, and the site. Great. Thanks, Tara. Good morning. Henry Johnson with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. Um, the question we have, one of the questions we have is, how is the scoring going to be handled specifically as it relates to capital improvement contracts or agreements that we have in place during the inspection? Yeah. We were told at one point, if you can show the inspector that you have an existing contract, they're working on it, that some of that uh, deficiency or finding mm -hmm. could be, I'm going to say, excluded. Uh, or not included in the inspection. So yep. if you could speak to that, that'd be great. Yeah, gr great question. Um, this is an area that we are looking to improve and enhance as well, um, in part through some upfront um, work and business processes that we'll be implementing to better understand which units are under rehab. Um, we, uh, we, this is an area where I'll just say we struggle. Um, we get it right most of the time, but sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes we find out, not until the inspector arrives on site, that a unit is uninspectable because it's under one of those contracts and it was drawn from the, drawn in the sample. Um, we're proposing some changes in the way we verify the property profile prior to the inspection to make sure we're inspecting units that are, um, you know, habitated by, by, by residents, by families. What I'm speaking okay. more so, and that's, yeah. that's probably correct, but what I'm speaking more so to is sidewalk issues, erosion issues, asphalt issues. Yeah. Um, so um, that's another area that we are looking at potentially addressing through our administrative procedures. Um, I don't know if it would be a situation where we, for example, would say, hey, these are appealable deficiencies um, or if there's some other way we could deal with that up front. I will say, and Tara can jump in here, um, so something like erosion, for example, and I, I'm, I'm picking one of your examples, for example, um, erosion um, is going away as a deficiency unless it creates a health hazard in some way. Um, cracked sidewalks are going away as a deficiency unless they create a health hazard in some way. Um, we're also looking at how we treat, from an administrative standpoint, uh, publicly owned property that housing agencies or owner's agents are not responsible for. Um, and so maybe there's a city contract, right, on a set of sidewalks that are outside of the public housing property. 
and in the past, a inspector has cited it as a deficiency when they really shouldn't have. But Tara, I don't know if you want to add anything else there. That covers most of it. I would just add that the the reasons for appeal are mostly, I would expect those would be mostly unchanged. Um, you'll know the final final when the final rule comes out, but if it was a basis for appeal before, it might have been called a database adjustment. Those are not terms we're using anymore. Um, those were retained and available to both multifamily housing and public housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephen Coles. I'm with Standard Companies. Um, I know you said version 2.2 is the best version to look at, the most, uh, the latest version, yeah. which lines up with the closest version of the standards that yeah. will be retained. My question is, currently under UPCS, you can get an idea of where you might score based on points and deficiencies. Since INSPIRE is pass or fail, how many health and safety deficiencies constitute a fail? And since it's largely unit-based, what's the plan to deal with the resident responsibility with, it, it, as it points to damage or destruction to the property? Yeah, um, so good questions. I'll take them one at a time. So uh, let me clarify that for Properties that were subject to the Uniform Physical Condition Standard, they will still be scored on a zero to 100 point basis. So it's not pass-fail. I mean, okay. we have a definition of pass-fail on that 100 point scale, which is 60 is the threshold. So mm -hmm. if you score 60 or above, you're considered passing. If you're below 60, you're considered failing. We will retain something like that in that zero to 100 point scale. Um, for voucher units, voucher units um, are pass-fail today under housing quality standards. Those will be pass-fail under Inspire as well. So we're essentially maintaining the two scoring you know, scales for the two programs. Um, voucher units don't have a zero to 100 point score associated with them, and they will not have a zero to 100 point score associated with them under Inspire. Um, so, um, but I, I think to your question, um, and we'll, we'll go over this when we get to scoring this afternoon. Um, it will be pretty, we think it's gonna be pretty easy to figure out under the new scoring methodology how many of certain types of deficiencies would result in a certain score. Um, so every type of deficiency, depending on the severity of the deficiency and where that deficiency is located, will have a value attributed to it. Um, and we'll go over the scoring methodology this afternoon. And so, you know, you will be able to see, for example, okay, if I have these types of deficiencies in these categories and locations, this will, this will deduct this much from my score and this could result in a failure. Because there's, there's multiple ways to fail, right? It, you know, it just depends on the types of deficiencies that are identified, but it should be pretty easy to figure it out. I would say, probably much easier than it is to figure out under UPCS, actually. Um, but I would say statistically, in what we're seeing kind of like nationwide, um, based on some of the analysis we've done um, in creating the scoring notice, um, is that um, you know, under, under UPCS, um, properties that failed had over one life-threatening defect per unit. That's pretty significant if you think about it, right? Uh, under Inspire, that threshold will be lowered um, to something, you know, we're proposing to be less than one. Um, but I, the whole key to passing under Inspire is minimize those life-threatening and severe non-life-threatening defects in the units. So, um, and then um, you had a, a question about the units and resident maintenance of the units. Um, we are looking at, and um, under UPCS today, um, there are some mechanisms um, where you can appeal uh, certain observations identified in inspection where um, it, it, you make the case essentially in your appeal that the, the resident caused the issue, um, you undertook lease enforcement, lease enforcement is ongoing, so we're looking at things like lease enforcement and what you potentially do to address those potential situations where you know you, you may have a resident right that that has 
um, the way that they've maintained their unit. One of the things that we hear about routinely or two of the things we hear about are, are hoarding, and then the second thing we hear about, right, is infestation, you know, resident leaves food out, you know. Um, so we're looking at mechanisms of potentially allowing some relief in those circumstances. Thank you. Just one quick thing to add on that. In the standard session today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about things that maybe were inspected under UPCS and cited, like broken picture frames, the tenant's mirror broke. Um, that would, while those are health and safety hazards, we have a different way of defining inspectable areas under Inspire, and those would not, unless it's part of the unit, um, would not necessarily be uh, cited as a deficiency. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. There are some hazards like, you know, fire hazards that even if it's tenant-owned property, they brought it into the unit, it could cause a fire in the building. Those would still get cited, and Cliff will talk about that today. Great. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, good Louis Blondin from the Tampa Housing Authority. Um, on the REAC inspection, um, a unit that was in the past treated for a roach infestation uh, they no longer have roach infestation, they don't, they don't longer have roaches, but during an inspection, an inspector notice a part of a roach or a leg of a roach all the way question. on the back of the <laughs> kitchen cabinet, and they cite that as a roach infestation, and they, they took a lot of points uh, from that. Would that be any changes on the Inspire when it comes to that matter? Um, so, yes, uh, the question about infestation and uh, cockroach pieces is something that we're looking <laughs> at. Um, uh, and I'll tell you, beyond this, you know, one of my favorite questions from one of the sessions is would, would HUD consider determining the cause of the death of the cockroach? Um, and I, I said we will not be doing cockroach autopsies. Um, I never thought I would be talking about that in my current position, but uh, it is what it is. We are looking at um, what we call kind of the standard or threshold for what is considered infestation. Um, and. Uh, we would prefer that our inspectors not be looking for or counting pieces of cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Would that be implemented um, as of October 1st? Uh, July 1st for public, for public housing, housing, and then October 1st for uh, right. multifamily and vouchers. Great. And then from the health and safety as well, a resident decided to remove the cover of the own fan to clean it during the inspection. Um, the inspector cited as a health and safety uh, property has no control over what the resident is doing when it comes to the personal items. What yep. Inspire can do about it's that? It's the same answer as the picture frames. Yeah, yeah. so, so we, are, we yeah. are looking at resident-owned property and to what extent um, it would be covered or we could even issue deficiencies under Inspire. Uh, we're actually having discussions with our general counsel about that, um, and we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that during um, standards. Um, the other thing I will say, um, you know, in, in the case of, of whether it's resident-owned property or non-resident-owned property, um, we, I want to be clear, we, we don't want to put our inspectors in a situation where they're having to make a judgment call on the day of the inspection, right? And, 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 and that sometimes happens today. Um, uh, we want our inspectors to be able to go in and do their job and objectively and dispassionately observe what they see. So there may be certain things that, that they would still cite, but then we would have in our procedures, right, a mechanism for addressing those post-inspection. Um, but our inspectors work really hard and we don't want to put them in judgment call situations unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Um, HUD has used like the comp bulletin, the REA compilation bulletin iterations of that over time and inspector notices and whatnot to sort of, you know, have REAC evolve. There's a lot in those documents that may or may not carry over to inspire. Um, so what's being done about that? Yeah, so great question, Maureen. Um, so, um, we are um, getting rid of the comp bulletin, um, and uh, we will be, for one, replacing it primarily with just better, more well-written standards, right? Um, the comp bulletin is kind of a hybrid document um, that has some additional detail about standards under UPCS. Um, it also has some information about kind of procedural um, 
you know, activities that an inspector should think about or conduct. Um, and we think there's better ways of dealing with that than having this kind of comp bulletin that is kind of pseudo standards, pseudo other stuff. Um, and Cliff will talk about that um, during the standard session. We are replacing um, the comp bulletin um, with a protocols guide. Um, but the protocols guide will be specific to the standards themselves. It will not be kind of the more operational or procedural types of information that are in the comp bulletin today. Um, and we can talk more about the, the, we'll be talking more about the protocols guide when we get to standards later today. So what about things like declaring a unit or building offline? So that will be handled, for example, um, up front prior to the inspection. Um, so the process we're proposing involves REACT working with field office staff in both multifamily and public housing to verify the profile prior to the inspection and determining which buildings, if a property is offline, even if a specific unit's offline. Um, that today um, is covered by other information, but we, we don't want that to occur the day of an inspection, right? The inspector. Uh, we don't want the inspector to show up and spend four or five hours working with property management to verify the configuration of the property, whether it's six buildings or seven buildings. We want to do that all up front. We want to be on the same page. And what I mean the same page, it means property ownership management, the multifamily or public housing field staff, and REACT, right? We should all be aligned on what we're looking at. So will all of that be in the administrative notice? Yeah, I was just going to add, a lot of what you're looking for is going to be in those You've heard subordinate notices. We're going to probably call them our core implementing notices. Yeah. It's because it needs. there was content in some of that other guidance that should have been part of the Federal Register, should have been open for public comment. So those elements will be in those official notices. When it gets to something that's just, here's what HUD's going to do when they show up, that is like a, a departmental notice. So Federal Register for the high-level content that was open for public comment, and then departmental notices for the other day-to-day -day stuff, but then we can still do other protocols, training, uh, more informal guidance will be on React's website. So as part of this change, we'll be pulling down all that old guidance, making sure the notices are, are very apparent and linkable from React's website, and then letting you know where to go for the other content. And the inspector notice, the existing inspector notices? The ones that are no longer relevant will get um, rescinded. Okay, yep. great, thank you. Thank you. Max Kramer, Bisco. So a quick question. I'm happy to hear what you said about the profile verification in advance, but is this Enspire inspection data going to go directly into PIC and IRAMS, and is it going to be like updated in real time? Like, for example, say we do an inspection, it's actually 30 buildings and 300 units instead of 10 buildings, 300 units. Next time you guys go to order that, the data will already be updated and it will come out as 30 buildings, 300 units? That's the goal. That's what we're shooting for, um, just kind of for everybody's awareness. Um, the Public Housing Information Center um, Inventory Management System, um, we, we uh, more affectionately call IMS PIC or just PIC, um, and IRAMS um, uh, are the, you know, are supposed to be the inventory sources of record for our programs, right? And I know that that hasn't always been the case, um, but we will be working through our technology modernization to have um, better integration of data um, across um, IMS PIC and um, our inspections. Um, and just for those of you who don't know, IMS PIC is also in the process of being modernized. Um, we're creating something called the Housing Information Portal, which is a replacement for, for PIC. Um, both HIP, which is the replacement for IMS PIC, and our Inspire technology are built in the same Salesforce platform, um, so they will be able to talk to each other more Perfect. seamlessly. And then we're going to be working on an integration with IRAMS um, later this spring and fall so that we consistently have data and a feedback loop. And one small follow-up. So if a property yeah. goes rad and say it goes from PIC into IRAMS, now currently when it gets bid out, does it comes down to zero, zero, or zero buildings? whatever, in theory, with these new data systems, when it goes from PIC to IRAMS, will data come across? Say, I, I hope. <laughs> we will be working on that. There is um, various integration points, and we, we want to make sure that our property profile data is, I'll just say, consistent. It's one source of truth. 
<laughs> and we don't have two or three different versions of what a property profile looks like, uh, whether it's rad or for whatever other reason, whatever other repositioning or otherwise might be taking place. Perfect, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so um, we will, um, I think it's um, break time. Um, oh, well, and I'm gonna turn it back to Marcel. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ash, thank you, Tara, this was awesome. This, hope you guys feel energized, that you seem energized, the questions are there, the excitement is there, the passion's there. So we're gonna take a break. <laughs> so um, I know we're a little off schedule, but we're gonna do what Inspire does best, is we're gonna figure it out. So uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break, 10 minute break, and then uh, restrooms are on either end of the hallway, and then come back, and then we'll get started with Tara, okay? So, you're on break. Thank you very much. See you soon. Hi, thanks. I'm Tara Radosevich. Um, first, thanks to Marcel, uh, who's been really wonderful at keeping us all uh, motivated and also on track with implementing Inspire. Um, just a quick few words about my background. Um, I've actually been at HUD, let's say, just over 20 years. I don't want to age myself. I started in HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control in Healthy Homes. My background is environmental, environmental health, environmental health and safety, um, specifically lead-based paint. So if you have any burning lead-based paint question, I'm your gal, uh, find me. I probably know the obscure answer. Um, and then I jumped over to uh, public and Indian housing, actually in our field offices. I was a division director in the Minneapolis field office for a few years. Um, that's been great to understand, you know, working with housing authorities and what happens on the ground and what experience our field staff have, uh, and I always appreciate that expertise. Um, and then I came over to public housing and voucher programs, so I've had some time actually working in the policy side of public housing and voucher um, issues. And so if you have any burning questions in that area, I'll fake it uh, and then pass the mic to my colleagues that are here. Okay, so why are we here? Um, as you've heard a few times today, we wanna make sure you're ready. This is a big change coming your way, and there's a lot of um, little changes within the big change that we wanna make sure we flag for you so that you know when everything is published as final and is out there, you know what to look for and you'll understand it better. We need to connect the dots on the Inspire demonstration. Um, it's wonderful that we have participants here from the Inspire demonstration. Some of you already know um, you're at that 202 level on Inspire, but we still got a lot of 101 level uh, courses that we need to deliver on Inspire, and some of the lessons we learned through the demonstration are, are key to that information. Um, there's still some areas open for comment. So a lot of the Inspire rule was already put out, the rule and the notices has already been put out for public comment. I'm gonna to talk today about what's already been put out there and, and um, what comments we received. There's still some coming for comment. Um, notably, the scoring notice will be put out for public comment. And so you still have an opportunity to weigh in and get your feedback on the record in the docket for HUD to consider. Um, and we wanna make sure you're ready for implementation. We don't wanna surprise you. Everything's still maybe gonna feel like a surprise. Maybe we've all been tuned into the pandemic and surviving. Uh, so some of this may still feel like a surprise, but we wanna make sure we get you there so it's not um, too much of a change too fast. All right, so we got a QR code for scanning. Raise your hand if you want anybody to run out and help you, but I think you guys got it. I'll say that in Seattle, we didn't have to give anybody any help. They all knew how to scan QR codes. <laughs> DC, you're, you're there. Also, we're getting the best numbers that I've ever seen at one of these sessions for QR responses, so thank you. see here? I'll tell you, this is also my favorite question in our session because we, when you have those open-ended questions, you get a lot of interesting feedback. 
and folks can be really candid, and we appreciate that. Nothing yet. You know, we have a lot of that. I think today we have our best mix of know a lot and don't know, and then, you know, in the middle. It is a coming inspection change. There's more, though. Uh, it's, it's going to revise a lot of the um, React processes, and then it's, it's going to touch on um, uh, a lot of HUD programs, which I'll cover today. Final rule coming soon, very soon. Coming soon to a Federal Register near you. Focus of REAC, it is a big focus of REAC. Um, you know, as the Real Estate Assessment Center, we assess real estate. Uh, but we don't assess all real estate, and it's also using REAC's expertise um, and lending that expertise to our other HUD programs where maybe inspections are done by uh, housing authority or participating jurisdiction. Okay, is that my only question or was there another one? Okay, all right, we'll jump in, jump back. Three inspectable areas, yes. Big definitions under each one though. But go ahead. Okay, as you've heard a few times today, we are replacing UPCS. UPCS, uh, it's based on HUD regulations in part five, but it lives in policy, in policy documents. Um, it's heading out into the sunset cruise. Uh, it will exist until April for public housing and October for multifamily housing, and then it will be gone. It will be erased from all the regulations and policy documents put out by HUD. Uh, unless you find that one in a random corner of our website and you'll notify us right away and we'll get that down. Um, housing quality standards. So that term, while the housing quality standards are converting over to INSPIRE, that term will still exist in some places. Um, for example, on the 50058, that form you fill out when residents move in, it will still say date that the unit passed HQS. Um, HQS will still be in part 982, that term. Um, it is staying there because that's, I believe, a statutory term. We're going to keep that. It's just those regs will point over to part five. The housing quality standards are becoming the INSPIRE standards. Um, and it will be synonymous with 24 CFR part five. So we're in Washington. You guys know what I mean when I say CFR, but just to make sure I clarify, that is the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, the Code of Federal Regulations, we call it 24 CFR. That's where HUD's regs are. That part five covers all of the programs that are going to be under INSPIRE, and those are going to be our housing, uh, our INSPIRE standards. That is your essentially your decent, safe, and sanitary that we've, um, the term that we've used in the past. All right, so we can't change regulations overnight, and we can't just do it in a black box and not involve the public in what we're doing. Uh, so we change our regulations through a very deliberate rulemaking process. We have to propose, we have to put out a version of our regulations that we're proposing to change. We're going to open up questions for comment. We have to consider public comments before those rule, before the rule is final. Um, in a good year, maybe a proposed and final reg takes about a year. I think you've heard that it's taken us a few years. We're going to, uh, you know, point to the pandemic for some of that. Uh, but we have been working on the Inspire program for four or five years. And while it may seem like it's coming at you pretty fast, it has been baking uh, internally for a little while. And that proposed rule was the first time we got it all down on paper for public comment. We use a demonstration to inform what was in that proposed rule. Um, and then we're going to go through that rulemaking process, and we're going to have very high-level regulations. That Code of Federal Regulations, you know, you walk into a HUD office, and you're going to see shelves of these colored books. There's a different color for every year. Um, those are actually, while they look very voluminous, those are pretty high level in the regs. We still have to do our implementing notices, subordinate notices, or we're going to call them core notices, that give the details around what does that regulation mean for you as a covered entity. Um, those notices are going to be in the Federal Register. So the Federal Register is like the daily news for the federal government. Um, it's printed every day. Federal Register notices include these notices, the, the core subordinate notices, and it also has the regulations as they are proposed and final, and it comes out every day. Um, this used to be, some of you have been around Washington for a lot of years, we used to send the interns over to go pick up a whole bunch of booklets from the government printing office. We probably still do that, but they're also on the internet now. All right, so the proposed rule hit a lot of things. Revising part five. Um, replacing the term UPCS in regs and guidance, eliminating it actually, 
um, redefining HQS to uh, point to Inspire. We also did more implementation of HOTMA, the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act. So HOTMA was the most comprehensive law changing public housing and voucher programs um, in recent years. It's huge. Uh, Inspire is going to finish implementing a few parts of HOTMA, but there's other HOTMA rules that have already been issued, HOTMA policy notices, and more regs coming under HOTMA, but Inspire touches a few parts of that, and we, we incorporated it into the Inspire regulations. Um, and then the Economic Growth Act for small rural public housing authorities. So small rural housing authorities are those housing authorities that have less than 500 combined public housing and voucher units and are located in um, what we consider a rural area. And we are lessening um, some requirements for those agencies to decrease how, they, how often they are scored and assessed and um, how many elements they are scored and assessed. So that's for both the public housing and the voucher programs. They're gonna to go to, on the public housing side, every three years for a FAS score. FAS score will be just based on your physical conditions. And I think it's also every three years for CMAP, the Section 8 Management Assessment Program, um, and reducing the indicators that you are assessed under. It hits a lot of numbers in our regs. So this also hits, I haven't talked a lot about this, but Community Planning and Development Program, CPD, um, HOPWA, the Housing for Persons with AIDS, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, ESG, Emergency Solution Grants, Housing Trust Fund, Home Programs. These regulations actually already pointed to the housing quality standards or elements of HQS. Um, and because we are changing Part 5 and we're changing the HQS regs with that, it also will impact those CPD programs. And we propose that in the Inspire proposed rule, and you'll see the final regs and the final regulation. And we also opened up some questions that I'll talk about today for some of the special housing types that are under those programs. All right, so some of the big things in the proposed rule. You saw this in Asha's presentation. There's a little bit more here. You will get these slides after this meeting, because um, this is the uh, the Cliff's notes of the full proposed rule. Uh, the standards review process, we want to look at those every three years. We don't want to wait another 20 years before we revise them. Um, you know, we may look at things in three years and not change a lot, but we may change some things as we learn and um, learn from doing these inspections, and we have that opportunity built, baked into the regulations to make sure that we HUD do that. But we're also going to do it in an open forum. So we will propose changes, get comments, and finalize them after it. We'll do that through Federal Register notices. Um, we included new categories for health and safety. So in the proposed rule, we used SHS, severe health and safety, and HNS. Um, that changed over time, and in the standards notice, we proposed new terms, life-threatening, severe, but not life-threatening, moderate, and low. Uh, I think actually we had advisory, but that's changing to low. So we, we changed that terminology around, and then this is another link to HOTMA. HOTMA used that term life-threatening. Um, and corrections that must be done in 24 hours. So I think it was specifically for the voucher programs, but we kept the life-threatening category for the INSPIRE standards. Uh, we introduced for comment um, new affirmatives. So these were in the questions of the proposed rule. Uh, affirmative requirements are those things that every, every unit coming into HUD programs, the covered rental assistance programs, uh, would need to meet to come into HUD's programs. But then if you're already part of HUD's programs and you're continuing in this, uh, you're gonna need to get to that, to that new level of an affirmative requirement to make sure you have it. And we took a lot of comments on these. Um, we had to weigh the potential impact to housing providers and industry to have these new standards, but also what the potential health outcomes would be. Uh, those elements were GFCI outlets uh, near a water source, uh, permanent lighting in the kitchen and bathroom, uh, HVAC, a requirement that there be a permanent heating source in the unit, um, and related to that, uh, an assurance that a unit can meet a minimum temperature in heating seasons. Uh, but with that, we are considering climate zones, and you will hear more from Cliff about that today. He is the expert in that area. Um, but we also looked at putting those affirmatives into regulation. Um, that's a higher level standard when it's in the reg versus when it's in policy, um, and it makes it a little bit more challenging. If your unit doesn't meet that reg, it could mean that the unit cannot come into the rental assistance program. So we really tried to stick with the, the most important things that every unit must have. Along with some of those special safety items, um, we also looked at our basic habitability standards. Hot and cold running water, uh, flushable toilet, a kitchen, a place to store food. 
those of you in the voucher program, this sounds a lot like 982. It's because we took a lot from there, the minimum standards that a unit must have. But there's always a but in my presentation, or an asterisk. Um, we know that there's some programs in our, uh, in our programs that serve homeless persons. Maybe it's a, a bedroom unit in a group house, and the bathroom isn't in the unit. Uh, do we still want to assist those in those programs. We have to make sure that we don't write the regs so stringently that we disqualify those units. Um, where we need flexibility to consider the housing market, we want to make sure we consider that. Where there's state or local standards that maybe, um, you know, a jurisdiction has been following, uh, we wanted to make sure that it makes, if those standards are, I'll just be honest, in some cases they were better than HUD's, <laughs> if those standards are more stringent, that there be flexibility for that particular program to follow those. But another asterisk, I'm talking about homeless programs and not public housing and multifamily housing and voucher housing, um, unless it's a special unit type. All right, new requirements for resolving health and safety deficiencies. So those of you in the public housing and multifamily world, you're probably familiar with EHNS, Exigent Health and Safety, and there'd be a process when REAC cited you for EHNS violations, there'd be a follow-up. Um, with the field office in, I think it was 72 hours, because you have to fix it in 24, but you had 72 hours to certify to the field office that you resolve that deficiency. Um, for the most part, that's being retained, but it's, a little bit, it's gonna be a little bit different under Inspire, and we proposed adding new categories to that follow-up um, and new requirements for what you submit. So it's not just a certification, it would be, uh, we propose to collect documentation that's the evidence that the deficiency was resolved. What does that mean? Wasn't fully in the proposed rule. That's something we con are considering because of co with comments. Um, is it a picture? Is it a work order? That's all still open for um, consideration. We don't have the final answer for you today. Self-inspections. All right, so self-inspections, we've said it today. That, those already existed for public housing. Um, you'll remember during the COVID pandemic when we had a lot of waivers available, there's a time period that we waived the requirement for housing authorities to do self-inspections of resident units because it was risky to go into units and we didn't, not everybody had a, a PPE yet. Um, that waiver ended uh, and then we have been reminding during, there was a period of time where that waiver ended but REAC wasn't going out and we reminded housing authorities that an annual self-inspection is required. We haven't put a lot of guidance out about that, um, about what we expect for a self-inspection. Is it annual? Is it every unit? Um, and with the proposed rule, we proposed a reg that would require 100% unit inspection annually in public housing and multifamily housing programs. Uh, that was in the proposed rule. We heard a lot of comments on that. Um, we heard a lot of feedback about uh, the potential burden that would be. Um, we've heard that maybe that's still kind of a surprise to some housing authorities that we had such a requirement. We hear you. Um, we're still considering all those requirements and we're considering, um, and bear with me when I keep saying, we're considering, we're hoping, we're planning. It's because the final rule isn't out yet, and so I can't give away all the answers, even if I, um, you know, we're not there yet. And so not everything is fully done, uh, and that's why you'll hear that terminology. We heard a lot of comments, and what may come out in the final rule uh, could be a, a different version of what was in the proposed rule. Uh, administrative referrals. Okay, so this was a big one that I think commenters actually might have missed somewhat in the proposed rules, so I do want to flag it for folks today. So in the multifamily housing program, uh, there was a requirement that if a property scored 30 or less, there was an automatic referral to the Departmental Enforcement Center, uh, the DEC, as we call it. That's a different, it's just another HUD office. Um, they're kind of a special HUD office, though. They're part of our Office of General Counsel. They deal specifically with enforcing the regulations under HUD's programs. Um, they're essentially, they're independent. They are not the Office of Housing or Public Housing. They're their own office. Um, and they did follow up directly with multifamily owners for low failing, uh, low scoring properties. Uh, and they have the ability to collect civil money penalties in the multifamily housing program. On the public housing side, there are some housing authorities that have uh, experienced working with the DEC. They've done, um, they got a lot of financial analysts. I don't think any housing authorities on the public housing side have dealt directly with the DEC on, on um, property scores, but this is something that was in the proposed rule. As we consolidate regulations, it means everybody comes under the same umbrella, um, and what the proposed rule proposed is properties under 30, public housing properties under 30, also getting referred to the DEC, the Departmental Enforcement Center. Um, under 60. So 
administrative referrals in housing, they also had, if you score two times under 60, they could refer you to the DEC. That was actually in multifamily policy notices, but not in the reg, um, and it could be added to the final INSPIRE regulation. All right, so we're not just gonna put a reg out and be quiet, we're gonna implement, we're gonna write these notices, these implementing notices, core notices, uh, to, to expand upon what's in the rule. Uh, two of those major notices, the standards notice and the scoring notice, will be open for public comment before they are final. The standards notice went out in June, comments closed in August. Uh, we will probably see the final Inspire standards notice come out probably in the next month or two. Uh, for that, you know, these Inspire standards, we've talked about them being on our website, uh, their version 2.1. Those were standards we used in the demonstration, but to do the, the formal rulemaking process, we had to take all of those standards and put them in a gigantic PDF attachment that we put on the web for public comment. So if there's anybody in this room that read all those 200 pages, God bless you, thank you for sending us comments. We appreciate you reading things, um, and we, consider, we are considering your comments. And we're considering also, you know, there may have been things that we thought well, it should be this way, and this is what we should inspect for, we've got to get this done. But in the field, it just didn't work. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be something that uh, could be inspected easily, or maybe it didn't actually uh, you know, equate to a health and safety impact. Um, and where we could use research to consider what things are actually harming residents in their units, we did. And that was also part of getting public comment and making sure, you know, there's a lot of health and safety advocates in DC and across the country, if there's something that they know is adversely impacting residents, impacting their health and safety, they had um, an opportunity to give us comments on that. The administrative notice we've talked a little bit about today, that's gonna be the nuts and bolts of how the inspection is happening. Those are things that we wouldn't put out for comments so much because either A, they're in HUD's discretion, or they're not you know, controversial topics. Um, we still will always take feedback on REAC operations. It's just we don't have to do it through a formal federal register notice with public comment period. We can go ahead and just put out the administrative notice to implement the rule. Uh, it'll either be with the rule or shortly thereafter. Uh, we know we need to do a notice for the small rural agencies, FAS and CMAP, um, what that scoring will look like, how we're gonna baseline you, um, when you can expect to you know, if, if you are small and rural, are you on the list? When are we gonna do the list? When are we gonna revisit the list? All of that will be in its own notice. Um, we know that in, is there anyone from CPD here today? Can I call you out? Are you on this, put you on the spot? No, okay. <laughs> uh, CPD is gonna put out their own notices. So a good, a good reason why CPD is gonna put out their own notices, first because they have a lot of different housing types that they serve, um, but there's also, like in the home program, we know that there are some um, sales that occur, and the participating jurisdiction, that, that unit that they are selling probably isn't gonna meet all of the INSPIRE standards before they sell it, but they're gonna work with the resident to get it up to uh, an acceptable standard, perhaps after move-in. And we wanna allow that flexibility in that program because uh, units on the market don't meet all the INSPIRE standards. Um, and there's some things we want them to meet, but there's other things that can be fixed later. Uh, resident feedback. Uh, resident feedback, there's, I would expect that you're gonna see you're gonna see some in the administrative notice about how resident feedback will work to implement what's in the reg. That's not our last word on resident feedback. And so I would um, encourage everybody to keep watching the Federal Register. If there are future changes in what information we're collecting, how we collect it, what that burden is, you would see that in a future notice. Inspire and what's in the Inspire admin notice won't be the last thing we say about resident feedback, but if we can implement different things in different phases, um, that's our approach. Standards notice, okay. There were some other questions in the standards notice, so actually let me, let me back up. That, this is the notice, the Inspire standards were put out in notice in June. Um, as I mentioned, there was a giant PDF that got posted on the web, a couple hundred pages, but we also opened some new questions that even though they were questions that we had in the proposed rule, we wanted more information about uh, the particular requirement before we implemented it. Um, we asked for more questions on mold. You know, how do we assess mold? What if we use moisture meters? What if an inspector carries a moisture meter and, and looks at moisture levels in areas that could be mold? You know, we want to discern between maybe mold stains versus an active mold colony that's taking over your drywall. And so we put some questions out about gauging severity of mold. Um, safe drinking water, okay, so this is a big one. Um, 
HUD has had events, and I shouldn't say HUD has had events, uh, citizens of America <laughs> have had events where they find out that the public, public water supply is not safe. Um, we've always, in the HUD world, you know, we deferred to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. We defer to local public water supply systems. They are the agencies that are responsible for ensuring safe drinking water. And our assumption was always, if the HUD unit is hooked up to a municipal water supply, cool, check, done. Uh, we at the HUD side know your water's safe because there's all of these organizations that are making sure our drinking water is safe in America. Um, we learned with Flint that that's not always the case um, and that there may be sustained cases where the municipal water supply is not safe. And if there isn't safe water, it was actually a very clear violation of HQS standards because HQS required um, water in the unit that was free of contamination. Um, and on the UPCS side, we just said your water had to be potable. Um, what does potable mean? I think most of us know if we camp uh, that we only drink potable water. Um, but is potable water necessarily free from chemicals? Maybe not. Uh, could have lead in it. And so the UPCS standards were not clear on water. HQS was, I'll say, abundantly clear, maybe a standard that potentially even our municipal water supply systems are not meeting because there's no water free from all contamination. And so we had to reconcile that um, in the INSPIRE standards and come up with, and in the rule, come up with a uniform requirement across our programs. In the proposed rule, we proposed to change potable to safe, safe drinking water to align with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and we got a lot of comments on that. I will tell you today, you know, we are HUD, we are not EPA. We don't set water standards. We are not gonna put out, this is the maximum level of lead and copper you can have in your water. We're gonna continue to defer to those experts, but we wanna look at gathering more information through the INSPIRE inspection process and in the standards, and we wanted to get more feedback about what that could look like. So in the standards notice we proposed, um, could we collect information about your, who your public water supply system is, um, and do you know if there's any active water alerts? We'll talk about this more in the standards notice, so I'm not, or the standards section, so I'm not gonna go into great detail, but we opened this up for more comments, um, and we got them, and we really appreciate all the feedback. Right there. So the question is, will we also uh, consider guidance for properties that are not on the public water supply? Um, yes, uh, that would likely be the admin notice, or um, there's also an HQS inspection manual we're gonna update, it's chapter 10. We'll put it there as well. Um, I'll say, you know, we, we don't require testing for water, but where there's a known hazard, um, there could be questions about that in the HQS inspection. Okay. Best. More comments. The tables. So those individual standards, um, if you pull up that notice that we put out for comment, they're in tables. Those tables equate to what's on the Inspire website, uh, the individual standards. We have a door standard, a window standard, a lead-based paint standard. Those are all on the web. Those are the tables in the proposed notice. Um, we also proposed up updates to the HOTMA LT list, the life-threatening list. So there's a, a provision in HOTMA that allowed housing authorities to do a two-step inspection where you first just look at, are there any life-threatening conditions in the unit? And if it passes for the life-threatening conditions, the family can go ahead and move in. But if there are non-life-threatening um, other standard deficiencies in the unit, those could get fixed, uh, either inspected later and, and fixed later. So for some housing authorities, it became a two-step process and they maybe didn't want to do that. But it did allow families to move in sooner. And so as part of this rulemaking and making sure we're implementing HOTMA, we created a life-threatening list for comment. And the life-threatening corrections those are 24-hour corrections in the voucher program. Uh, if the unit is occupied, um, you can allow more time if the unit's empty. But all that time that you allow is, you know, longer that the family can move in. So this is a, you know, in that LT list, we want to make sure we get it right um, because it could impact our family's ability. First, we don't want to impact the resident's safety, but we also want to consider can the resident move in faster. All right, scoring notice, as you've heard, it's coming. That will be in the Federal Register. It'll be open for comment. Um, I would look for that in the next few months. And you're gonna hear a lot more today about what's gonna be in that notice so that you're all ready to comment. Uh, it, will it will reflect the INSPIRE goals. The conditions in the unit are gonna count more than the conditions in the inside common areas versus the site or exterior outside um, portion of the property. 
we're going to look at health and safety over curb appeal. So, you know, we've gotten the vegetation questions, the crack sidewalk. Um, we've also gotten, you know, is are you going to keep citing me HUD for um, mismatched citing? We replaced part of our citing. It wasn't the same color. Are you going to keep citing us for that? Is it a health and safety? No, unless there's, you know, water getting in and there's an active water intrusion occurring where the siding was repaired, we'd, might, we'd cite that. But no, we're not going to cite you for mismatched siding. Uh, and floor tiles are another one. This wasn't, you know, when you sometimes you need to replace a section of the floor tile, it's not the same color as the other. That would not be a citable deficiency. Uh, sampling. Listen today in the scoring session because sampling is going to change a little bit. We still want to keep to a 90% confidence interval and a less than 0.6% error rate, um, but the number of units that react samples when they go out is going to change a little bit. Um, and then we're going to provide our justification. So as part of being open and transparent through a rulemaking process, HUD's going to tell you this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. When we do our final notice and we get comments that say, HUD, you really shouldn't do this thing, if we say, well, we are anyway, we're going to explain why we made the decision we did. It's open, transparent, and, and we're not, no more surprises. I mean, it might still be a surprise, but we're going to explain <laughs> why we chose that path. All right, administrative notice, I'm not going to go too much in this, but I do want to flag one big thing in the administrative notice is going to be that process before the inspection. Um, we're looking at a two-part, a two-step process to confirm information before we come out. Um, so you may remember when REACT comes out, they're going to ask you for your elevator certificates, um, your lead-based paint evaluations, they're going to look at some tenant files. There were things that REACT was collecting on site during their day of inspection that we want to collect in advance. Um, we want to shorten the time that inspectors are rifling through your files. If there's information we can get in advance, you can just scan it and upload to REACT maybe 30, 45 days before the inspection. Let's do that. Um, we're also going to confirm the property uh, contacts, um, the field office contacts, this information would be available to uh, the property representative or PHA, the field office, and REACT all at the same time so that we can get that information in advance and confirm what we know before we go out. Um, that's your first point of contact. The second would be when the inspector is starting to schedule. Um, and that's when we, you know, you've heard about ideal future dates. That's when we're going to confirm when is the inspector planning to come to your site. The administrative notice is also going to talk about what happens with your REACT inspection. It'll be divided up before the inspection, which is what I just covered, during and after the inspection. What information has to be made available to tenants after your inspection? How should that be available? What are your time frames? And then how to do um, technical appeals or technical reviews. So database adjustments on the ship with UPCS, with the MITI, um, but technical reviews, all still there. You didn't lose anything. You, we're not expecting you're going to lose any bases for technical appeals. Those will all still be there. But we have to tell you how to submit for those. And we're going to put in big writing, no manila envelopes. Um, but if you need to use a manila envelope, we'd allow it. Uh, but we'd like to do everything electronically. Uh, we'll communicate about the self-inspection process. So this I know, um, you know, we keep saying, you've been doing self-inspections. You've already been doing them. They're going to be new under Inspire because they're different standards. And we know that. Um, Agencies and property owners are going to need a little bit more time to get the training and learn the INSPIRE standards before you can start inspecting on them in your, in your housing. The administrative notice will go over what, what standards, how to submit it, all of that. Um, but we know, I'll just say today, we're going to give you a little bit more time to get there. Administrative referrals. So that part I mentioned about the DEC, the Departmental Enforcement Center, we will articulate in that notice what that means, what kind of communication you might expect from the DEC, what the expectations are for follow-up um, and responding to the DEC's questions. Why is this taking so long? Why can't you just tell us what the answers are? <laughs> and, and there, you know, for as many, why is this taking so long, it, we also get, why are you doing this so quickly? Um, we have to follow the Administrative Procedures Act. When we are making major changes like this, they must go in the Federal Register and in the Code of Federal, Regulation, or Code of Federal Regulations, CFR. We've got to propose, we've got to final. We've got to make it ready to or open to everyone to comment on. Um, we can't let some groups comment and not others and give them an opportunity for comment that the rest of the public didn't have. Um, it's all going to be on a website. Those dockets are open. Everything on the proposed rule, every single comment that came in, those still live on the Federal Register website. You can look at what 
organizations commented. Most of them put their name there. Um, if you're a housing authority that commented, thank you, your name's there. We can understand, you know, if you have special conditions in, you know, a southern area and you have more pests than perhaps other areas, uh, we can see that and we can understand that when you tell us who's commenting or who, you're, who you are when you comment and what those special considerations are. The final rule will have answers to every comment. I'm ready to promise that to you. Um, it's a lot of pages, uh, but we have to answer every comment. The most we can do is maybe consolidate. Commenters have said that the requirements for self-inspection are unclear. And then HUD's response is, well, we will put out more guidance, is an example. Um, so we can consolidate some of the comments, but we have to respond to every one. And I will tell you that the attorneys at HUD, if we miss a comment, we don't fully answer what that commenter raised. They flag it, and the rule doesn't go anywhere until we answer it. The final rule will have effective dates. So you're getting a lot of dates thrown at you today. The final rule is going to clarify what all these dates are, um, because there's only so many kinds of dates that HUD could give you. Uh, a final rule has got a date it's published, and then a date that it's effective. A final rule cannot be effective less than 30 days after it's published. So there's always going to be a minimum of 30 days before final regulations are effective for your program. But we're also going to have compliance dates. Um, oh, but let me back up just a bit. One of the other reasons why the rulemaking process can take a little bit of time on a, a good day, it's a year, um, is because we also have to work with the Office of Management and Budget. And OMB usually wants at least 90 days. OMB is the office um, within the White House that really considers those potential costs uh, to the public, cost to industry, cost to the public, um, but then also what are the potential outcomes. So if we require smoke detectors, it's a $45 smoke detector times how many you have to put in your unit. What are the potential health benefits we're going to see with saved lives and reduction in illness and injury? OMB considers all of that. HUD has. Um, economists in PDNR, the Policy Development and Regulations Branch, Research Branch, excuse me, uh, they consider that, they put it in a regulatory impact analysis, that gets published with the proposed rule, it will be published, updated and published with the final rule as well. And OMB considers all of that before they let a regulation be finished. So, bottom line, when are you gonna be showing up? When are you gonna inspect my property under Inspire? When the rule is final and effective, asterisk, there's more to it. We have to finish all our subordinate notices. We have to issue our standards as final, and we have to propose and finalize scoring. We can't inspect you and score you until the scoring notice is final, final. That scoring notice, given the timing of where we are, it could be a little bit after the rule, but we cannot score you until that scoring notice is final, final. There may be compliance dates, as I mentioned. Um, it looks like we'll have, so for the voucher programs and for multifamily housing, that October date will be characterized as a compliance date. After that date, HUD expects you to be compliance, we, compliant. We can come check on you and see if you're compliant with our regulations after the compliance date. You need to still be implementing it after the effective date, but we're not going to necessarily check on you until after the compliance date. We are looking at the public housing regulations and the INSPIRE standards would still be effective in April, uh, but you've heard today that REAC isn't planning to come out and do inspections until at least July. You will still get advance notice of REAC inspections. I think we're currently at 28 days. That's not in the reg because we give HUD flexibility on that um, notification period, uh, but there'll still be at least, we're not looking to change that 28 day notice before an inspection occurs. And you actually probably will hear about it more in advance because we're gonna do that first step where we confirm all of your property information and gather your certificates and documentation. Hey, Tara? Yep. Can I jump in here? Yep. So I will come back to a point I made a little bit ago, which is um, in response to the question about ideal future date, the properties that are most likely to get their first Inspire inspection within 12 months of those compliance dates are the properties that scored below 80. So if you've got any in your portfolio, those are the ones I would focus on. Um, that doesn't mean there won't be some exceptions to that. There might be because our, our, our risk evaluation is iterative and um, you know, conditions are brought to our attention, um, even for some of those properties that scored above an 80. But those are the properties that I would be focused on the first 12 months. So that, that for the public housing portfolio, that period is July 1st of 2023 through June, June 30th of 2024. 
for multifamily, that's 10-1-2023 to 9-30-2024. 20, um, if you've got properties that scored above an 80 or above a 90, it's a likely, very, I'd say pretty, pretty unlikely, unless something has been brought to our attention that we're gonna get to those properties in the first 12 months after Inspire goes live. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it depends on the program and the subsidy, but yeah. The question was, did you ask yes. about senior housing? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> you announced that it would start in October for public housing. That also includes senior properties that are not um, public housing. July for public housing. Yeah, July for public housing. And then, yeah, for senior okay. properties that are not public housing, then that would be 10-1 yeah, or Yeah, so after. We're, we're lumping all the Section 8 programs together for that October date. So if it's the you know multifamily, what is that? Two hundred two, eight eleven. Those those housing programs yeah. would be October. Yeah. Um, and I forgot to mention the CPD programs, the uh, home HTF, um, ESG CPD would also have that October date because they they point over to HQS. Yeah. I think you got these key takeaways. You've heard it a lot. <laughs> Um, just remember, you know, again, we keep saying hoping, hoping for April. That does really depend on OMB review and finishing the regulation. Um, that date could slip if we need more time with OMB, but we are targeting April. Uh, and after April, Ash said it earlier, I'm going to repeat it, a UPCS inspection cannot occur in public housing after the Inspire rule is final and effective, which we are looking at to be April 1. More questions or feedback? You can just give us your opinion, too. <laughs> Do you want to come up to the mic? Thank you. Just point me at my seat if I overdo this. <laughs> um, first thing, nursing home, skilled nursing, currently not allowed. Any comment on that and what? What do you mean by nursing homes? They're not covered. So currently right now in the multifamily side, servicing mortgages, anything that's 50% or more uh, skilled nursing units does not get inspected. They're given a, a waiver. And they, wow. they, we used to inspect them and now they, they aren't inspected. So has that been addressed? I think that goes with the Office of Healthcare, OH, oh, anyway, one of the healthcare. <laughs> yeah, OH. so this is where, you know, there is, there's one number under healthcare <laughs> programs that's covered, but the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an expert in that area. I don't know if, if Angela, would, do you want to help? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Actually, could you wait for we get you, get you a mic? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. With regards to the skilled nursing facilities, they, those are exempt, right? So nothing's going to change there. What's going to be inspected? So be your house, assisted living facilities, your intermediate care facilities, and your B and C boarding care. It's going to be the same business that we do. Okay. Yep. Good yeah. And then sometimes you do have a hybrid because that's what you were saying. In some units, you might have. Um, the house may have 60 percent, and your SNS may have 40. The house will get um, inspected at the same time. And, so, and I want to add to that, we are fully aware that there are special conditions in those properties, like locked windows and doors and codes on elevators. Uh, and we, we really do want to get it right and do better there. Okay. Um, the other thing is, there's always been a, an ongoing issue with the definition of a building. Um, has, I, I don't know if that will get covered this afternoon, more likely, but I mean, we've had people take out blueprints and, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, is that ice? Yeah. We want to get it right once and not revisit it. If it, because if it doesn't change, there's no reason to revisit it every time we come out and inspect. Yeah. Um, you know, we've heard about, uh, I'm going to let Kevin, I don't want to steal his thunder, uh, but he'll talk about how he had to walk an entire property um, and verify every single building. Mm -hmm. We want to get away from doing that every single time we go out, unless there is some change we need to know about. Um, but in terms of building definitions, that might be something I need Kevin or Cliff to talk more if I didn't answer your question. Well, and I, and I can jump in here Thanks. too, because, um, and we will talk about this this afternoon when we get to scoring, but we're revising or proposing to revise our sampling methodology, which will make buildings um, less important um, in terms of the sampling methodology. That should minimize the need for this day of inspection, walking the property, you know, getting into debates about whether it's a, a shared roof line or two right. roof lines. Um, right. We know that causes lots of um, heartburn for folks. All right. Uh, just two more quick ones. 
Uh, how will self-inspections be QA'd? I mean, if, how is a property going to be able to train their, their staff to do what a REAC inspector is trained to do over weeks of training? We haven't put anything, we're not proposing to put anything in the regulations about QAing self-inspections. Um, that doesn't mean we're not reading them and giving feedback, but we haven't put anything, we didn't propose anything in the regulations that would say, if you don't meet our standards, we're rejecting it. Um, we'll define more in the administrative notice about that process, but you know we don't expect uh, all housing authority staff to necessarily be experts in the standards, but we do still want to get quality information in. Okay. Um, and, and especially because, and I'll just add to that, like in the multifamily housing world, those self-inspections are part of follow-up for low scores. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, I don't want to speak for their program, but I know they do care um, if, if what's coming in on the self-inspections is looking at you know, those deficiencies and getting back over a 60. All right. And last one. So currently, uh, public housing and multifamily, the auction area, is under the 28-day notice. Servicing mortgagee in the, in the multifamily side has never gone to that. They've always been a mutually agreeable date within 90 days of their inspection window. Is that changing to absolute everybody's going to be doing 28 days or is the same pro protocol going to be used? So first I'll say there's nothing in the regulation about that and the notices and the notification time frame um, that would be in the notices, but we haven't discussed changes. Um, so I'm not aware of a need to change that. We're not proposing to change that at this time. Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. So again, I'm Larry Sisson. I'm with Multifamily Housing. Um, and currently, we are not self-inspecting. Um, so with this, with Inspire, I've heard uh, a little bit of different options. Are we going to be submitting our self-inspections, or will those be kept at our property? So that would be in the final rule. I can't give you the, the absolute answer. Um, but I'll say we, we greatly considered not adding new burden to to um, properties participating in our program. So we originally tied that self-inspection to a risk assessment in the two to five year. Um, once we uh, you know, looked at moving back to the, th or keeping three, two, one, the necessity of collecting self-inspections became less necessary. Um, in the multifamily world, I think they're only collecting them if your property scores under 60. Um, so we considered that, and are we going to make a radical change, or are we going to consider what's already being done and if that's adequate for housing? Um, okay. So I can't give you the real answer, but I'll just know that we, we heard those comments, we considered what existed, and we considered what changes we weren't actually going to make uh, and what the final answer will be. Okay, great. And then um, those of us that are in the demo program that have, have just gone through this huge wave of inspections, um, now when they become live, yep. when, would we, when would the demo program inspections expect a live inspection? Um, so not before, well, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so look for a notice coming about the Inspire demonstration um, that's gonna look at uh, when your next score of record will be um, because there's some considerations on the multifamily side that they, um, you know, they, it's been a while since they've had scores of record. Uh, so that will be in an inspired demo notice. I didn't mention that at all today, but those are also in the Federal Register. Um, look for that. That will have your answer. Um, but what I will tell you is you can't be scored under Inspire until the Inspire scoring notice is proposed and final. Gotcha. So you've got a window of time before you can um, even think about Inspire scores. Okay. And then my last question is, uh, and it may be better on the scoring um, session, but the demo, uh, I, I can't tell if I'm gonna like your scoring or not until I actually get scores, <laughs> okay? And I know. so, is there an ability to take those demo program and uh, put the scoring model on it to see what the demo would actually do? Is that? Do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, Larry, the uh, plan is for us, once we finalize the scoring methodology, which should be, um, well, hopefully this, like the spring, um, we would then retroactively apply the scores to the demo properties. We may be, may be able to provide some preliminary information before the methodology is um, finalized to say, based on what we're proposing, this is what the scores would look like for the demo properties. But um, it is um, our plan for anybody that participated in the demo, regardless of whether your demo inspection was all the way back in October of 2021 when we started the demo um, officially, um, in terms of actually inspecting properties or whether you're 
your, your demo inspection hasn't happened yet and it may still happen between now and 10-1, we will issue your scores for any of the properties that partici participated in the demo. Good morning. Um, I'm David Samloff. I'm from the uh, Greenville, South Carolina Housing Authority. Um, we are, uh, we do have some public housing left um, up until next week and we've converted all of ours on a voluntary conversion. They're going to PBV, not RAD. Um, and then we have a, a robust voucher program. A couple of questions. On the, uh, in the rules, uh, I noticed that 983 is going to be modified. Is the sampling going to be changed under that? Uh, so thank you for your question. I didn't talk at all about PBV. I really appreciate you bringing that up, and sorry I missed that. It's okay. um, yes, 983 is changing, but we're not changing the sampling or the frequency regs for when inspections need to occur. All of those are going to stay unless they change under HOTMA in the future. Inspire is not. Inspire is only changing the inspection standards for PBV. Okay, and on HCV and and for it and for HCV. an agent and and for an agency like ours, um, we have have to totally modify our administrative plans to implement these new regulations, remove all the HQS and things yep. like that. Um, the other question I have, and throw another wrinkle into it, is uh, we're an MTW agency. We just became one. And so our plan um, that's been approved by HUD doesn't include all of those regulations that are under um, I see. Yeah. PBV and um, under the voucher program. Anything? Inspire did not propose to change anything related to the MTW program. Okay. Um, only the inspection standards for HCV and PBV. Okay. Um, and then yeah, everything else was largely carried over from those programs. Okay, so the proposals that we have to, to HUD in our MTW program will just carry through? I believe so, but you know, check with your moving to work representative. <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. not an expert on the program, and no, I know no, there's that's, nuance. that's fine. That's yeah. Fine. yeah. Well, uh, but we didn't propose anything. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add, we've been working with the MTW office to make sure that um, nothing we're doing under Inspire, you know, significantly alters or changes the way that um, the MTW agreements between HUD and the individual agencies um, work or are affected. Um, you know, the MTW agencies get, you know, depending on which programs they're operating, they, they they get REAC inspections if they're operating public housing. Um, that will continue to be the case, but the standards will be updated. Um, and then I'll just kind of reiterate what Tara said on the voucher side. So um, it, nothing in the Inspire reg changes the, the frequency or I would say the manner in which inspections are conducted for HCV and PBV properties other than updating the standard. Okay, so we're still able to make changes to those requirements. So, for example, PBVs two years, um, our proposal is and approved that we don't have to do them, but every three years. If that's what moving to work approved. So yeah. that's yeah. going to override. Yeah, I don't, yes. I don't, I'm not aware of any changes coming okay. down that. But yeah. And congratulations on your conversion and getting awarded MTW. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, it's been interesting. It's been a voluntary conversion. We were the first ones, I guess, in the country. We've converted our final 155 to project-based and vouchers, not, not a RAD program. So we're excited. We're sort of in the throes of it right now. Yeah. So Great. it's exciting. Thanks. Very exciting. Hello, Georgie Banna from Ballard Spar. <laughs> Hi, guys. Uh, question on the self-inspections and just the timing of the self-inspections, especially with the effective dates mm -hmm. and the compliance dates mm -hmm. of the rule, and then also in relationship to when do the self-inspections have to be done in relationship to the actual inspections, the actual on-site inspections. So the proposed rule said 100% of units annually. Um, the final rule, um, you know, we're expecting would not look exactly like the proposed rule. And then the details would be in the administrative notice. Um, we know that it will take time for housing authorities um, and, and multifamily owners to take all the training, learn the INSPIRE standards. Um, and so we're considering, you know, maybe an additional year uh, it's not set in stone. Uh, we're still, you know, we'll consider feedback on that because we can't expect everybody to be ready on day one, but it's in the regulations and it would be effective. Um, it's just, you know, what you have to send to HUD, when you have to send it, all of that would be in the administrative notice. That potentially there's a disconnect then between the self-inspection and the actual inspection, especially if they're... Yeah, and we, we are considering that as well um, because in the proposed rule we had, you know, if you score under 60, you have to go back and... It, 
for all the deficiencies, you have to go back and look at every other unit for that deficiency. Um, and I, there might have even been something about you have to do a self-inspection after REACT leaves. And we considered that that would be multiple events of doing the same thing. Um, and so we're looking at where we can offer flexibility yeah. that this would count for that. We would do that. Because we don't want you to do an annual inspection three times in a year. Thank you. Yeah, I will, I will further add, and we've been asked, um, Georgie, at other sessions, you know, do I have to conduct, if I, do I have to conduct all my self-inspections like a certain month a year, right? And we, we as Tara said, want to offer flexibility because we know that there's staffing concerns, there's other issues out there, and we've heard from a number of you that have said, if I could spread my self-inspections out, that would be preferable, right? Um, what's important to us is that the self-inspection occurs annually, um, not that they have to be necessarily lumped together uh, based on a certain operational time frame or constraint. And if it makes sense to tie it to the um, re-examination, um, do it then. And you could get that unit then. Yeah. So my friend brought up the comment about the admin plans. And um, my name's Sue Lynn Ludford. I'm, I, I oversee a rural housing effort. So. Considering the fact that um, many of us have to contract out those revisions for our admin plans, and because this is something that's going to be pretty uh, prescribed as far as what we need to do, will there be the opportunity uh, provided to us to see some model changes mm. to admin plans? Because I think Otherwise, we're going to have to contract outside entities that do this when we're small organizations mm -hmm. and we do not have staff on board that, per se, that's their area of expertise. Um, that's an excellent suggestion that we hadn't yet considered. You're right. Um, so we will work with our friends in the Office of Voucher Programs on that. Um, that might be something that we can do through technical assistance funding, um, that we can make extra help available to housing authorities on those changes. And if you're small and rural, you're also going to have changes around, you know, CMAP scoring and, and FAS. Yeah, so thanks for that reminder. Um, we recently purchased a property that uh, scored very low. Um, is 90% public housing, 10% PBV. Mm -hmm. um, we know that we need the time and funding in order to bring the property to what it needs to be. How would this affect the Inspire inspection if, if we know that we need the time to get it ready? Put your time and money in your units first. Um, you're going to see today in Cliff's presentation about some things that are coming that, you know, there's some big ticket items like fire doors that we know you, it may take some time to repair or replace. Um, think about, you know, supply chain issues. Can you get the materials you need to make those changes? The sooner you start on that, the better, with focus on the units um, versus the exterior and the site. Uh, it's units, then inside common areas, hallways, laundry, and then the site. Um, I would put curb appeal last, focus on the units. So we will be, still be scored, although we just purchased the property. We have to be ready yeah. between now and... So have you had the, a REACT inspection yet? They had it last year. They had different owner... Um, owner and management company, and it was like 60 some, uh, okay. scored pretty bad, so we just yeah. closed the property a, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. oh okay. so. It's a, it's a 250 uh, unit property. Yeah, I, I would just say, and, and I think this is an important point, I mean, we, we do use the ideal future date, and uh, we'll be planning on using something similar to that moving forward. But REAC has always retained the operational flexibility, working with our program office partners to postpone certain inspections or offer flexibility where that makes sense. Um, that's not uncommon when you're talking about repositioning or in the uh, very common, another scenario is disasters, right? If there's been a hurricane, um, inspections were scheduled. Uh, we don't wanna send inspectors out right after a natural disaster. So um, I, I would just say if you're in a situation where in working with your program office uh, contacts um, in public housing or multifamily where you believe um, that you do need some operational flexibility, um, the best, the best uh, person to get in contact with is your local field office representative that you work with then we will be communicating with them when there's an upcoming inspection. And sometimes we collectively agree that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. I'll add that I think we had more flexibility on the multifamily side than we did on the public housing side, but a reminder that we're consolidating regulations. Um, and there were some things that we picked up from multifamily 
and vice versa. Great, thanks a lot. Hi, um, so I have another question related to scattered sites. Mm -hmm. um, so um, previously when our uh, scattered sites have gone through REAC, um, some of the units that have been selected were units that have been previously identified and in some cases actually submitted to HUD for um, approval for disposal. Um, and however, these units have still gotten inspected and um, have we have received um, very low scores. Um, because of these units, we're not we we were not intending to reoccupy these units. So they were vacant. and yes. they were inspected anyway. Yes. Okay. Um, and so I'm just wondering is is there a, a mechanism for addressing that in in the um, in the the unit sampling for Inspire or is because um, previously we had we would just um, get the results back and file an appeal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if there's a, if there's a more proactive strategy yes. for that. <laughs> yes, and thanks for highlighting this. This is a big one that, you know, if we get it right up front, then we don't all have to go through the appeal process. Mm -hmm. So first it's, you know, if you've submitted in PIC for demo dispo and it's clearly vacant, the unit won't be in, wouldn't be inspected under Inspire because uh, we're looking at, we're considering occupied units and the experience of residents in those occupied units. That's what we care about. So if it's vacant demo dispo, it's in PIC, we're going to look at PIC as the system of record, and we're going to get that right up front. But even if we still miss it and something happens when they're in the field, that would be a basis for a technical review. Yeah. So thanks. And, and I would just say to stress that we would draw the sample after that confirmatory process, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times today the sample gets drawn before some of that uh, validation is done. Um, under the new processes, it will be more proactive. Validation will be done first, then the sample will be drawn. And then we're going to wrap up for lunch. I can hear some grumbly tummies. Uh, so let's, we're going to take, I think, an hour. Marcel, do you want to do your spiel? <laughs> okay. Thank you for all these great questions. I really appreciate it. Okay. Wow. Good afternoon, everybody. I wish I had this kind of... Like when I speak at my house, it stays as noisy as it was. So it was great to have this kind of, maybe I should just get a microphone in my house. Maybe that'll, that'll do it. So thank you so much for coming back. That means you guys enjoyed the morning, right? Round of applause if you guys enjoyed the morning. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. A lot of work went into this. Um, as you heard from Ash and Tara, there's a lot of things that we're, we're thinking through and planning. And a lot of it comes into, into place and executed in the standards. And so I get the pleasure to introduce um, the guy behind the scenes. Uh, but before I do, there's, there's something I wanted to share with you all. Uh, throughout my career, I actually delivered uh, data standards uh, both in the US and internationally. So I, I get the, the gravitas of standards. Standards are the heart and soul of this program. They are. So, we got to get it right. And it takes a certain personality, a certain style, a certain way of thinking, and a certain approach to really get this thing together. You got to find someone who understands the material, not just by looking at what's in front of them, but longitudinally. What is the long-term effect of these things? What is the short-term effect? And find the balance. Work with stakeholders. Understand what these things really mean. And that in, in a short way, summarizes a lot of what Cliff has been able to do for this program. So it is my pleasure to introduce Cliff Cornegay. Cliff? Yay! Thank you, Marcel. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, prior to this, I had previously worked uh, as a consultant to REAC in their, uh, the first round of developing uh, the Inspire standards was asked to come on board to help permanently do that uh, and, and accepted that position. Prior to that, I worked in the inspection industry, multiple inspection industries, uh, doing work for DOD, Department of State, uh, commercial inspections, residential inspections, energy audits, uh, environmental assessments, lots of different things. Uh, so I've done that for approximately 15 years or more. Uh, it's very familiar with the inspection industry, inspection standards, uh, and the different ways that different groups approach that. Uh, so what I'm planning to do today, I think, is I think a lot of you have probably read the standards, uh, have had some exposure to the standards, 
going to try and basically put these together in a structured way to help think about them. Uh, and if you have questions at the end, obviously, you want to be sure to answer those. Is this? There we go. Oh. So through this session, we're going to try and basically help explain what the key focus areas are. For Inspire, there's a lot of things that obviously change from UPCS to Inspire. I want to make sure that you fully understand what it is we're focusing on. It is health and safety. It is unit focused, unit based. So to make sure that that gets, you know, that's a message you take home this afternoon. Uh, if there's anything about the standard you take home, it's health and safety unit focused. Uh, there is a new framework. It's very different than UPCS and HQS. Uh, want to make sure that you think about that framework when you when you're listening to this session when you leave today. Uh, you know we've done this for 20 plus years, and I think a lot of people, you know, it takes time to learn something, especially if it's a new framework. Uh, it's almost like learning a new language. Uh, you know that standards are different, the deficiencies are different, the way that you'll interact with our IT systems are different. Uh, the way that we've written things for our protocols are different. All those things have changed massively, and in that way, you'll have to take some time and you know, wrap your mind around it and think about how you approach this differently. Uh, and you know, to someone's question earlier, a lot of that goes to things like, you know, we're no longer going to use the comp bulletin. In fact, that comp bulletin doesn't apply to Inspire, never applied to Inspire. I uh, want to make sure things like that are clear. So. Uh, we will have that protocol guy that Ash mentioned, but you know things like that are different. Uh, so to make sure that those are things that you walk away with a full understanding. Uh, we have new deficiency rationales, new categories. We'll go over what we consider to be like key standards. Those are things that are new, things that have popped up during the demo, things we want to make sure that you walk out of here with a full understanding of what we're trying to do. Uh, and then talk a little bit about how we're displaying the standards on the website. <clears throat> so what's the same? Our, you know, we obviously are making a big change. Some things are the same. We're very close to being the same. Uh, we have 40 standards that are mostly unchanged. Uh, we still have the life-threatening health and safety. A lot of people are familiar with it, exigent health and safety. Uh, we're still, you know, UPCS did have health and safety. It did have function and operability. Uh, it did have condition and appearance. It was just structured and labeled in a different way. So some of the themes that are in UPCS are carried forward into Inspire. Uh, we have given them some different labels and structured them differently within the deficiency determinations. What's changing? So uh, big change here, and this carries over into scoring, which we'll talk about later. Five inspectable areas, so we reduced that from five to three. Uh, unit common areas, building systems, site, building exterior, you know, that's not going to exist anymore. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, there are a lot of deficiencies under UPCS that were difficult to enforce in a in a uh, objective way, and sometimes that created some administrative issues. Uh, there's some other things that weren't what we'd consider critical health and safety items. Uh, those are no longer present. Uh, there was a shift away from condition and appearance to health and safety. So make sure, again, when you walk out of here, health and safety unit focused. What's new? Three areas. We have some very stringent new standards and deficiencies. You know, I'll talk about these later. These have been brought up before. GFCI, call for aid, uh, mold, infestation, structural. Uh, enhancements to things that uh, we were inspecting under UPCS. So it's smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, fire doors, dryer exhaust, guardrails, handrails. Uh, so we did inspect most of those you know, in a similar way. We've had some enhancements under Inspire. Uh, we have revised health and safety classifications uh, and time frames. So where there are things that were covered into UPCS that their severity may have been elevated under Inspire, uh, a lot of that was based on our new understanding of building science, health and, health and safety conditions in the buildings. Uh, because of that, when we actually do write the standards, I'll talk about this later, we have rationales underneath those to explain why we consider these to have you know, life-threatening or uh, severe. So health and safety. Uh, you know, most everything that we're doing is health and safety. Inspire, not everything, but the majority of it. Uh, we have two other categories, function operability, condition and appearance. Uh, Inspire is, you know, vast majority of Inspire deficiencies are health and safety. Uh, and again, you know, we have the function operability because we care about those and the condition appearance because if they are allowed to persist at some period of time, you know, they could turn into a health and safety condition. So that's one of the reasons we are looking at uh, some of the other function operability and condition appearance issues. 
Uh, so those conditions that we think you know, largely could turn into something related to health and safety later, you know, most of those conditions under health function and operability and condition and appearance have some relationship to health and safety uh, over time. Uh, they are a smaller amount, but they are still part of INSPIRE. Uh, these are the determinations, I think, that if you've read the INSPIRE material, you've been to a Get Ready session, been to a webinar you've become familiar with, the titles have changed over time. Uh, you know, we're currently life-threatening, severe non-life-threatening, that may change. We're having a discussion about, about that moderate and low. Uh, low, we had initially called advisory. We're currently considering, you know, keeping it as a low, as a low-risk indicator. Advisory had some potential meaning issues because some other offices use that term. Uh, so it's likely to end up in the, being titled low. Uh, these, I think, are self-explanatory. We wrote the definitions for these determinations to in a way that we hope that they were self-explanatory. Uh, you know, obviously life-threatening, That I think that makes sense to everyone. Severe, not something that going, is going to kill you, but could obviously have some very negative or adverse health impact. Adverse health impact. You know, those are things like fire doors. Uh, moderate, that's something that uh, maybe down the road at some point could lead to an adverse health, uh, health condition or impact. Uh, and then low, which are not critical, but those are things that we do care about. And again, they may have some if they're allowed to continue over time, may end up leading to one of these moderate, severe, or even potentially life-threatening. Inspectable areas. We did this to try and simplify it. It's part of what we wrote in the Inspire proposed rule. We're gonna try and make this uh, a simplified system, a simplified set of inspection protocols. Uh, so we reduced the inspectable area definitions to unit inside and outside. In the standards notice that we'll have coming out soon, and also in the final rule, we'll have very specific definitions about those areas. Those will be reflected in the standards themselves as well. Uh, you know, if there are questions about what we're intending to inspect in those areas, uh, we'll have definitions in the final rule. Uh, the standards themselves will also include information below the deficiencies where that will be clear, and I'll talk more about that later. Unit, clearly I think everyone knows what a unit is. Inside, those you know, frequently referred to as a common area. Uh, workout rooms, exercise rooms, fitness centers, uh, it could be a laundry room, it could be the foyer, it could be the hallway, uh, it could also be just a community room, a community kitchen, those sort of areas. And then the outside location, which I think is mostly self-explanatory, exterior of the building, things that were typically called site. Uh, you know, those are things like sidewalks, parking lots, retaining walls, uh, and it could be inspectable items. Uh, you know, I think there's some, uh, some questions I think have come up in the past, are we inspecting playgrounds? Yes. Uh, but it's written to the standards in a different way, so if there's a condition present uh, that falls under one of the other standards, you would inspect that playground uh, based on those conditions that are present. Examples here of some health and safety defects, obviously a flu connector that's disconnected from a water heater, something we're very concerned about because of the carbon monoxide risk. Uh, a missing filler on an electrical panel uh, where the bus bar underneath that's exposed. That's something we're obviously concerned about as a health and safety defect. Uh, and then a smoke alarm that's missing. Uh, obviously, you know, if that's missing, we're considering that very serious. I uh, wanna make sure that uh, that gets replaced as soon as it can possibly get replaced. And I'll talk more in detail about the uh, smoke alarm standard later. Uh, so we informally had sort of noticed that when we were writing the standards, uh, there's some focus areas that are really critical, I think, to pay attention to. Uh, fire safety, water safety, mold and moisture, carbon monoxide, infestation, lead-based paint, uh, structural and habitability. Habitability is related to the affirmative requirements that were in the proposed rule and that will be finalized in our final rule that gets published soon. Fire safety, so we are implementing NFP 72. Uh, within INSPIRE, we specifically use 2019 NFP 72 for the location requirements for the, car, for the smoke alarms. Uh, I'll go in greater detail about that. Minimum temperature requirement, permanent heating source requirement, prohibition of unvented fuel burning space heaters. Uh, I know there may have been some of those in units that were supposed to be there. Uh, we're gonna pay very close attention to those during our inspection, make sure we don't have those present in the units. Um, new fire sprinkler defects, uh, and I'll go in greater detail about that as well. GFCIs, AFCIs, uh, dryer exhaust, electrical outlets. Um, and then one that's really important, that's fire doors. Um, 
that's important, and I'll explain why here shortly. But I'll start with NFPA 72. So that's the standard that most state and local jurisdictions use for the placement of smoke alarms. Uh, when we looked across the country in terms of what the state and local jurisdictions were using, it's very clear NFPA 72 is the preeminent standard that most people are using. Uh, because of that, that's, that's one of the reasons we use that standard for smoke alarms. We want to make sure we have one working smoke alarm on every level of the property, outside each sleeping area in the proper or in the unit, uh, and then installed inside each sleeping room. Uh, some of this we understand is not clear because there's some phrases here, like outside the sleeping area, sleeping room, bedroom, those sort of things. Uh, very soon we will actually come out with some guidance on what that means, uh, which frankly we're just going to use the NFPA 72 guidance. Uh, there's been some questions about that. Specifically, what's a sleeping area? Uh, can you have more than one sleeping area? Yes, you can actually have more than one sleeping area because you can have, a, let's say, for example, a unit that has uh, bedrooms on two different sides of the unit. So maybe two hallways. Those hallways would be uh, two separate sleeping areas. So when you look at NFPA 72, that's the way that they, they describe it. Uh, I think what we recognize is not everyone wants to dig into NFPA 72. So going on that website can be complex, very difficult to get through the table of contents, which part of that to actually look through. So in the near future, we're going to have some guidance that actually help you make sense of NFPA 72. Uh, that's a 24-hour correction. I um, want to make sure everyone understands that. Another important thing that's just happened within the, just passed a new omnibus, omnibus Congress passed one. Within that uh, omnibus, there is a new statutory requirement. Uh, on top of knowing what INSPIRE is about, the other thing we want to make sure you're aware of is this new smoke alarm requirement. Uh, so within two years, all the smoke alarms that we will be inspecting, they will need to be sealed smoke alarms of 10-year batteries. Uh, Congress passed that law in December with the omnibus. Uh, so we are going to continue to inspect basically to the INSPIRE standard up until that statutory date, uh, which will be December 20, I think it's 22nd, uh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, 22nd or 27th. Uh, that date in two years will be the statutory requirement date. So I know there's, uh, that's not something a lot of people are aware of. Uh, when we found out that was going to happen, uh, we've had some conversations over the past couple weeks. I uh, just want to make sure that people understand that in two years, all of these smoke alarms will have to be sealed smoke alarms with 10-year batteries. So we've always looked at heating systems as part of HQS and Inspire. Uh, we had a PIH notice actually as part of the HOTMA statute that came out a few years ago. Uh, we had a PIH notice to actually set a minimum temperature standard of 68 degrees. Uh, we're going to carry that over where it's required across all the programs. Initially, we just had that uh, requirement for public housing. Since we're aligning standards, as we've talked about earlier, that is going to be extended to the other programs that are covered by INSPIRE as well. Uh, we're still thinking about the best way to approach that from scoring and uh, from a implementation of or practical way during the inspection protocols, because uh, we know that the tenants sometimes change the temperature. Uh, we also know that you know properties, even if the property owner controls it, there may be times that for various reasons it may be set differently. Um, and we had some questions about that in the proposed standards notice. So we're still looking at this to think about the best way to do this from a practical perspective. Um, and we set gradient levels, which means we set a 68 degree and then a 64 degree. So really, you know, the reasoning behind that, just I think to make people clear, is we know that below 68 degrees, there is a, you know, there's a period where elderly disabled people actually have more difficulty regulating their body temperature. Below 64, everyone has a difficulty regulating their body temperature. So that's why there's two gradients there. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you know, we are going to look at this closely. Part of the standards notice and then also part of the standard itself, uh, we wrote that we're going to actually do this with a handheld ambient temperature thermometer. So we're going to expect that our inspectors go out and hold an ambient temperature thermometer. It's going to follow the same protocol that exists within the PIH notice, which is holding it you know, approximately in the middle of the room. There's a very specific dimensional requirement for that. I think it's three feet off the wall, I think maybe two feet off the floor. Uh, and we're going to prescribe the specific rooms where that's required. The, back up here. We did have this requirement about, or we talked about this requirement in the proposed rule about unvented space heaters. 
that already existed, I believe, within HQS. Uh, it's something we're carrying forward across all the programs. Uh, and just to make this clear, this is just unvented fuel burning space heaters. Uh, you know, we're fine with electric space heaters. We're fine with fuel burning space heaters as long as they're vented. Uh, we have some concerns about unvented fuel burning space heaters. Um, there's some, some risk associated with those, specifically carbon dioxide and fire risk. Uh, that's why we've taken that position in the proposed standards notice. We want to make sure um, it's clear when the final standards notice comes out uh, and the final rule that uh, everyone understands what we're doing there. Um, so this is new, fire doors. Uh, obviously, there's been some events over the past few years. We know that fire doors are important. Uh, under UPCS, we handled these very differently. It was largely because we treated doors all the same uh, under UPCS uh, and, and also similarly in HQS. We know that the fire doors perform a different function than just regular doors. Uh, and because of that, we need to focus on those really closely, make sure they're working properly. You know, what we're generally looking for there, things make sure they're not propped open, make sure they're not damaged, and make sure that they're self-closing and fully closing when they self-close. Uh, we also want to make sure there's no modifications to those fire doors. Uh, we've talked a lot with life safety, fire safety professionals about these doors. Uh, we closely align with the NFPA standards for that. Uh, so this is an industry standard that if your state or local jurisdiction is actually already inspecting fire doors, we're not doing something that's, that's different than what your state and local government's already doing. And then generally hey, Cliff, speaking. I'm gonna jump I'm gonna jump in here for one quick second and just say to folks, um, you know, a little more than a year ago, right, there there were some pretty tragic, extremely tragic fires um, in the Bronx um, at a property that had a number of um, vouchers associated with it, and then um, at the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And so um, there is an emphasis, right, on improving our fire safety um, under the new INSPIRE standards. And, and fire doors featured prominently um, in the Bronx fire. Um, they were not functioning properly. Um, and in fact, a number of the victims died of smoke inhalation. And, and ideally, uh, you know, possibly, right, working fire doors could have prevented uh, some loss of life there. So um, I'd also add here on fire doors is that this is an area, and we'll go over the list of the top 10 uh, defects by category that we're seeing in the Inspire demo that this is one of the new standards we're seeing a lot of deficiencies with under the demo. So um, in thinking about preparing right for your upcoming inspections, whether uh, they're public housing and could begin as early as July 1st, or um, multifamily, which will begin, and vouchers, which will begin on 10-1, and the other CPD programs that Tara talked about. Um, we know there's lead time for supplies uh, and equipment. Um, I would start checking those fire doors now, especially, so. You know, just follow up. They are popping up in the demo, and any small, I think what some people would call even small damage or uh, what they think is a minimal defect has an effect on that door. Uh, even drilling a hole in it has an effect on the door. Uh, we have come across some properties that, for example, have drilled holes in their fire doors that are unit entry doors. Um, that affects the structural integrity of that door. Uh, that fire door was never intended to actually have a field modification. These are some of the types of defects that are popping up. Because you know, when you drill a hole in it, it affects the structural integrity, and if a fire were to occur, the door does warp. And when it does warp, it allows the smoke and the fire to potentially enter the unit or even a stairwell um, you know, through those openings, and that's, that, that's why we were treating those so seriously. And we've actually, I think, been surprised at the number of fire doors we've seen propped open. Um, you know, we talked to fire safety experts about this. Uh, actually, one of the most important things you can do is make sure that a fire door is not propped open. Uh, and we are seeing that frequently. Um, and that's, you know, it, it, it seems like, you know, you hope you never have a fire in your property. If you do and a stairwell door is propped open, uh, it suddenly creates a fire or smoke problem for the entire building instead of just that floor. Uh, so that's why we're focusing on those so closely. So in writing the standards, generally, we're trying to write deficiencies that are objective. Not, uh, I think there's, you know, there, there were some criticisms that previous standards may have been subjective in some ways. We wrote the fire sprinkler standard. We've actually, it, it is going to be different than the standard you've read in 2.2. Uh, we, during the last three months, 
NFPA came out with very prescriptive standards for inspecting fire sprinkler heads. Um, and I think actually for the better. Uh, we were in Providence, Rhode Island, had a session. Uh, we heard that uh, properties were being cited for a few paint specs on a sprinkler head. Uh, NFPA is actually taking a different position on that than they have in the past. And that's based on lab research where they can show that uh, a few paint specs, even actually a large number of paint specs, actually do not have that much of an effect on the uh, ability of the sprinkler head to deploy. So I want to make sure that you read that standard when it comes out for the final set of standards. Uh, we talk specifically to the labs that do that research and actually put these sprinkler heads in an oven, create a fire, uh, and they've done this over the past year. And because of that, the NFPA standard for inspecting sprinkler heads have changed. Uh, there is something I'm really call attention to, which is the sprinkler head in the spray area. Uh, there's some confusion on that. Uh, we know that you live in some buildings where they may have closets that are very narrow. You know, so that sprinkler head spray area isn't meant to apply to that to a very narrow closet. You don't have to rebuild that closet. Or if you're in a property where the units have bulkheads or some sort of part of the built environment that you know, basically protrudes out, um, and that's part of the original construction, we know that you went under, you know, underwent some sort of plan review, some sort of examination by a fire safety, life safety professional when that building was built. We don't intend for that to be covered. What we're really looking at, we want to make sure that the we don't have things like furniture in the spray area, personal effects in that closet. That's what we're trying to get out of here. Just to go over really quickly the electrical things that we're looking at here. There's been, I think, some questions and confusion about that in the past. So for the GFCIs, you know, we limited those to what we consider to be the most risk or the highest risk areas. So we're looking at kitchen, bathrooms, uh, laundry areas, outside areas. Uh, we just want you to push the test button or use a tester. We had a question about that in the standards notice. Uh, it's fine if you use a GFCI tester. Uh, for AFCIs, we don't want you to install them where they weren't present in the past. We just want to make sure that's clear. Where you have them installed, we want to make sure those work. Uh, the reason we want to make sure those work is because they're, they're preventing fires. AFCI breakers came about roughly 20 plus years ago because they're going to substantially reduce the number of electrical fires. Uh, so where they're present, we want to make sure they work, but we're not requiring you to go in and replace breakers that are not AFCI protected. Uh, we're still discussing how best to address that if we come into a unit or an area where if we test it, it turns everything off and that creates some sort of issue. You know, it could be you have some health care equipment or something else connected to it. We know that's potentially an issue. We want to figure out a way that we can work with properties, make sure we can test those, or we can have some confidence that they're working, so we want to think about how we do that. We want to make sure all properties are wired correctly. Uh, we've had some demonstrations where we've done that in the past. Uh, that's that's you know, new, new for, uh, wasn't in UPCS, so it's new. In that regard, we're just checking for reverse polarity, open grounds, uh, those sort of issues. We want to make sure that those are wired properly. Uh, related to that are the grounded outlets, and I just want to make this make sure this is clear. We're not telling you you have to ground every outlet. So if you do have a grounded, an ungrounded outlet, we would not cite that as a deficiency if it has a GFCI breaker or a GFCI outlet on that circuit. Uh, there may be some confusion about that, uh, and I want to make sure everybody understands that. We're not telling you to go out and ground every outlet. Uh, if they're grounded, that's great. If they're not grounded, we just want them GFCI protected. So water safety. In the standards notice, we wrote out water safety. The way we phrased it may have been confusing, just to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, this is, these aren't deficiencies, so we're not going to actually deduct points for these. What we're essentially doing is collecting information about what we see when we're out performing an inspection. Uh, so if your local water utility has an outage or some sort of water warning related on the water quality or an outage in general, you know, we're going to collect that information. We're going to note that. Uh, we're not running a lead in water test, just to be clear. I think there's some confusion about that, that we're going to actually collect water samples. We're not doing that. We're just going to have the inspectors look at your lead, at your service lines coming in. We're going to note if they're lead or not. That's, that's basically what we're doing. Uh, we know that we could improve our awareness of lead water lines, and we just want to, want to do that while we're there. This is a very easy way for us to do that. Cliff? Yes. Um, I'll add a little bit to this. So earlier I had talked about the two touch points in advance of the inspection. Um, we'll ask those questions then. Uh, we'll ask who's your public water supply, 
uh, municipality, usually they have a name. Um, we're asking that because actually there isn't a comprehensive map of our housing and the public water supply service systems. It doesn't exist, but where we can collect that information, we'd like to collect it. If you don't know it the first time we ask, you know, we'll ask again. Hopefully we can collect that information and get it accurate over time so that we know which water municipal supplies are servicing which housing authorities and properties. Um, we'll also ask about whether there's any active water alert. So there could be a boil water advisory. There could be a lead and water advisory. These may just be one point in time. We're just going to ask you at that point of when we're doing the inspection um, whether there's an active water alert. You should know. Um, if you don't know there's one, there probably isn't one, and that's because it's required for the public water supply to notify you when there is a water safety issue. They notify all their customers. They're going to put it in local media. They're going to put it in the newspapers, their Facebook site. You should know if there is a water advisory in your area. Um, the reason we're collecting this information is because, as I said earlier, you know we had two different standards. We had a voucher standard for water free from contamination, and then we had a public housing and multifamily housing just be potable. Um, under INSPIRE, we're going to say a requirement for safe water. And what we, we need, it, when there is a water event, say like in Flint or Jackson, we had one in Newark, um, we want to be able to act quickly to help our housing authorities and help our owners with what to do um, to make sure you're still in compliance with what will be the INSPIRE standards. What that means is we want to keep residents in their homes, but we want to make sure they have access to safe drinking water. So that could be, you know, we're going to follow what EPA or your health department says. It could be putting a filter on the kitchen and bathroom faucets. It could be providing a filter pitcher. Whatever they're telling you to do, it could also be providing bottled water. And you know, here's where you go get it. Wherever that, it, whatever applies to that event, we're going to work with you um, to make sure the right guidance is going out to the residents and the housing authority and the owners so that we can comply. These are going to be very infrequent events. I don't want to panic everybody that we're going to be meddling in all your water business. Um, but we want to be prepared for when this does happen to make sure that we can keep families in their homes with safe water. Um, and on the lead service lines, we're going to be writing more guidance about that. Um, you know, it's not a definitive test. We're not taking chunks out of your pipe or putting an XRF gun to the service lines. Um, but there is a way to look at it. EPA has written some guidance on this to look at it to see if it is a lead service line. I think there's what, like a copper penny test? Yeah, so I think because of the type of metal, you know, we could use a magnet, you can do a visual yeah. observation of the material. It's very easy, they've been doing this for decades, and I think it's something that we could fairly easily do. This again is information gathering. Now, here's the good news. One of the reasons we wanna gather this information is that we know there's a lot of new funding available to jurisdictions to replace lead service lines, and there's places where um, EPA may pay for the lead service line all the way up to the building. So sometimes they, the jurisdiction may only replace the lead service lines that serve the jurisdiction, um, and they don't go past the property line, but EPA is interested in also funding uh, if the owner consents, replacement up to the building. Um, so this could be a future opportunity and HUD would be able to say, we know we have X number of lead service lines servicing our properties or we can estimate it. The more we know, the more we can help you and the more we can maybe help you access additional funding to replace them. Do you want, let me, uh, actually I'll go. We got go, questions, we'll take them. Yeah, uh, so we have properties in Jackson, Mississippi and have had a number of water events where boil water or there's no, uh, no pressure or something like that. Um, we also want our residents to have water. Uh, typically, we have been working with the local municipality. Are you saying that uh, if we are not having an INSPIRE inspection, so there's not an INSPIRE inspection scheduled during this water event, that you would still be involved in that event? Uh, yes, because if we're... If we are aware of a violation of our regulations, we have to you know, either cite the property or work with you to get back into compliance. So if the residents living in a HUD-assisted unit do not have safe drinking water, you're technically in violation of the HUD regulations, and we need to help you find a solution to get back into compliance. So, uh, so right now, we are working with multifamily housing Great. to deal with that, uh, because you know it affects the entire city. 
So would would you be in addition to multifamily housing, or how no. does that? Okay. <laughs> no, we work with them. No, so we're all working from the same playbook, okay. uh, which we wrote for Flint. Um, we wrote guidance on if you're in the voucher program, you got to do this. If you're and, and largely it was the same. It's just the regulations were different. So the memo was four pages versus one. Right. So Inspire sets the standards, the regs, and the policy, and then we're all going to be playing from the same playbook. Okay. Um, and it'll be similar to what we're doing today, which is checking to see, you know, is there water available? Can the, you know, it's more, can the owner of the housing authority assist the residents getting safe drinking water? Right. Um, and I can't remember if that's bottled water or filters, but it's, it gets tricky and we're going to work with you. I mean, we had, we had uh, the fire department bring water to some yeah. buildings. I mean, it was just they like, call in the National like Guard. Huge, I mean, it's, you know. it can be really messy, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but I want to underscore, we are not proposing to score this um, as yeah. part of our methodology. So um, this would be informational be so that we could work with you um, and, and make sure that uh, we get residents safe drinking water and also to hopefully maybe identify funding opportunities that could be available. Thank you. So we know under UPCS and HQS, we, you know, there were some deficiencies or standards that uh, addressed mold and moisture at, at some level. Uh, I think as our understanding of building science has changed, uh, our understanding of public health uh, conditions that are you know, uh, that adversely affect residents changed. We knew that our standards needed to take a more comprehensive approach to mold and moisture. Uh, so because of that, we actually have mold deficiencies, I think, that are more practical. There will, there will potentially be some minor changes there, I think, where it's more practical. It makes sense from a science perspective and just from an inspector's perspective and a property's perspective where it's more practical. Uh, so we will definitely you know, think about, we've thought about the properties and the inspectors while we've developed these, and there may be some revisions in the mold standards based on that. Um, we also have this requirement for dehumidification or ventilation of the bathrooms. Uh, you want to pay close attention to that as well. And we have a very large leak standard that uh, we're taking a close look at. We may actually, it's possible we break that out into three different standards just because the rationales for those are different. Uh, we're taking a very close look at how we address leaks in the standards, uh, specifically plumbing leaks or environmental leaks. Those are things that we'll look at closely and there are deficiencies related to those. Uh, one thing that's new that uh, you know, has not existed in the past, and that's the use of moisture meters. So we had proposed the use of moisture meters in the standards notice by the inspectors. Um, and while we've gone out in the demo and we've done some site visits with properties, uh, we've actually already recognized that properties were already using moisture meters. Uh, this is something where we don't intend for the inspectors to walk out and just basically check every wall uh, for potential elevated moisture. We want our inspectors looking for evidence of elevated moisture where there's not, you know, there's that not evidence of an active leak. So you're looking for something like a water stain, you're looking for something like damage or deterioration that you, know, you would expect to be caused from moisture. Uh, under those conditions are the only conditions that we intend the inspector to actually use the moisture meter. So we're gonna try to crawl before we walk here. Uh, so we'll start out with uh, visual evidence uh, of water damage or a leak, and that's how we'll use that uh, as we proposed it in the standards notice. Uh, and also, just to be clear, we didn't require the use of infrared cameras. Uh, that's something we're recommending. Uh, our federal inspectors already have some of these, and it's something we'll be looking at uh, once we roll out Inspire. We definitely recommend it because we've come to properties where they also are already using these. Uh, in fact, they may be using these more than moisture meters. Um, we know that there's inspectors that are actually performing inspections uh, that use these for other standards and for other industries. So we knew this was something that already existed within the inspection industry, and the cost of these have dropped from the early 2000s to be a fraction uh, of what they were then. So they're you know, significantly less expensive than they were in the early 2000s. Uh, but we're again taking a walk, uh, crawl before we walk approach here. Uh, we're gonna look at this for the next three years. Um, you know, and that's something we could consider during that triennial review. Uh, but the moisture meter is something that we're definitely considering for the final standards notice. So you wanna pay close attention to that. So for carbon dioxide alarms, I know that's something a lot of people are aware of already because of the statutory requirement that just took effect in December. Um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act actually had that provision that required them. Uh, they're required to be installed according to the 2018 International Fire Code. We know that's complex, very difficult to read uh, for anyone. Actually, it doesn't matter even if you're an engineer, it's tough to read. Um, there's a lot of dependent statements in that code and you have to really break those down to understand that. 
So for chapters 9 and 11, we actually created a decision tree that we published in December. It actually spells out where those are required. The standard itself is probably less clear than the decision tree. Uh, I think it lays out in plain language where we require them. But the decision tree that we published in December tells you exactly based on multiple conditions where those carbon monoxide alarms are required. Uh, if you've read those, you have feedback, I'd love to hear your feedback. If there's something else I think that would, would help you, I think, understand that, let me know. Um, we also, I think similar to the smoke alarm, there's some questions about sleeping rooms, sleeping areas, those sort of things. Uh, so similar to that, we'll also provide some guidance on what we mean by sleeping rooms, sleeping areas, make sure that's clear for everyone. This is one of the decision trees we actually put together. Uh, it has yes, no questions. Uh, with very, what we think are simple questions. <laughs> if they're not, let me know, because uh, we can make modifications if you think something's confusing. Uh, this is the easiest example. There are some with multiple decisions. Uh, so if you can, take a look at those you know, whenever you leave. Uh, if you have some concerns about them, feel free to contact us and let us know if there's something that would help you understand those better. Cliff, before yeah. we leave carbon monoxide, yeah. um, let's emphasize here that if you have only electric appliances and no attached garage, there's no need for a carbon monoxide device. Um, you, the, the act might have been a little confusing in that respect. We want to clarify that. Right. So an all electric building, no attached garage, no requirement. The other, there's a dependency there that's in the IFC that also if it's all electric building and an attached garage that's, that's naturally ventilated or mechanically ventilated, they're not required either. So that's why the decision tree is important. It has these dependencies on other conditions that are present. Um, it's tough to read, but we, we think the decision trees will help. Where it gets tricky is where you maybe have a fuel burning appliance that's sealed off or it's in a utility room, and whether there's communicating openings to the other units. Right. That, I think, that is probably the, I think, most confusing for, for, for our stakeholders. Um, we, I think, made that clear in the decision tree. If it's not, again, let me know. Because I'd love to get feedback on it. We want to make sure that's right before we go live. Uh, and, infestation. And Cliff, Yes. one other point here. Um, we are proposing to treat carbon monoxide alarms uh, the same way we treat smoke detectors um, under UPCS from a scoring standpoint, meaning that um, we are proposing to not score carbon monoxide alarms. They would still be identified as a life-threatening defect and one that you would have to address within um, the 24-hour period. Uh, but uh, we know that a lot of folks are installing combination devices, and so um, we would we will not we are proposing to not score uh, carbon monoxide alarms under Inspire. Yeah, we've gotten lots of questions about that, and that's very important. To, I think everyone understands we're not scoring those. You still have to fix them, but we're not scoring them. Um, so for infestation, this slide's not 100% correct, um, but because uh, we talked about this counting of pests, uh, we will, over the past few weeks, we've developed a better understanding of how we could potentially uh, revise this deficiency uh, to where it would result, and I think in a, in a, in a better inspection result, uh, that I think the properties would understand what, what we're looking for, because that's, uh, that's something I think we've recognized is, is you know, could be confusing, uh, so I'd pay close attention to that when the standards notice comes out. Uh, there will be some revisions, and I think it's something that's practical, and I think makes sense. Um, we also had this part in the standards notice where we wanted to work with properties where if you were engaged with a pest control contractor in a long-term contract to help rid your property of pests, any type of infestation, uh, that we could potentially treat that differently. Uh, we're still working on what that would look like. Uh, if you have some input on that, we'd appreciate it. Uh, but for properties that are making a good faith effort to actually deal with the infestation, uh, we want to make sure that we're work, you know, we have a collaborative relationship with you. Uh, an example of something that we're considering would be integrated pest management. It's a type of pest control that actually takes a long-term approach, very uh, specific in terms of how it addresses uh, specific pest, and also in the documentation of how you're actually performing that pest control. So. That's an example of that. There's some other industry best practices that, that could work. Uh, so to make sure that uh, you know, we get some input, if you have some ideas, let us know. Tara, you want to address lead-based paint? Yes. <laughs> and then just a quick note on pest infestation. So what we'd be looking for, I, I mentioned earlier when we'd be looking for um, when the deficiency is cited and we have to collect evidence that you're addressing the deficiency. 
Um, we really do want to see integrated pest management as part of your solution for addressing pest deficiencies. So yeah, I know that you know the way React works, and we want a 24-hour answer. You might just be encouraged to do more pest spraying. You might just call your pest contractor, have them come out and bomb the whole place before React comes. We want to avoid that. Um, the amount of pesticide you're using is more dangerous than the pests themselves. We want to look at using um, an integrated pest management approach, uh, a, a pest control operator that's trained in IPM. They know where to look for where the pests are coming in. Um, they know to how, how to um, come up with a plan for you know, making your place less hospitable to pests, uh, less food, less water, less shelter, and places for those bugs and rodents to hide. Um, so that is where we're moving. Uh, we know that you know we're crawling before we walk, uh, but we do really want to move to an IPM resolution for a longer-term fix and less spraying and only spraying. I see a question. Uh, I know, kind of earlier on in in React, uh, inspectors weren't going in in bed bug-related units, and then there was kind of the um, situation where they were going in, or then it was up to inspectors' discretionary. Where will that kind of be falling in and inspire? I think we're going we're to think about that. Um, it, it could change, but we'll, as part of the revision of the standards that we're, we're finishing up this week, we'll take a close look at that. That's, that's part of it. So Ash mentioned we will have a protocols guide that's, that, that will be published at some point for the inspection. The standards themselves have the process and the, what we're calling the protocols, but we're calling it an inspection process. It'll have that underneath it. Uh, for situations like that, we would list those underneath the standard in the in the process. But we will have a like a aggregated document that includes all that uh, when we go live. That includes information similar to that. Lead-based paint. Uh, so properties in the public housing and multifamily housing world, those rental assistance properties, you already have pretty extensive requirements for lead-based paint. I'll call them evaluations because the type of program defines the type of testing you do. Um, you already have these requirements under HUD's lead safe housing rule. We're not changing those requirements. All of that still stands. What we're adding, um, and it's part of consolidating our programs and our inspection protocols, the voucher program has a unit by unit approach where the inspector looks at um, deteriorated paint. There's a visual, uh, a visual assessment of whether there's any deteriorated paint in units that are older than, the building is older than 1978, constructed before 1978, and where there's a child under age six. We are bringing that voucher assessment over into Inspire so it would apply to public housing and multifamily. What that means is the REAC inspector, when they're inspecting the unit and the building, they're gonna look at whether there is deteriorated paint um, and whether it is a unit. They, they're not always gonna know if there's a child in that unit, um, but they're still gonna look at whether there's deteriorated paint and that deteriorated paint would be a deficiency that would need to be corrected. Uh, let's see. It doesn't replace the lead safe housing rule requirements. All of those still apply. We're also gonna gather more in information in advance. So as part of that collecting documents is the first touch. We're gonna ask you to scan your lead-based paint inspection or risk assessment. You can just scan the um, summary. The summary is gonna have all your positive areas. Scan that and send that to REAC in advance. Um, and we're going to uh, also look, we're still going to look at the lead disclosure forms. The lead inspection information, though, this is what's really helpful. If you are cited for a deficiency for deteriorated paint, but you know from your lead inspection that that wall doesn't have lead-based paint, that closes that deficiency for you. The more information that you have available about surfaces in your property that contain lead-based paint, the easier it will be to, to close those deficiencies if you're cited for them. I'll pause for questions. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a standards web page. Uh, you can actually look at individual standards. You can download all of them together. If you need something to put you to sleep at night, the standards exist in a zip file, all th you know, 300 pages of it. Um, we also have guidance for how to navigate those. Uh, we have the pre previous versions of the standards. And we also have an email link where you can actually submit feedback. Um, hey, Cliff, two other things here. Um, in our efforts to help you all prepare for Inspire, we will also be creating um, some kind of supplemental um, 
materials to go along with those standards once those standards are finalized. So for example, folks have asked for a crosswalk of Inspire standards to UPCS and HQS standards. Uh, we've actually been working on that. Um, that will be posted to the website once uh, our standards are finalized. Uh, additionally, um, we will be putting together a cheat sheet on what deficiencies fall in those four categories uh, of severity that Cliff talked about previously, so you know what to focus on. We will also be flagging the new affirmatives. Uh, that'll be important because in the first 12 months after we go live with Inspire, um, for each of the portfolios, it'll be 12 months from the go live date for, for the respective portfolios, we are proposing to not score the new affirmatives. Um, that will give folks some time to uh, adapt to some of the new affirmative standards that will be put in place uh, without being penalized from a scoring standpoint. Yeah, so, so once the standards are finalized, we'll have that, we're calling it a crosswalk. Some of them are sort of a crosswalk because the 40 standards that are not materially changed, those are clearly almost a one for one match. Uh, some of them will have to, we'll put some nuance around because I think We'll detail how they're different. Uh, there is, I think, enough difference in some of them. It's almost like there's overlap, but not exactly the same. So when we actually put that crosswalk together, it'll have that nuanced difference explained so it's very clear how they're different. So for the standards, if you've read them, you've gone to this uh, website already, you know there's a consistent template that we use across the standards. Uh, there's a specific terminology that we use. There's a layout that's the same across all the standards. We list components, definitions, those sorts of items. We wanted to put those items in there just to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we're looking at, the items that we're inspecting, uh, the definitions that we clear on what it exactly is that we're inspecting. Um, there is a part here, I think, you know, I'll get to this, I think, on the next to last page. Uh, when we go through this template, we have a beginning section, like the definition, the summary of the deficiencies. Uh, the order of the inspectable area. So if there's some question about where is this an inspectable item, we have that listed. We also have additional information on the inspection process that I'll point out here in just a minute. And then at the very end of each standard within the template, we have a change log that lists all the changes to the standards. Uh, this is actually really important. Uh, we use the fire door here as an example of how we actually write those standards. Uh, one of the most important parts of this, they're all important, but one of the most important parts is the inspection process. Uh, this is, a, you know, someone has asked in the past, are we having a comp bulletin? Uh, we're going to have a protocol guide. It's going to be different than the comp bulletin. The information that was in the comp bulletin that is important to the inspectors is listed in this inspection process part. So if you're reading through the standards and the individual deficiencies, uh, you do not want to stop at the health and safety determination you will want to make sure that you go all the way down and read the inspection process. Uh, what we find are that, at least initially during the demonstration, uh, a lot of inspectors, when they got to that part, it made it clear exactly what it is they were looking for when properties have you know, uh, sent us emails or called us uh, about specific standards before a demo inspection, and we could direct them to the inspection process part that made it clear what it was we were looking for. We know that occasionally the standards, there may be some exceptions or things that need additional guidance and where that's the case in the standards, that's included under the inspection process. Uh, the change log that I mentioned, so if you had a question, you know, you noticed something changed from one version to the next, uh, and you wanted to know what that was, that's under the change log, you'll find that at the end. Now the key takeaways, I want to make sure, I said this at the beginning, make sure health and safety, unit focused, make sure you walk away understanding it's focused on health and safety and the units. Uh, we're aligning all the inspection standards, so if you were only doing UPCS uh, or you were only doing HQS, you know, this may be a different experience for you because we're aligning them. Uh, there are things that didn't exist in either of those that we're focusing on now. Examples of those would be fire doors, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, and I think most everything you want to, if you have questions or you want to read about it, you, you could just Google Inspire Standards. It's usually the first thing that pops up and you can find most of your answers there. Uh, you can also contact us. We have an email contact on that site as well. Is this polling for? It's for you. Okay. It's for you. All right. I'm, ahead. I'm a little apprehensive <laughs> about this. <laughs> All right. We can scan the code and get the results here.
So have you reviewed the Inspire standards on HUD.gov? Yes, no. It's like pretty close, almost equally divided there. That's the best break we've gotten. Yeah. So that's, yeah, as I said, if you Google Inspire standards, you'll find those pretty easily. It's usually the first thing that pops up. Um, it'll take you to that web page that we just showed. Um, interestingly enough, if you've heard of chat GPT, the AI, um, uh, artificial intelligence that actually write sentences and paragraphs and papers. I actually searched, I actually put it in there and it actually described Inspire perfectly. <laughs> so for some reason the AI actually knew exactly what Inspire was. Uh, so you should too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, super surprised by that. Um, which statement would you agree with most? I do not understand any aspects. Um, so we'll have more information as Ash and Tara have mentioned, we'll have more information coming out later. Uh, training opportunities, more information posted on the website. Uh, as we finalize the standards, we'll be posting what I'd call tools or aids. I think that will help people understand the standards more clearly. Uh, we also have additional get ready sessions. Uh, we have an email address where you can contact us as well. You understand some aspects, I'm actually glad to hear. Uh, 104, that's actually good to hear. 23, maybe that's, I understand all aspects. Those are probably all the HUD staffers. Uh, if not, you're hired. <laughs> Actually, fair, you know, oddly enough, we've gone out to some properties. I think we have property managers that, that we've talked to frequently in the past several months who can actually explain the standards back to us at a level that is actually really impressive. So we know property managers are, re are reading this really closely. Uh, they have been able to actually detail the standards in a way that I was impressed by. Uh, so they've, there are property managers who can actually read back the more information to me without actually having to see it on a piece of paper. So that's actually really impressive. So I think that's the category there. We know that there are definitely some properties on top of it. Which words would you associate? Easy to understand. Safety and life threatening hazards. Health and safety, that's good to hear. Streamline, that's great. Change, comprehensive, evidence-based, good. Expanded, clear, consistency, too wordy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there are standards that are complex. Some of those could be the smoke alarm, the carbon monoxide alarm. We get that. That's why we're providing additional information or guidance or tools that will help you later. Um, health and safety unit, fair, that's good to hear. Different, new, change. Yeah, a lot of common themes here. Health and safety, I'm glad you got that. That's good. We take all feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Better approach. Largely, it looks like largely positive, so this is good. Uh, carbon monoxide. Health, safety, new inside, great. Uh, do we want to roll into scoring or? Yeah. And Q&A, we have a Q&A first. Yeah. Can we do that first? Your yep. Q&A okay. first. All right. Questions, anybody? Questions. Okay. air furnace in that unit. Right. It's a radiated heat. Right. Is there smoke detectors or CO2 detectors necessary in the bedrooms, et cetera, or is there one necessary in the immediate area of the fuel burning device? So those are those are two different two different standards. The there's different requirements based on the conditions that are present. So for smoke alarm, where you described it's a, a unit with a bedroom that's separate from the rest of the space, I, I think that sounds like what you're describing. So there would be a smoke alarm required outside of that bedroom and then also inside the bedroom. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So all car, units get smoke detectors. All units, that's right. So that's all units. Because it's assumed that every unit has a, a fuel burning stove. So the smoke alarm example. requirement has no dependency on a fuel burning appliance? Got it. Okay. That's why I say there are two different standards. The deficiency criteria requirements are different because we do require smoke alarm in every unit right. based on the standard. Carbon dioxide, different standard. 
Uh, and what I described earlier is dependencies. So those decision trees that we published in December, it will have a series of yes, no questions based on the fuel burning appliances that are present. And those questions are based on where those are located. So it will very specifically say, so I think one of the biggest questions are, what I think you may have been describing is a building with a boiler in the basement uh, with radiant hydronic, you know, hydronic piping with radiators in the bedrooms and in the, in the units. No fuel burning appliances whatsoever in the units themselves. Is that right? Other than the gas power stove. Okay. So th that question has come in and it can be answered two different ways. If there's no gas stove, you, there's a requirement for a carbon dioxide alarm in the mechanical room or units that are basically, you know, it's not what the standard says, but a unit, if there's a shear, like a communicated opening between that mechanical room and a, and a unit, there are some requirements based on whether or not there are communicated openings between the mechanical room and those units. Uh, what we're really mean by those communicated openings are where if the boiler malfunctions, there would be carbon dioxide that could potentially leak into that unit from that mechanical room. So what we're expecting to see are rooms that are units that are adjacent to that mechanical room or units that have pipe chases to those units where the hydronic that are not sealed. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So for the other condition that you described, which is where we have uh, a boiler, uh, actually, regardless of whether or not there's a boiler, if there's a, uh, a stove in that unit, fuel burning stove, there is a carbon dioxide alarm requirement based on the dependencies that are in that decision tree. So it will, see, it will say, where is that stove? Uh, and it will ask basically the question of where are they sleeping? Those sort of questions, and it will tell you exactly where the carbon dioxide alarm is required. But just so that it's clear, and if this is clear, carbon dioxide and smoke alarms are two different standards. Uh, they only relate to each other in the way that you can have combination smoke and carbon dioxide alarms. Uh, and just to be clear, those are two different you know, if that combination alarm is defective in the way that it's not responding to the test button to either the smoke alarm or the carbon dioxide alarm, that is two different deficiencies. Well, there's an understanding out there that if you have a boiler, you need carbon monoxide detectors in every apartment. So it could be true if there are other fuel burning appliances in the units. If there's not, uh, it would be dependent on the communicated openings, which would, as I said, we would, what we're looking for, openings between the mechanical room and the units, that could be an opening directly into a unit that's adjacent to it. It could be, say for example, a pipe chase that runs through the building interior where a carbon dioxide that's unsealed, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, if you have a pipe chase, a riser that goes up to mm -hmm. the upper units, that chase is not sealed, that would be considered a communicated opening. Okay. Yeah. Because we do see that. So if we go into a building where that chase is not sealed, yes, we would expect to see carbon dioxide alarms in those units. But if there is a unit that doesn't have a chase where those hydronic piping goes directly to it, those units would not be required. It's only where there's a communicated opening directly to the unit. Now, what we do know is that when we're going out and inspecting for this, it may take some additional time to determine where those communicated openings are located because you may have to look up a chase. You may have to go look to see which units are directly adjacent to that mechanical room. Uh, we do anticipate it may take a few, you know, it may take an additional minute or so to actually sort out what, where are the communicated openings. And then I just want to add one quick yeah. thing. Um, and then the new smoke detector requirement, you got two years for that. But if you have to go out and buy smoke detectors to upgrade to NFPA 72, just go ahead and get the sealed 10-year battery ones now so that you don't have to go buy them later. And yes, the combination smoke and carbon oxide is still allowable. Just right. make, get them sealed. Yeah, we just can't reiterate that enough. If you're buying smoke alarms now, make sure they're sealed with a 10-year battery. Uh, Mike Cranton, I'm a uh, maintenance director for a property management firm. Um, I have a couple questions. Hopefully, I'll get through them really quickly. Um, I've had the benefit of working both directly with the contractors and with some HUD reps. And there's a huge discrepancy on the way that the inspections are being performed by the contractors versus HUD. Is that going to, are they going to go in one direction or the other, or are they going to kind of combine and kind of come somewhere in the middle ground? So our anticipation is the final version of the standards, when those are released, we will have 
more concise standards, we will have a more concise set of what we're calling the inspection process, but uh, you know, the protocols part of it. We will also have released some additional aids, I think, to help recognize where um, you know, there's, there are things that maybe you need additional information in order to judge whether or not something's a deficiency. And which, by the way, the final standards, we have feedback from demo inspectors on how to improve this, basically the way the standards are written. Uh, we also have feedback uh, from property owners like your, or property managers like yourself, where we can make changes that actually make the standards more clear in terms of what exactly it is we're looking for. Uh, performing the demonstration was an important part of actually us being able to field test the standards. So earlier last year, we were able to actually roll out the demo, get that going full speed. Uh, that gave us the opportunity to basically start looking at how the standards were written, how we can improve the inspection process part of it. But it, it, it did take us a while to actually, I think, understand, you know, several months after we had it, basically we're field testing them. Uh, for us to do that for a long enough period to get feedback from the demo inspectors uh, and also get feedback from their properties. Uh, so because of that, you know, and COVID obviously made that complicated because it, uh, it was delayed. Uh, so because of that, we had to basically wait to revise the standards until we had a critical mass of feedback from the demonstration itself to better understand how to write those standards, the deficiencies, the deficiency criteria, and then the inspection process in order to make that clear to everyone. So I think there will be material changes in the final versions of the standards where the contract inspectors, the federal inspectors, and the property owners and the property managers will know, they'll be more aligned in terms of understanding what it is we're asking for. Um, I know scoring's not set yet, but one of the things with React is uh, you could have multiple defects on, say, one door. You might have daylight, you might have damaged hardware, and you may have a hole in the door. We're, we're, on, yeah. on that, we would only get hit with the most uh, severe of the defects, but it, it's been suggested in some of the other What, what type of door? Uh, it's an entry door, so it's going to be a fire-rated door. Okay. So... Yeah. We are working really closely as, as that'll be part of the inspection process, part of the protocol, make it very clear what it is we want to do with that. Uh, there are certainly conditions where we would want to cite one. Uh, where we get into life safety conditions, there may be some consideration for multiple because, you know, for example, unit entry door is also egress door, uh, in which, by the way, the egress standard will change materially. Uh, so I want to make sure that people understand that. Uh, it's also a fire door. so. Where it doesn't, where a tenant, a resident is potentially trapped in a unit, uh, and it's not used as an egress door, it is a door that protects them from the fire and smoke. Uh, so we're still looking at that. So we're considering that, and I think our decision will be very clear when the final sets of standards come out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had an inspection last week, and one of the new, newer things I just got hit on, it had rained that morning, mm -hmm. and then they cited me for ponding and water on the roof, okay. flat roof. Right. So in the past, it's never been an issue when you've had a recent rainfall. Right. So honestly, I haven't had a chance to relook that one up or not, but I don't. Yeah, I, I believe, I'll go back and double check. Um, industry standard usually for ponding is somewhere between 24 to 48 hours. Right. When was the inspection? The day, that morning that it rained. That morning that it yeah, rained, okay. It rained and there was a small pond more than a 20 square foot. Okay, well, I'll take a close look at that. Okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier too is with the arc fault testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had on that same inspection, we found out two days later that we had six microwaves in somebody's sound system that got fried because of the flipping on and off of the arc faults. Um, so there is a potential for damage to people's equipment by flipping on and off the breakers. Um, these were arc fault breakers, so. So technically, yeah. it shouldn't, yeah. but. It, it, it's going to be one of those things that we may find that we're going to have some issues. Okay. That, that's one of the standards we want to follow closely. That's right. why I said we've talked about uh, the best way to do that. Um, we, we need to make sure those are working. Um, for the standard that the microwave was supposed to be manufactured to, that's not supposed to happen, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we're looking very closely at that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the other things, I mean, we know that, for example, vacuum cleaners can trip an AFCI breaker or some other equipment. Uh, technically, those consumer uh, electronic compliances are not supposed to do that. That's why we're taking a closer look at it. We want to think about the best way to approach that. Uh, you know, and it may be different than what we have in the current version right. of the standard. Right. Current standard two says uh, no less than, or at least two inches, but not more than six inches on the 
overflow portion of their relief valve drain pipe. On a lot of my newer properties, they're going directly into a wall drain, not a floor drain, but a wall drain that's designed for it. So technically that would be a defect because it's, it's less than two inches and also the pans going down into the drip pans, which would be a siphoning effect, I guess is what right. they were saying. But um, if we leave those pipes now hanging wide open, then they're not gonna go into the drain they're designed to go into because instead of a pan, it's only a, roughly a three inch pipe that it's designed to go into. So um, the question is, am I gonna have to cut those back two inches above the top of the drip pan, of the, the drain pipe? Not the drip pan, but a drain, uh, an actual drain pipe going into the wall designed for them. So you're talking about the catch pan that's underneath the water heater or a HVAC unit? I can understand that because it's easy enough to cut back two inches, but right. these don't have drip pans. They have a drain coming out of the wall designed to go straight outside. I should talk to you in between and make sure that we're talking yep. about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and we definitely don't want you to make modifications yeah, right, on yeah. something that's right. working the way it should just right, to right. pass a UPCS inspection. Right. right. We, you know, we are actually we looked closely at the um, leak standard Sorry. recently right. because of the uh, catch bands. Right. I just want to make sure that we're talking about because the, there right. there may be some changes from where it is for 2.2 to where the final version. And is. lastly, it comes back to the fire doors again. You're talking about. Um, field service and putting things on so things like strike plates and peepholes were not designed to be on there when the door came from the manufacturer but every pretty much every fire rated door exterior wise has a kick plate and the apartment doors have peepholes so technically we're in violation for that defect you are unless there's a uh, there is a standard <laughs> for the hardware that you install in those fire doors that would actually allow that if it's meets a certain standard. Um, but, and that's something we're aware of and we're gonna monitor, so. Um, and we may actually end up requesting documentation that this is, uh, this is something we're gonna look at closely for the administrative part. Uh, you know, it could be that we're asking that you uh, have used hardware that actually meets the requirements for hard or, or fire doors. HQS, will there also be a certification required for Inspire for the inspectors? So I know in HQS, the certification for those inspectors were done by a third party vendor. It wasn't something that was uh, a HUD program. We're looking closely, uh, I think, at uh, those sorts of things. And there, there may be some area that we could, we could look at in the future, but we're definitely thinking about that. Yeah. yeah. Cliff, and let me jump in here. We are evaluating our credentialing for um, inspectors, uh, but we are, um, you know, we, we, we greatly value our partnership with um, existing REAC inspectors, um, our contract inspection partners, and then also thinking about how credentialing would apply at the local level where you hire your own inspectors or you go out and you hire a third party firm to come in and do your inspections. Uh, this is particularly common in the voucher program. Um, as part of evaluating and thinking about what our credentials are moving forward, uh, we certainly would love some feedback on that. Um, we'll be publishing some guidance um, later this year, but we're also mindful that this is a transition. It's a big change, um, and we, we don't want to knock out a bunch of inspectors, right, at a time we're transitioning to Inspire, and so we want to take a common sense approach for giving folks time to learn the new standards, get up to speed, um, and that's another reason why because um, in the voucher program, inspections are conducted locally, um, we're giving a little more time, right, to provide training and technical assistance to hopefully get your inspectors trained. But we expect that if you have good inspectors that have been doing HQS inspections for a long time, you know, even though Inspire is different, fingers crossed they'll be able to adapt. And, and we're gonna work with you all and work with them to help them adapt. And we didn't propose any requirements in the proposed rule that said they must be certified. So there's nothing in the proposed. You will not see anything in the final Inspire rule about certification. All right, nothing else? Okay. Right, so I think so. Hey, Ash, I have one more question. Oh, oh, Angela has a question. All right, come on. I do, Cliff. So have you looked into the egress issues as far as windows and door hardware for skilled nursing facilities? So I know that we have a we have an understanding, I think, with the healthcare program office on the, uh, because of the elopement issue that exists. Yes. Yeah. So we, there's also previously a question about the 
previous database or technical corrections we had in the data. So I think we're anticipating being able to roll that forward if it existed for a property in the past. Uh, we know that that's an issue that's specific to healthcare facilities, uh, and that's something that we probably don't want to cite. And we have that understanding, I think, with the healthcare program office already. Because uh, there is, I think, for example, even a removal of doors. Correct. Uh, that's acceptable at the state and local level. Uh, that's also if it's a Medicare and Medicaid facility that's receiving a life safety inspection under those requirements, it's also acceptable for that. So we're, you know, I think in the end we'll end up saying that's acceptable because it's, uh, that's expected within that setting. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. And actually, I will just quick throw in. Okay. At these other sessions, we're getting a lot of questions about call for aid systems. Yes. And maybe they started removing them, but there's pieces of them left, and React cited them. We are going to work on improving call for aid, how that's inspected and when it's actually cited. Um, what we definitely don't want to do is if you have a functioning or semi-functioning call for aid and you keep getting cited, we don't want you to rip it out just to avoid right, right. deficiencies. Um, Cliff, do you want to say more? Yeah, so I think during the demonstration and during just uh, this conversation we had in industry, you know, we knew that, as Sarah said, people were just tearing them out where they weren't required. Um, so we, it'd be better if people kept them. Uh, so we are going to take a different cr approach to that, um, you know, potentially non-scoring. So uh, we know it's difficult where you have residents that I think well, we've, <laughs> uh, we frequently have heard that there are cats that actually like to do things with these cards. Uh, so that's <laughs> that's a challenge. We understand that. Uh, so I think we're going to have you know a, a different approach to it in the end. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. So I had a question regarding water supply, the safety of water supply that was mentioned earlier. So um, with the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, we operate the Housing Choice Voucher for a county, and we have multiple water suppliers. So I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about maybe adding that to the request for tenancy approval um, form so that we could collect the water supplier information at that time. That's a great idea. Um, I can tell you changing a form at HUD is like, you know, carving a mountain. Um, so I can't <laughs> promise anything in the near term. Um, but what you did remind me of is perhaps we need to put multiple entry fields, make sure we have multiple entry fields for that in, when we do that first collection, except as a voucher program, you, you wouldn't be doing that. So let me back up. Um, voucher programs, because those inspections are done by the housing authority, you have the option to use our Inspire system. You don't have to, um, but we could make sure that there's multiple entry fields in there if you want to collect one. But those, you would probably be doing it more at the unit level, and maybe there's just one water supply for a particular unit. Right, but the use of our Salesforce system is optional for the voucher program. We're going to encourage it, but it's not required. Um, I have a, a, a egress question. Um, and we just recently had a REACT inspection. I have uh, residents who have um, special needs kids, and a couple in particular, the children are artistic. Mm -hmm. So they leave the house over the night, during the night, and mm -hmm. the police find them. Yeah. So the parents under the, I guess. They're blocking windows. They're putting yeah. hasp and on doors. the doors. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're continuing, for some reason, these units continue to come up on the REAC inspection. And mm -hmm. So we continue to get cited for them. So you've had this happen multiple times. Yes. You've submitted adjustments for it, paperwork for it in the past. So I think moving forward, as Ash and others have mentioned, that we'll have a different IT system in place. You know, I think we're anticipating that when that happens, the inspector will, you know, at least initially prior to the inspection, they will have this preloaded information that actually explains that these conditions will be present and these adjustments have already been made. So we don't anticipate that happening in the future. Um, or at least at a substantially lower frequency anyway. But we absolutely yeah. understand that yeah. those are special conditions, right. perhaps a reasonable accommodation for that family, and that they're necessary, and you shouldn't keep getting right. dinged for it. Right. Thank you. For the, for the carbon monoxide detectors, if you're not doing one of these combined smoke detector uh, units, are there any particular requirements for the carbon monoxide detectors? Because I've been getting some questions. Do they have to be hardwired? Can they be battery? I think there's also plug-in types. I mean, what is HUD looking for? So we were directed by Congress to use the 2018 IFC 
which is published by the International Code Council. That model code doesn't it doesn't require you to have it hardwired. Battery operated's fine. Uh, so I think you're okay if that's. Are you? Has somebody said they have to be hardwired? Is that? Yeah, I mean, I've just been getting questions about okay. is there any particular parameters? And I mean, I yeah. read that and it was. Confusing. Either one is fine. You should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make that distinction, um, and we're we're not going to actually require you to go hardwire them. Uh, so that that's fine. The right. only distinction is the new requirement for right. smoke detectors. Right. And right. We've that's got the two only. years for that. Yeah, that's different. So just uh, I think just to make it clear, because if you were installing a combo smoke and carbon dioxide alarm into you know at some point, you would definitely want to make sure that it's a sealed battery unit. That's the only thing I think I would recommend. Not required at the moment, but if we're using the combo, because we are going to have that, we would recommend making sure that it's a sealed unit. Thank you. One more. One more. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's for the questioner. Yeah. I think, well, maybe not. No? Did I see Okay, one? no. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Okay, we are clapping. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so... Slight change, we're gonna go into the break now and then do scoring model when yep. we come back. So we'll take a 10 minute break, guys. So start that, cue that timer and enjoy your break. See you in a little bit. Yep. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. As Cliff was talking and as the last session was unfolding, I started thinking of a, a story. I, I read an article once about how Eddie Van Halen, you know, the, the, the rock star legend, was talking about his guitar playing. And they asked him, why do you do what you do? And he said it in like one sentence. He said, if he wasn't playing the guitar, he'd be pumping gas. And I thought that was really interesting because he was so committed to playing. And I, I had that image of Cliff as, as that, that Eddie Van Halen quote was, was going in through my head. Anyway, it looks like we're ready. Guys, strap in, sit tight. This is the scoring uh, session. Go ahead, Ash. There, there. Um, I like to use the walking mic for scoring in part because I, I like to point out uh, some of the graphics that uh, we are presenting today. Um, so I, I think this is, this is the part that everybody is very excited about, um, or we, we want you to be excited about it. Um, we think we're making um, several uh, proposed changes to our scoring methodology um, that we, we hope you will like. We also uh, hope that will result in um, more accurate uh, property scores that reflect the true condition of the property, but not just the property, right? Units as well, right? Because we, we've established that under Inspire, and, and this has been a specific marching order from Congress, that HUD-assisted, HUD-insured properties should no longer pass inspection if the units are not very good, right? If, if we consider the units to be failing. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, that's, that can happen. It does happen. They're outliers under UPCS, but it does happen. Um, we will touch a little bit on um, how properties will be assessed, how voucher units will be assessed, um, but this is primarily focused on inspire inspections of public housing and multifamily properties. But um, certainly during Q&A, if you have questions about um, you know, how and, and, and under what circumstances voucher units will be assessed, they continue to be assessed on a pass-fail basis, um, but, you know, what are the criteria, right, that would result in a voucher unit failing inspection? Um, so without further ado, um, we've got this module, and we've got the IT and operations module, and then we'll, we'll send you on your way. Um, so we've got a lot of information still to cover. So with that, let me find the clicker here. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, UPCS scoring. Um, you know, it's been our experience at most of these get ready sessions. Um, people are very familiar with UPCS, at least those that are in the public housing and multifamily worlds. Um, although we do have uh, many participants that, that don't deal with those fixed asset programs that HUD operates. Um, and so some of this may not apply so much to the voucher program, obviously. Um, why are we gonna go over UPCS scoring? Um, because it's gonna help you understand the changes from UPCS to Inspire. Um, and it's going to illustrate some of the principles that we set forth when we developed the Inspire scoring methodology. Um, you're going to hear those code words again, proposed, thinking about, considering. Um, the scoring uh, notice, which is um, the, the second of those three subordinate notices that Tara talked about this morning, um, 
we're hoping will be published uh, for public comment, a 30-day public comment period by the end of the month. So stay tuned. Um, and I'm sure you all know when scoring uh, will hit the street. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it'll get a, a lot of attention. Um, and, and that's to be expected. Um, we're going to talk a little bit also about how our Inspire scoring methodology is really an instrument of policy and what is important to HUD. And we've been talking a lot about health and safety. We've been talking a lot about residents. We've been talking a lot about the unit-based focus of Inspire. And I think you'll see our scoring methodology aligns with those policies. Um, and I'll talk about some more broadly, some principles that we set forward when we develop the scoring methodology. Um, we're going to uh, perform a pretty simplistic uh, scoring exercise. It's going to be notional in nature. It can't be more specific at this point in time because we haven't published um, the scoring notice for public comment. Um, but I want to kind of give you guys some news you can use, right? Once that scoring methodology hits the street, this Get Ready Session presentation will be updated with the details of our scoring methodology, the proposed scoring methodology. It'll be updated with things like our defect impact weights, which we'll talk about. We will be publishing every version of the Get Ready Session PowerPoints to the Inspire website. So once that scoring notice hits the street, check back to the Inspire website, and we'll probably put out some communication that says, this is the PowerPoint you want to look at, because this is the PowerPoint that now has the detailed scoring information in it. Of course, we also want to encourage you to read the scoring notice once it comes out, and we very much want you to comment on it. It's what will help us get the scoring right, and your feedback is absolutely essential to that. Um, and so we'll also talk a little bit about sampling. Um, in addition to just creating a score or calculating a score, um, we rely on sampling. We don't inspect 100% of units at most properties because of the size of those properties. So we will be continuing to employ a sampling methodology, and we are proposing some small changes to that sampling methodology that I want to go over, and we're, we're actually proposing one very big change to that sampling methodology involving buildings that I want to go over. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, how scoring will tie to FAS, um, and then certainly whatever other questions that you may have. Um, and feel free to ask questions um, during the session. We'll, if I see your hand, we'll, we'll pause and take those as we go, go forward. So a little bit about UPCS, and uh, I'm sure we have some, some experts in the room in UPCS. Uh, I know we do. Um, it's based on a zero to 100 point scale, right? 100 being a perfect score under UPCS, zero being um, obviously the worst score that you can get. When I think about UPCS scoring, I think about um, a pie. Um, around Thanksgiving, I said pumpkin pie. Um, I don't know what pies people eat in January. But um, that 100-point score, to me, is like a pie. It gets divided up into all sorts of little pieces. Um, and so the five biggest pieces of that Inspire or that UPCS scoring pie right, are our inspectable areas. So um, units account for the most points. Uh, but then we look at building systems, common areas, building exterior, and site. And in the spirit of reinforcing some of the previous content that's been shared, remember under Inspire, we're consolidating those five areas down to three. The unit inspectable area will roughly correspond with the unit inspectable area under Inspire. Uh, but building systems and common areas will be consolidated into that inside inspectable area, um, roughly, and then building exterior and site will be consolidated into that outside inspectable area. And as Cliff said, it really depends on where the inspector is standing. Um, and we think that that will make it a little bit easier for inspectors to figure out, you know, if they're looking at a certain inspectable item, where is that, right? Um, sometimes there has been confusion in the past, um, despite all the training we do, despite the comp bulletin, um, you know, we know that sometimes certain attributes of a property get treated in one area when maybe they should be treated in another area. And we're trying to cut down on those circumstances. Um, so you can see if you look at this distribution of points, right? Um, you can get a passing score on your UPCS inspection, which is 60 or above, and scores zero points in units. Um, like I said, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And, and that is no longer going to be the case under Inspire, that you can have units that are that bad and still get a passing score. Um, UPCS also uses kind of a number of mathematical um, 
I'll just say functions, right? Um, where we weight certain defects um, and we further divide the pie in certain ways and we'll talk about that. Uh, but the two most important of those factors, right, are the criticality level. So um, our, our kind of most dangerous defects, our exigent health and safety defects, are typically at that criticality level five, meaning an inspector observes it, um, it gets multiplied, uh, meaning that it deducts more from your, your score. And, and just for those that are less aware, you know, every inspection starts at, a, at 100, right? And then depending on what the inspector observes, then the deductions occur. And then there's something called the severity level. So um, out of curiosity, how many people are familiar with the dictionary of deficiency definitions? Okay, yeah, a lot of folks, right? Um, so that's gonna be replaced by the standards that Cliff went over today. But one of the features of that, the way that we've classified defects in the past is by severity level. So most of our deficiencies have level one, level two, level three severity, level one being the least severe observation, level three being the most severe observation. Um, oddly, we have some defects that don't have a level two, um, not many, but most of them have those kind of three gradations of defect severity. So the example I like to use is, um, and I won't get the terminology exactly right, so I'll talk about it more colloquially, is like damaged wall, right? Level one defect could be where a nail was removed that a portrait was hanging on. Now, probably really shouldn't be a level one, but it's a very small deficiency in the wall. Level two, more severe. Um, when I like to think of level two, I, I think about my kids. I got a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. For a while, we had one door, the playroom door, that didn't have a doorstop. So you can imagine my nine-year-old and four-year-old, or four-year-old at the time, now five, they would fly through that door. And over time, the doorknob made a hole this big in the wall. That would be a level two deficiency. Wall still works, it performs its function, but it needs a patch. Definitely needs a patch, maybe even some drywall, right? And then level three would be the wall is not structurally sound, typically. And, and, and those are, like I said, those are um, kind of summary descriptions. Um, but depending on the severity level, right, and depending on the criticality level of the defect, uh, if you were a criticality level five and a severity level three, that would have a significant, could potentially have a significant impact on your score, depending on how many units are inspected, considering how many inspectable items there might be in the, in the unit or on the property. So we also, like I said, and this is why I like to think of UPCS scoring as a little bit like a pie, right? So we broke that 100 points down into five slices. We further break that pie down based on the number of units we sample and based on the attributes that are in um, each of those units and buildings, right? So for example, and, and I like this example, kitchen has 10 inspectable items. Well, we break the portion of the kitchen into 10 more pieces. Um, and you can see, you know, the score quickly becomes very complicated because you have all of these pieces that have all of their associated portion of the score that, that goes along with them. So um, in this case, there's 10 inspectable items. Each one of those 10 would have a 10% item weight. Um, and I'll go one step further, right? So for our biggest properties under UPCS, we score, or we, we inspect 27 units. So that's 27 kitchens that if they all look like this, they get divided into 10 different inspectable items. So that's 270 inspectable items that all account for a portion of the score. And you can see how it's very, it gets very complex very quickly depending on what inspectable items are there. Um, and depending on the number of units that are sampled, um, depending on the configuration of the unit, how many bedrooms are in the units. Um, so these are all cuts to the pie, so to speak. Okay, um, so and you can see, right, that depending on how many of those inspectable items you have, they could either account for a very small deduction or it could account for a very large deduction. This is one of the reasons why we've seen single site related defects 
result in a 15 point deduction. You could lose all of your points on site based on one defect, particularly at smaller properties. That's not a feature we want to replicate. Okay, so let's move on to talk about Inspire and, and let's talk about some of the differences between Inspire and UPCS. So I've already kind of gone over the complex system of weightings, multipliers, inspectable items that all account for a portion of that 100 point score. Under Inspire, we're proposing um, a simplified three-step scoring methodology. It's actually four-step, and we should revise this slide, and I'll tell you what the four-step is. It's that unit standard of performance um, that we'll get to here in a few minutes. Um, we are hoping, right, and, and this is some of the principles we set forth, and I'll, I'll actually go over the principles after I, I go through the rest of these. Um, under UPCS, unsafe properties could still pass an inspection and or properties with unsafe units could pass an inspection. Um, some of this is just by the very nature of the design of the UPCS scoring methodology. Like I said, those item limits, those caps that have been put in place in the past um, that you know, after time, we stopped counting certain defects, right? Um, and that created some and has created some wonky situations from a scoring standpoint. Um, under Inspire, unsafe properties will not receive a passing score. Um, due to the focus on health and safety deficiencies in the unit, and properties with unsafe units will not receive a passing score. And we'll talk about what that means. That doesn't mean that one unit with one unsafe condition fails your inspection. It's an aggregate evaluation. We're proposing an aggregate evaluation of units that get sampled, right? Um, and we are proposing a unit standard of performance that is based on um, the aggregation of your results across all of your units. And that is, you know, in some ways similar to the way, right, we calculate the 35 points on units today under UPCS. We take the results from all of the units that are sampled. We're going to be doing the same thing under Inspire and in trying to establish whether we think units meet that standard of performance we're setting out to achieve. Um, I mentioned the example with site, but there are other examples throughout UPCS where item and area weights could sometimes cause less important defects to disproportionately factor into the score. Um, I mentioned this morning, we want you to maintain great outdoor areas for your residents to spend time in. Um, but we don't want to have that single site defect result in a 15 point deduction for you. Um, we want you to concentrate on the condition of the units. Doesn't mean we don't want you to also concentrate on that, that, that inside area, things like common areas or that outside area we want to just make sure that the attention right is focused in the unit. And we'll talk about how the scoring methodology does that. Um, under Inspire, um, we have a very simple, what we call defect impact weight table. So that's based on the type of defect. So the four defect categories that Cliff went over a little bit ago um, to jog people's memories, right? Life-threatening. Severe non-life threatening, moderate and low, those are the four. But also the location, the three locations. So if I multiply three times four, I've got 12 boxes in my defect impact weighting table that you'll see in a second. So I mentioned I wanna talk a little bit about some of the driving policies and thoughts that we had in developing the scoring. And for us, there are really kind of four big policy drivers, four big objectives we had. One, accuracy. Um, Dominique mentioned that this morning. We want the score to accurately reflect the condition of the property and the condition of the units, especially. Consistency. When UPCS was created, um, HUD actually spent a good chunk of money. We hired an engineering firm. We went out and they demonstrated that two inspectors showing up at a property within about 24 hours of each other would get consistent results. That consistency is still very, very important to us. Um, it's critically important that we have clear standards, as Cliff talked about, that's where we think the consistency starts. But then in also having training for our inspectors, making sure they're looking at the things we need them to look at, making sure they're learning and getting up to speed on Inspire, uh, but it also, things like information technology. Um, and Kevin and Marcel will talk about how our new Inspire um, 
technology app, our inspection app, promotes consistency because in certain cases, there's only one right answer you can get to as you move through the, the, the app. And yes, I heard somebody say decision trees. It uses decision tree logic, right, to get to that point. Um, third principle, transparency. I want you to understand, we want you to understand why and how you got the score you're getting. Um, and we're going to go so far as to, in future iterations of our inspection app, if you use it, and I'm sure your technology partners will do the same, build the calculation logic into the application. So if you're doing your own self-inspection, you can see what you score. And actually, you'll, I think you'll find once the scoring notice comes out, um, you could calculate your score pretty easily using an Excel workbook or even a sheet of notebook paper depending on what defects are observed on the property. So that transparency is really important to us. We want you to understand what is driving your score, in part because this last principle, right? And I said this before, we want our scoring methodology to be an instrument of policy, right? So if you understand how your score is calculated, that will hopefully drive your maintenance decisions. That'll drive capital expenditure decisions. You'll be able to say, you know what? I don't want one of those defects because I know that defect is going to result in a big time point deduction for me. So those are the four principles. I'm going to reiterate those. Accuracy, consistency, transparency, and supportive of our policy objectives. OK. So similar to UPCS, we are going to continue to use a 0 to 100 point scoring system. Um, and we are going to start at 100 points, effectively. Uh, and then depending on what defects are observed, right, that then has an impact on the score, right? You start taking deductions. And so that's a similar feature to the way UPCS scoring works. Um, and so the presumption, right, is, and we hope this is the case, and I mentioned those outliers where we have properties that score zero on units and pass their inspection. We have some great outliers, too. Those are the properties that score 100 points. We don't have a lot of those every year. We have several thousand that actually score above a 90, which is outstanding. Several thousand that score above an 80, which is great. And we thank you for your hard work in maintaining those, those properties to achieve those scores. And we know you all take great pride in your scores. Um, but it's really important, right, that um, when an inspector goes on site, that they focus on the inspection, they observe the deficiencies based on the new standards, um, and then once you see what that list of deficiencies is, you can crosswalk those deficiencies to your score and very easily understand how your score um, was calculated. So um, health and safety make up the majority of inspired deficiencies. Cliff talked a little bit about this uh, a little bit ago. Um, we removed a number of what have traditionally been called cosmetic or appearance-related defects. Um, and so the proportion of defects that are what we consider health and safety defects are much higher under Inspire than they were under UPCS. And that reflects, right? That's what we care about, health and safety. Um, then depending on those observations and how we value those observations, those deficiency observations, we also got to normalize, right? Because we do continue to use, and we will, we are proposing to continue to only inspect a sample of units, right? So um, that means, right, larger properties, we inspect more units. The more units we inspect, the more deficiencies an inspector is likely to find. Fewer units that get inspected, the fewer units an inspector is likely to find. So we got to normalize it by the sample size of the property. And that's similar to the way UPCS works today as well. Um, but there are some of those really wonky things under UPCS that can affect particularly smaller properties. OK, so I mentioned the 12 categories, right? Um, and it's actually not so much 12 categories, but 12 boxes. We have our deficiency classifications on the left axis here. Up above. We have the location. 
And Cliff, I'm going to ask you to slide this way a little bit. And I think I'm going to grab this chair so everybody can see. I know there's TVs out there as well. Try not to fall off the stage. Um, so um, I really like this chart. Now, these are examples of actual inspired deficiencies, right? But one of the reasons I like this graphic, right, is it shows how we're going to be evaluating and valuing our deficiencies, right? So if I start here on this bottom left-hand corner, that's a low deficiency that's located outside. Under our scoring methodology that we're proposing, those types of deficiencies are gonna have the least impact on your score. If I come over to where Tara is, and I'm not gonna stand on this chair because I will fall off, and I go all the way up here, right? If I see a life-threatening defect inside a unit, that's gonna have the most impact on my score. And I mentioned during Cliff's presentation, once we have the standards finalized, we will be publishing a cheat sheet that shows the deficiencies by each one of those four categories, as well as the standards already have this. Um, we're just gonna aggregate them for you. Um, certain deficiencies may only be able to be located in certain places. Um, a lot of deficiencies will cover more than one area. So where we talk about, right, plumbing issues, for example. You can have plumbing issues in the laundry room, which is in the inside area, because it's a common area. You can have plumbing issues in the unit. You can have plumbing issues outside, right, with a, a hose that's leaking and causing some issues. Um, interesting story from our most recent uh, Inspire Get Ready session that we didn't think about. And this is, this is, this is kind of a cool revelation for all of us. Um, we were in Hawaii. Um, I know, don't feel sorry for us. Um, and I asked the question to the audience. I said, does anybody have units that open directly to the outside, right? They have a courtyard or a veranda area. Well, they, they actually do. They have lots of those. Well, that has implications for certain deficiencies, like carbon monoxide, right? Do you need a carbon monoxide detector outside of a unit that opens to the outside? Um, and I'll let Cliff answer that question. Um, but it's something that we're evaluating. But more revealing, we went to a property where every laundry room was located outside. Every unit had a separate washer and dryer located outside. Um, and that has implications, right, for what deficiencies um, our inspectors should be observing, right? Very unique scenario. Um, but we might see that in other tropical climates, right? Where there's certain property attributes that are outside of the property that might traditionally be inside of the unit. Um, so um, we will be sending these out. And like I said, we'll be posting all of these to the website. Um, but I, I, this, is a, this is one of my favorite tables because it, it, to me it clearly shows that every single one of our defects is gonna fit into one or more of these boxes, right? And when it fits into more than one of these boxes, it's because the standard or the deficiency applies to, like I said, those plumbing issues can be observed outside, inside, or in the unit. And I see people taking pictures, so I'm gonna back away for a second. All right. Get my clicker here. Okay. So this is notional, um, but the key point here is that these asterisks reflect the relative values of our defect impact weights. Totally notional. And I'm gonna stress that by saying you won't be dinged one asterisk or one point <laughs> if you get one low deficiency outside. This asterisk will be replaced with a value. These asterisks will be replaced with a value, right? And so it shows, right, that those Life-threatening defects inside of the unit are going to have the biggest impact on your score. These low deficiencies that are observed outside will have the least impact on your score. And all of these asterisks will be placed with a numeric value. So what that means, right, is when we conduct an inspection, every single deficiency that's observed and let's just say there's three deficiencies that are observed. Let's say this is a great property, right? Let's say we observed one moderate outside, 
let's say, one severe non-life-threatening inside, and we'll say one low inside of a unit. So this, this property is probably going to do pretty well, and I'm, I'm using a very simplified example. That one defect that's located outside, that low in that low category, it would be multiplied by this value. If I had two of these, it would be two times whatever this value is. But we only have three, right? And so we said that there was one severe non-life threatening inside. There will be a value that replaces these asterisks. So that one deficiency would be multiplied by that value. And then we had one, did I say low or moderate? I can't remember. Moderate. We had one moderate that was inside of the unit. Similar, right? That one defect would be multiplied by the value inside of here. And so you can see as you go up and to the right, the values are going to get higher. And we will be publishing those values in the scoring notice, hopefully later this month. Um, and you can also see here the remediation time frame. So these top two categories, we expect them to be remediated in 24 hours. The 30-day remediation for this moderate category, and then the low, um, is, you know, these are items we want you to be aware of, um, we want you to fix, uh, but um, no specific remediation timeline for those at this point. Okay, um, once we catalog those three defects that we saw and multiplied them by their corresponding weights, we would add those sums up and get a total sum of defect points, right? Um, this principle under number one, step one of the we call it three-step, it's really four-step, and I'll talk, I'll talk to you about the four-step here in a second. Um, then we're going to size adjust it, right? Because if we inspect more units, we're likely to observe more defects. So we got to right-size it based on the sample of units that we inspect. And then lastly, um, we would subtract those, side, those size-adjusted defect points from 100 to calculate a 0 to 100 point score. There is a four-step. Um, which future versions of this PowerPoint will include. And that's what we call the unit standard of performance. Um, and so after we do steps one through three, we will evaluate how many defects and what, you know, how many points those defects located inside of units um, account for the impact on the score. And if the points cross a certain threshold, um, which will also be included in the scoring notice, we would then say that we believe, based on the observations that are in units, that the units don't meet our that unit standard of performance that we're talking about. So that's the fourth step. Um, and so in that case, what would happen, right? Let's say the property scores above a 60, but the units score below that unit standard of performance that property we would propose to set the score automatically to a 59. So it becomes a failing property effectively. And of course, we expect lots of comments on this, and we encourage them. That'll make it better, like I said. Um, but this is addressing Congress's concern that we have properties that pass our inspections with failing units. Um, it addresses our human concern, right, that we want residents living in quality units, right? We want quality, safe, and healthy units. Okay, some other features of the proposed scoring. So um, we are maintaining the zero to 100 point scale, like I said, and that's reflected all the way to the right. But over the years, I've been asked, and I think some of you have had these discussions as well, and I've heard that some of you have these discussions after your inspections, um, oftentimes. What's the difference between, you know, Dash Sheriff, and I've been asked this by members of Congress, can you tell me what the difference between a 90 and an 89 is? Can you tell me what the difference between a 80 and a 79 is? More importantly, can you tell me the difference between a 75 and a 65? Um, and there's, as you all know, particularly those that are very familiar with this, there's lots of ways to get to certain scores under UPCS, depending on what defects are observed. So it's really, really hard to answer that question. But more importantly, we've been asked, what does a 90 or above mean? What does an 80 or above mean? And so um, I've had two members of Congress say, you know what would be really great, HUD, REAC, is if you guys could move to a Yelp system of scoring properties. 
Uh, we're not going that far. We're not proposing to go that far. Um, I love Yelp, but um, I'm not sure it's the best scoring methodology for our physical inspection program. But what we are proposing is to add kind of notional or add, add descriptive grades and descriptions of what these types of properties are and, and what that score actually means. Um, and I'll just say, at some of our past get ready session stops, some people love the grades, some people hate the grades, uh, some people are indifferent about the grades. I'm, I'm sure you'll let us know how you feel, and we definitely want to hear how you feel. Um, but I want to focus on a couple of important points, right? So we mentioned that we're maintaining 321. So certain aspects of our scaling remain the same, right? So property scores 90 or above, it's going to get inspected the least frequently. Every three years we're proposing. Properties that score between an 80 or over an 80, an 80 or above, um, but not a 90, uh, they will get inspected every two years. We're proposing to maintain that. But then once you fall below an 80, right, that's when you get inspected more frequently. Um, and typically, you should be inspected once a year in those circumstances. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, right, we have properties that score 60. And we're still going to consider 60 um, to be our failing threshold. Um, and oftentimes, if a property scores below a 60, we might come out and do a reinspection. And if it scores below a 30, we almost 100% of the time do a reinspection, um, unless there's something significant moving on or going on, like a, like a disaster or something that was not factored in. Um, and there's other circumstances. Sometimes property ownership changes hands, and we know that that's going to happen. Um, and so we may not do a reinspection in certain of those cases. But um, Tara also mentioned two other things in the policy section today that I want to highlight, right? That Properties that score consecutive 60s will be automatically referred to our Departmental Enforcement Center. At least that's what we're proposing. And properties that score 30 or below on a, on a single inspection will be referred to our Departmental Enforcement Center. Um, but what does this mean, right? Our grade A properties, they're our best properties. Our properties that score 30 or below, they're our worst. And, um, but what we're also trying to say, right, is what are the implications of these scores? What should we do with the information? What should you all do with the information? Scoring has an impact on so many things that affect you all, right? It affects, of course, the frequency by which you get inspected. If you're in the public housing program, it has an effect on your FOS score. Uh, and FOS is not changing at this point in time, so your physical inspection scores will continue to be rolled up into that 40-point FOS indicator. And for public housing properties, as you know, public housing agencies, as, as those that are on that side of the, the, the program know, if you do well on FAS, you can be eligible for a high performer bonus on your capital fund. So that's a big implication that scores have. Um, scores also have an impact on your ability to apply for certain grant programs that HUD has. Um, sometimes our NOFOs um, say, you know what, you can't apply for this grant money if you're a substandard property or substandard under FAS. Um, it also has an effect on repositioning. Um, and we hear about that all the time, right? Um, I get lots of calls from folks saying, I'm worried that you know, React's going to show up, and this property is slated to have a closing soon. And if I don't get a good score, you know, that could impact my ability to close on a repositioning deal, right? So scores are really important, and, and we take them seriously. Um, and I know you take them very seriously as well. You take great pride in them, like I said. Um, but what we're trying to reflect here, right, and I'll, I'll use the example with this grade D, you know, challenge condition with high prevalence of health and safety defects that may not be easily addressable. Close monitoring is needed. Um, and so this is what we want to tell people to focus on, right, when they see a score that is between 60 and 70. It's technically a passing property, but let's not kid ourselves. If the scores are accurate, it needs work. Now, I want to take a moment to take a step back and say and acknowledge um, you know, probably what a lot of you are thinking right now. We fully understand that funding has been a challenge, right? We understand that this is an aging portfolio, um, both in public housing and multifamily. 
And we know it can be tough to keep up with that deferred maintenance. And I'm sure you've seen many of the same studies that I've seen. Uh, we know we have a capital backlog in the billions of dollars. Um, and certainly, uh, there were proposals on the table under Build Back Better and have been other proposals in the past to try to bring some more cash to the table to help you know, bring our properties up to the conditions we expect. Um, there may be some properties, and, and I just want to say this, because I've talked to some of you that have these. 60 years old, sometimes even older, you actually have a great maintenance program in place, but property hasn't been rehabilitated. Um, we know from some of the analysis that we've done that there are certain properties that, based on their age, particularly if they haven't had any rehabilitation over time, at some point, it's going to be really, really hard for them to score above a 70. And I just want to acknowledge that. That doesn't mean we don't care about the conditions in that property. That's why we're still coming out and inspecting it. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that. Um, and I mentioned this morning that we're hopeful that under Inspire, through that better data that I talked about in our value statement, we're able to present a truer picture of the condition of HUD housing to Congress, to other stakeholders, uh, because we think it's important. We think it's an important asset for our country. Um, and we all at HUD are very passionate about um, you know, the, 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 the vital need for affordable housing. Um, but we want to get an accurate picture. So there, there will be some circumstances, right, where we know properties might not be able to do as well as we, we would like them to do, right? And we are thinking about ways in terms of our risk assessment, um, in terms of other mechanisms that ideally maybe in the future we can address kind of some of those realities that you all face. Um, um, I know that oftentimes REACT scores, particularly if you don't do well, can feel punitive. Um, we don't want to play I gotcha, right? I mentioned this morning we think our objectives are very much aligned with you all. It's about providing quality, safe, affordable housing for residents. Um, and uh, typically, if you've paid close attention to our budgets over the years, um, you know that we are constantly going to the well and asking for funds, um, particularly because we know that those funding challenges exist. Um, so I don't know if the letter grades will be maintained. Um, we're still in our departmental clearance. Um, they may be in the final version of the scoring notice that you see, the draft version of the scoring notice that gets published for public comment. It may not be, right? This is just what we're proposing as of now. Our departmental clearance tear, I think, ends tomorrow or at the end of this week? It oh, it already ended. So our departmental clearance, our comment period on departmental clearance is actually officially closed. Um, we'll have to address any comments that we get, any non-concurs that we get on our scoring notice. Um, and I asked Tara just before this if she had seen any comments on the letter grades. We have not gotten the comments back from OGC yet, so we'll have to kind of wait and see um, if anybody really dislikes the letter grades internal to the building. Um, and then we got to go through our own negotiation with those uh, internal offices with HUD before we publish it publicly. Um, but, um, you know, certainly during Q&A or otherwise, um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, um, moving on to sampling. So um, the number of units that get sampled may change for some properties. Probably not by a lot. Um, just based on some of our analysis, we're seeing that for the vast majority of properties that are out there, the number of units that get sampled may only change by one unit. It'll go up, um, and I'll talk about that. Um, where our sampling will have the biggest impact, our proposed sampling methodology under Inspire, is with the larger properties. So when we created UPCS, we set out to establish a sampling methodology that gave us 90% confidence that the units we went into would reflect, the, not just the units, the units in the buildings that we went into would accurately reflect the condition of the property 90% of the time. That's what that means. It had an error rate of 6%, meaning we could be as high as 96% confident that those units reflect the condition of the property, we could be as low as 84%. Um, to be frank, we can't afford to inspect 100% of the units that you all operate. So it's important that we maintain sampling, right? Um, and we do think sampling has worked pretty well over the years. And we do think it gives us a pretty accurate representation of the property. 
Under Inspire, we're proposing to maintain that same confidence level of 90% and that same error rate of 6%. But there's one funky thing, right, that happened under UPCS. In order to get to that 90% confidence level, that 6% error rate, we should be inspecting as many as 32 units at our largest properties. We capped it at 27. Um, and I wasn't around when that decision was made, um, but my understanding was some of that had to do with funding considerations, some of that had to do with industry negotiations. Um, we are proposing to go up to 32, to actually have that true 90% confidence interval. Now, I know that people say, well, gosh, how are you going to inspect more units? You know, that, that's concerning to us, and, and certainly, please comment on that if that is a concern. Um, that being said, right, we know you guys are outstanding owners, operators of housing. You're here today because you care. So hopefully you're doing those annual inspections. Hopefully you're doing that routine maintenance. Uh, and you, you know the drill, right? When we do a sample, we can go into any unit potentially, right? Now there's some units we don't go into, right, because they're vacant or there might be rehab going on. But um, in theory, right, all of your units should be ready for a REAC inspection. Um, so um, we also think that even though we may be inspecting more units at some of our largest properties, there are significant efficiencies that we'll be gaining um, through our new technology, um, through some of the pre-work that um, Marcel and Kevin are gonna talk about where we validate the property profiles ahead of time. So it may be the case, right? Maybe not on day one of Inspire, but maybe after the first 12 months of Inspire, we may be sampling more units at certain properties, but the inspection may take less time, right? Because we're not walking 44 buildings at a property, right, before conducting the inspection. Um, so I want to move on to buildings here real quick. So um, we've talked a lot about buildings, um, and we've thought a lot about, well, should we maintain buildings as part of our sampling methodology? And we are proposing to um, remove buildings from the official mathematical sample. There's lots of reasons for this. Um, one, I'll just be blunt, we don't have great building data. Um, we, we don't. Um, the definitions of what constitute buildings have changed over the years. Some for very good reasons. When we made the conversion to asset management uh, in the mid to late 2000s under the Quality Housing and Work Responsibility Act, we had 14,000 public housing developments. But we allowed you all, if you were on the public housing side, to redefine your properties into what was called asset management projects. So we went from 14,000 properties to 9,000 properties. We've changed the definition of buildings from time to time. You guys also undertake repositioning. And so you change the configuration of your buildings sometimes. Um, and you know we've done some analysis that shows that we, if we just do unit sampling, we are likely to get into the buildings we need to see. And we will be proposing kind of some other, I just say criteria, not sampling, um, that you know, would allow us, right, to, to be able to, to get a good picture of what buildings look like. Um, and so kind of stay tuned for that. Um, but like I said, we've done some, some, done some analysis. Our analysis shows that um, if we just draw that up to 32 unit sample size, um, and like I said, most of you won't be seeing a, 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 a big uptick. Maybe um, a lot of you guys won't be seeing any change in your sample size, assuming your unit counts have remained consistent. Um, you know, that we will get into those buildings that we need to see, and we'll, we'll have an accurate representation of the condition of buildings. Um, we think this makes it operationally um, much more simple um, it recognizes that we spend a lot of time. You don't want to spend five hours with our inspectors um, haggling over uh, how many buildings are in a sample. Um, and we need to do better to get better data. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing that under Inspire. Um, somebody asked about the systems talking to each other in the future. We hope that will also be the case, so we'll have that better data. Um, so, um, but the key thing here is buildings with higher unit counts are more likely to be inspected. Um, but even those buildings with lower unit counts, um, based on our analysis, still have a 50% chance of being inspected. So that's still pretty high. And over time, we'll, we'll get into those buildings. Um, 
Lastly, because it's come up and it was commented on in the proposed rule, and uh, I, I want to be mindful of that, um, there have been proposals on the table, um, and, and I mentioned this morning that resident feedback is a key component of Inspire. Uh, one of the proposals um, that was put forward by um, some of the resident advocacy, group, advocacy groups was, you know, could residents select a certain number of units to be inspected? Um, so, as Tara mentioned, we have to be, we have to respond to all of those comments. Um, and they are public, right? So we are at least evaluating this. I don't know if we're going to do it or not. Uh, one thing I want to stress is we're very much in the evaluation phase for this potential uh, resident feedback component. We're going to start with a pilot this summer of whatever we do, but it may not be resident selected units. It may be using the feedback that field policy and management gets at their 64 field offices and saying, hey, we've got a hot property here. We need to go out and inspect it. Um, it may be a survey. Um, when we got rid of the RAS survey on the public housing side, um, we did so for a couple different reasons. One, it was very costly. Um, it was done on, I'm going to date myself, the old Scantron sheets. <laughs> And I always imagined um, in my earliest days at REAC when I was evaluating RAS survey results, um, my, my 90 plus year old grandmother like sitting over a RAS survey trying to fill out um, those, those Scantron bubbles. Um, and, and our response rate was very low. Um, and so when we created the, 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 the now 12 year old interim FOS rule back in 2011, you know, HUD, we do interim for 12 years, maybe longer. Um, we got rid of that RAS survey. Um, so uh, there's multiple things that we're looking at in terms of factoring in resident feedback. Um, you will be uh, privy to those because uh, once we do decide on something, we got to obviously make it public um, and we've got to get feedback on that. Um, and Tara had mentioned that as another notice that would fall under Inspire in the future. So. Uh, that would be something that you would all see well in advance. I want to stress, if we ever did something like this proposal, the inspection has to be objective, right? And we would not want to introduce bias into the sample, right? So um, that is something that's critically important. Um, so we have a lot of things to think about here. It's complex um, and, you know, but there's, there's a lot of different potential ways of getting resident feedback. Okay, with that, uh, we will do a quick s set of exercises. And then um, before I turn it to Marcel and Kevin, um, I want to um, end with a couple of small little things on scoring. Because we've done significant amount of analysis based on our proposed scoring methodology, and I want to share some of those observations with you all. Okay, Tara's ducking, duck and cover. <laughs> Roll if there's a fire safety issue. Okay, Let's see people filling out the questions. How are you feeling about the new scoring model? Um, most neutral, totally understandable. That's what we're seeing around the country because we haven't published as much information as we'd like to publish. And I know everybody, what they really want to know is how am I going to do under the new Inspire scoring methodology? And I'll say, if it looks like that, the methodology that we're proposing, you should be able to take your old UPCS reports and calculate your Inspire score. Um, and we're developing and thinking about doing and providing some tools in that regard to help you understand how you would score under Inspire. Okay. Uh, we have some excited folks, that's good, and some anxious folks. Hey, as the head of REAC, I'm anxious about the new scoring model, so <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to get lots of comments on it, um, but uh, we're looking forward to getting those comments. Okay, what concerns do you have with the new scoring model? Okay. 
owner-owned property and pest issues, uh, how the calculation will impact a small PHA, yep. Residents purposely damaging units. Um, so lots of uh, tenant-caused issues, still inspector interpretation, the addition of more units, uh, the weights, clarity on the calculations and specifications, um, none, this will be my first Inspire inspection. Um, so I wanna talk very briefly about um, the concept of resident-induced or resident-caused damage. Um, and also resident-owned property. Tara alluded to resident-owned property previously. Um, we are um, in discussions with our Office of General Counsel as to whether or not we can or should be citing resident-owned property in those respects. Um, stay tuned, I can't tell you what the final disposition of that is. Certainly we care uh, where there are continued health and safety issues even with resident-owned property, um, but we are, um, I'll just say evaluating whether or not uh, we should be, uh, how we should be considering those potential deficiencies or if we should be considering them at all. Um, and there, that gets into some kind of thorny legal issues that we're, like I said, talking to our Office of General Counsel about. Um, and then in terms of uh, resident-induced damage, and Tara, feel free to jump in here. Um, we are looking at like, you know, are there mechanisms in our administrative process where we could evaluate things like lease enforcement um, we also know that there are some unique circumstances. Um, we've heard a lot about um, uh, residents um, that use wheelchairs, for example, right? And uh, wheelchairs can be hard on tile, can be hard on, on, on aspects of, of the unit. Um, and so we're looking to see, all right, well, you know, we certainly don't want you to kick somebody out of a property, right? Uh, because they're in a wheelchair. Um, and that, that could send all sorts of fair housing issues, obviously. Uh, but we are looking at um, things like that. We're also looking at um, not scoring certain things. So, um, you know, we have never scored smoke detectors under UPCS. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, they, they have uh, been uh, tamper prone in the past. Uh, so we're talking about taking that same approach with like carbon monoxide detectors. Okay. All right. Okay. And then... I wanted to talk just real briefly, and I, I need to leave Marcel and Kevin some more time. So um, a couple of observations from our Inspire scoring uh, analysis. So we've, we've looked at 40,000 past UPCS inspections, and we've converted those past UPCS inspections to Inspire scores. What we've observed is that properties that did pretty well under UPCS tend to do on average, on average, because it's property by property basis, right? But on average, they tend to actually do better under Inspire. Properties that didn't do too well under UPCS, particularly those that scored below 60, tend to do worse. Um, but one common theme, and this applies to properties in any of the bands that we typically look at. We have some properties that scored in the 70s under UPCS that will now score in the 90s under Inspire. Now we have some properties in the 90s that will go down, but the properties, and this is what's fascinating me, the properties that scored in the 70s under UPCS that will now score in the 90s, based on what you've learned in the past 45 minutes or so, what do you think the primary characteristic of those properties are? Good units, they have fewer life-threatening and severe non-life-threatening defects in the units. And we have seen some really good score increases that we think validate kind of our strategy, right, with making sure we're focused on the units. Um, a lot of those properties that we saw go from the, some even from the 60s to the 90s, they were getting dinged on things like sites. They were getting dinged on other things. Um, and, but, you know, you look at their unit information and they had next to no EHNS defects in their units, right? Um, so if you want to concentrate on maximizing your score, focus on that, those categories to the top left. I'll go back real fast. Focus on those things, the top right corner. Um, lastly, um, I like this example. Um, I've got two properties, property A, property B. They both scored 80 under UPCS. One. Property A lost all 20 of its points in units. Property B lost all 20 points outside of the units and scored perfectly 
in units. Which property do you think is going to do better under Inspire? Property B. So with that, um, we will take questions. And I'll bring Marcel and Kevin up here as well. And I'll give, we, 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 this is Kevin Laviano, but we've nicknamed him Kevin Donahue. Um, he likes to walk around with the mic. He may come and ask you, you know, about your family. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the, the walking mic. Thank you. All right, guys, we're getting right down to the last session of the day. And we are so excited to be with you all still, still all day and still excited to be with you. All right. Seems like the folks are getting settled and we're going to go ahead and go ahead and get started here. OK. Kevin and I are going to present this session. Um, I'm going to kick it off and then hand it over to Kevin. Um, throughout the day, I've been coming in and just you know, being, being the, the go-between guy, and they didn't get a chance to introduce myself. So I wanted to take just a couple minutes to, to just to let you guys know who I am. My name is Marcel Hemio, the program manager for Inspire. Um, I came to HUD React relatively recently. I'm a new React person, new HUD person. Um, I think throughout my career, I've unbeknownst uh, been blessed in my career, and unbeknownst been dropped in to really like hard problems to solve. I don't know why, but um, it is. Uh, I've been blessed to travel internationally to develop standards for the international community. I've been blessed to travel all throughout the country, practically every city, city every state in the country, um, about uh, travel standards and bank standards. Um, and also been able to, within government, uh, be able to, to solve some really intractable problems that have uh, plagued the federal government for many years in the financial space and also in the HR space. Um, and these problems are hard. And truth is, I never wanted to become a federal government employee. <laughs> never did. Never did. But um, what I realized now that I am a federal government employee, and I'm a proud federal government employee, is that the problems in federal government are so massive because we, the, our mission is so, is so to, to reach out to so many people. And it's a different problem space than when you're in industry. And so I, I get now why it takes a little bit hard, longer to do things in the federal government. It doesn't make it any less. It's just it takes a little bit longer. Um, the other thing is my philosophy on things is that I believe that there are more unknown things than there are known things. Yes, I want to get to facts. I believe in getting to facts. But the world of the unknown is far much bigger. And sometimes it eclipses what we know. And it takes a certain mindset, a, ter a certain patience to, to figure this thing out. And I'm all about figuring this thing out. Yes, I'm risk tolerant to a point, right? I hold my teams accountable just like they hold me accountable. But that, that's how I, I roll and that's how I make these kinds of decisions. The other thing I really prioritize, not just in this project, but in all the projects that I've done throughout my career, is I believe in the power of data. Data, 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 data. Right? I, I don't want just what you think. Show me. Show me what you think. Let the data speak for itself. Right? We, we're at the time here with this program where we can start unleashing some of this data. And the data that we're, unre un, I guess, a better understanding in, our, in the demo is showing us a lot of things that we need to fix, that we need to address, that we need to better understand. And I think that's the power of data. And that kind of story applies to everything, everything. I think the last thing I want to mention before we get started with this is that, uh, and we've been saying this throughout the day, policy, 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 right? If we don't get the policy right, how can we expect everything else to be right? But in order to do the other things right, right, we have to be in alignment. Policy has to be right. Standards have to be right. All the things that support the policy and standards need to be right. Operations need to be right. Technology needs to be right, and all these things need to align, right? And as my role, the way I see it, is my job is to make these things align. If they're out of alignment, what can I do to bring these things together, right? That, to me, gives us a recipe for success. Today, actually in this session, we're going to talk about a service delivery model, which is a piece about what I just mentioned. 
Um, we'll get into the inspection process, what happens before, during, and after the inspection, what the benefits are, and how to get you ready for day one. Some of the things I mentioned tie into this slide here, enhanced connectivity. I, I had this great quote that one of my people who used to work for me at Treasury came up, at, she said it without even thinking about it. You can't connect the data if you don't collect the data. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant summary of what we're trying to do in Inspire with data, right? The connectivity, getting the systems. Someone asked before about um, if there was a property that moved out of one program office to the other program office, why does it get zeroed out? I have no idea why, but I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. I, I asked some of my team members earlier, like, <laughs> why is that happening? What, what do we need to do, right? Those kinds of questions are now possible because we have a platform which we'll talk to you about throughout this session that makes that possible. Enhanced operations, Kevin's got this. And then the technology piece, you know, to, to be delivering a program that doesn't have modern technology, then, then why do it, right? We are building Inspire on a cloud-based modern platform. And actually, we're building it on top of the number one customer relationship management uh, solution on the planet. Why not, right? We are serious about being better, but we can't be better unless we have the right tools to support our thinking, our direction, our approach, and our vision, right? And also the partnership teams that support us to deliver that. Hey, and Mar Marcel, I, I would add that that also extends to you all and your technology partners, and we'll talk about that as well. We know how vital technology is to your day-to-day -day housing operations. Yeah. Um, we, as I mentioned, Congress has given us funding to provide technology to those that may not be able to afford um, or, or don't use those kind of integrated third-party platforms. Uh, but we know a lot of you do, um, and we will be working with um, your partners in the, the software community and in the technology community um, to hopefully help, like I said this morning, make them successful so they can help you be successful. That's right. Win-wins. So some of the things I was saying before about like just my approach to different things is summed up on this slide, right? So getting to a digital experience isn't just a term to me. It's not. Because if it were, then I wouldn't be the guy up here, right? I, I have experienced what it takes to go from a paper-based way of thinking, doing, processing, and going digital, right? It's not simple. It is, it is a circuitous route to get to there because you're not just changing the solution, you're also changing process. You're also changing people's minds and, and the, what, what they've been used to. You've been changing, you're changing the way that people have made their careers in some cases, right? And these things are, I'm sensitive to that. Ash is sensitive to that. We are sensitive to that. We get it. And some of the feedback we've gotten from these sessions is not just, you know, go for it, go digital. Well, it's also, well, wait a minute, you know, well, what does that mean to this? What does that mean to this? I'm, and I'm sure that other session over there, they're answering, are getting those kinds of questions, right? These things are really important to us. It's not just finding a silver bullet solution and then letting that go. It's not, it's not. We're looking at this as holistically as possible. And we're looking at this together. It's not just Kevin's solution. It's not just Marcel's solution. It's not just Asher's solution. We have partners that we're dealing with and we work with them every, Weekly, weekly, we have a bi-weekly session that we have to present to Ms. Blom what we've been doing, what our blockers are, and if there are any, guess what? Those get removed. They do. It's serious. I, I don't know how it was before uh, Kevin and I started running Inspire, but I tell you now that this is serious. We are seriously thinking what we need to do how we need to do it, who needs to help us with it. In fact, it reminds me of a, of a quote I, I was thinking about when, um, when Ash was introducing herself early this morning. When, when I was young, I used to watch a lot of space because I, I grew up really poor. And I remember my, my dad saying, you know, sky's the limit, right? So we would spend time when I was a little kid looking up and seeing the stars. And so I've always had this fascination with, with NASA and with astronauts. And I came across this astronaut quote. It's a motto that they all, they all swear by. And it's really simple. It's not so much what you do, it's who you do it with. Boom. That's Inspire. That is Inspire. 
We have to integrate with, talk to OGC, our legal team, the reg team, OPPLI, IT team, the different teams within React, the different teams out, outside of React and within HUD. There, is, there are so many people that this solution interact with you all, that this, this solution interacts with, that we, we listen to it as much as we can and we are trying to do that thing which is to go forward. Ms. Blom is not kidding about that seven one day, right? We're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. I can tell you right now, we're gonna make it. If you think we're not gonna make it, stop. <laughs> we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. <laughs> and that makes me feel really good. You know why? Because the pressure's off me. It's not on me. It's on us. And I mean that with every fiber of my being. And that's what it means to go digital. The other key word here that I, I wanted to zero in on is standards. You mentioned, I, I, maybe you heard me mention this before about how standards, that's how I built most of my career. My career is built on standards. And one of the key things of any kind of standards uh, effort, anything, is uh, speaking terms, right? You have to know what you mean, what words you choose. In fact, I've been in some circles where, what dictionary are you using? Yeah, seriously, some people really care about this stuff. And we go through that. Here, it's no different. The stuff that Cliff is coming up with, and his team, it's not just Cliff, it's Cliff and his team, it's amazing. It is the only standards effort that I have ever been a part of that actually brought in a linguist. Somebody who cares about the construction of that sentence so that it is understood, it is written at, a, at the right level so that it can be broadly understood. I've delivered standards my entire career and this is the first time this has ever happened. That's real and that's really cool. That's unique to this program. And that, that didn't start with me or Kevin, it didn't start with Cliff, that was done beforehand. I think that's awesome that we have that kind of seriousness and rigor into the work that we're providing, especially something that's so central to Inspire. So that was an overview of where we're at. I know Kevin has got some amazing slides to show you what the tech is gonna look like, what the operational uh, status is, and just walk you through the rest of the slides. I'll be sitting there um, and just opining different things here and there. But before I do that, I, I wanna introduce uh, Kevin Laviano, I know, Ke I know Ash already did, but I, I introduced everybody else. I want to introduce Kevin. Um, I think so highly of this gentleman. I really do. Um, I know that there are, it's difficult. Being in this transformational space, it's hard. You're, you're either on the bullseye or you're right near the bullseye. And, and Kevin has a way of communicating all different aspects of this. And people search for him. I think this is the reason why it's so hard to get in touch with them, because he's, he's a, 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 a person that people like talking to. He's approachable. And I think that's another reason why we're successful at Inspire is because of your approach, Kevin. I mean that sincerely. You're a kind, you're a generous, you're a servant leader. And I think those are aspects that um, I know I'm grateful for. So without further ado, Kevin Laviano. Thank you, Marcel. Um, wow, these lights are bright. Um, it's overwhelming. I've been with HUD for 33 years, and I've watched webcasts of all the HUD VIPs up on the stage with this HUD logo in front of them talking about strategic goals and things that we're going to do. And here I am standing in front of you on the stage with this HUD logo, it's overwhelming um, because this is a big project. And this logo means a lot to me, and it means a lot to me in front of you, the housing providers that we're trying to work through on this very, very important initiative. As Ash indicated, um, this is a big project, the biggest project that I'm aware of since, and I've been here 33 years. I was involved in ARA, I've been involved in other big projects in the department. This is the biggest. And the reason why I think it's the biggest is it's changing everything, number one. And number two, I'm proud of this logo because I've worked for this logo for 33 years. And we make a difference in people's lives. We make a difference of where they live, where they're gonna celebrate birthday parties with their family, 
where kids get off their school bus and walk their neighborhood, but they should be safe and be proud of where they live, celebrate holidays. And we need to get this right and inspire. And this is an overwhelming project, and it means a lot to me. And it's, it means a lot to be in front of you today. And I'm proud to present to what we're doing and where we're going and the collaboration that's taken place already and the collaboration that we expect going forward to pull this off by 7-1 and 10-1 for multi public housing and multifamily. So without further ado, I'm going to start getting into the presentation here. I'm, I appreciate um, Marcel's kind words. I think um, they assigned me here because I've been with HUD for 33 years. I was a, a public housing director in Ohio. I served on the troubled agency recovery team for 10 years. So I was a customer of REACT from the field for many, many years. I dissected a lot of the REACT physical inspection reports to help housing authorities improve their scores. So I understand you know, what you've gone through in the field. And I also now work in headquarters. I was a QA supervisor. And um, you know we monitored ins contract inspectors out there. We, you know I, all, all the comments that you've made today. I've been involved in all that. So I think I'm the Swiss Army knife here at REAC, and I think they put me on this project probably because I'm the Swiss Army knife, and probably because I'm the only one that was that volunteered to say or said yes to the project. So well, but, um, this is a big project, and what we want to do is is, in, is modernize it. Right? We've done a 20 inspections for 24 years. We've learned a lot. REAC has a lot of ex expertise. Uh, within its walls, right? We have um, QA inspectors, uh, inspector experts. We have business analysts that are experts. We have subject matter expert, experts. We're gonna we're leveraging that, along with now advanced technology. We're gonna build. We have a new technology platform, like we said, Salesforce, that's actually going to allow us to build and put everything on one platform, make things more effect effective and efficient. And going on this slide here, you'll see is we want to, we're going to impact what happens before, during, and after an inspection. So I'm going to summarize, like, what we want to do before an inspection is we want to communicate more uh, fluidly and, and uh, with our program offices. A lot of program offices don't know when we're going to do their inspections. So uh, we have the technology now to be able to do that. Um, so when inspections are ordered, we're going we're gonna to notify them. and say, hey, these inspections are ordered. Does it make sense? We, I heard a comment earlier today saying that, um, hey, if we got you know a property that you know, has units that are offline, they're going under mod. We kind of catch that so late in the game. It's it's uh, it's it's confusing to inspectors and it's confusing the property. And there's this race during inspection time to do that. So we're going to try and catch that earlier. We want to collect artifacts that we normally collect on inspection day. We want to collect that earlier in the process because we're going to be building the system for that. We want to collect uh, points of contact. So right now we send out information in UPCS. And we've been testing it out in the Inspire demo. And we found ways that we're going to try and collect the right point of context going forward so the people that need to get the information get it in a timely manner and they can respond in a timely manner. And we talked a lot about this profile. And it's, it's related to scoring. We want to start verifying profiles early in the game, right? Making sure that the, we have the right profile before the inspector goes out there. And we want inspectors to get out of the profile building process while they're on site. So, and that's, that's, that's the big change that we want to make during the inspection is eliminate all this administrative process that happens during the inspections and focus, on, the inspector can focus on their core competencies, which is inspecting. And to do that, we're going to build an intuitive app. So we've learned a lot from the demo of what works in the app and what doesn't work in the app and kind of uh, make, making some adjustments. We're still making those adjustments. I'm going to share that with you uh, so for those changes. And then after inspection. I think we've all agreed that we're going to be focusing on health and safety, right? You've heard that many, many times a day. Well, we're going to have a health and safety um, a, a closeout portal. Uh, it's going to be a case management system. If we put emphasis on health and safety and we're identifying health and safety, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we close out these health and safeties during, the elect, during these uh, inspections. And we're going to build a case management system so the, field, so the properties can close them out and the, um, and the field offices can acknowledge those closeouts so we know where we are with these things. We're going to have automatic emails. We're going to have advanced analytics. So this modernization, this IT piece that Marcel was talking about before, this is the impacts that we want to make going forward. All right, so let's get into um, what happens before the inspection. Um, what, what, what we want to do is we want to start, um, when we, we know through the 3 to one rule, right, uh, that, and what, what happened in the last UPCS inspection, we know when an inspection should be taking place based on all of our rules, whether it's, you know, we apply all our, you know, small rule, uh, the small PHAD reg, if they're troubled. 
we can come up with a calculation. We, sh we should know with pretty certainty, with as much certainty from the last inspection what our new ins what the inspection schedule is going to be coming up. And so with that, we could use our technology now, and we want to start sending automatic emails to the field, whether you're multifamily and public housing, and say, hey, these inspections are going to be coming up in the next 90 days or 120 days. Take a look at them. And uh, number one, so that gives them a heads up that the inspections are going to take place. And number two, do these profiles that we're pulling from your source, from the source system, whether it's PIC or IRAMS, does it make sense? Should, and if that doesn't make sense, work with your property to make sure that those updates are made prior to the inspector going out. So this is a, a, a way we can be more transparent about inspections and also another way that we can um, you know, be proactive in making sure that we have the right information when we go out in the inspections. And certainly, if you're a field office and you're saying, that, hey, there's a flood there, or it's going through mud, or there's going to be a rat that's going to be happening in the next couple of months, we will have, you'll have the ability to say, I don't think we should be doing that inspection, communicating with REAC on the upfront basis if that inspection should be ordered. So we don't, want to, we don't waste a lot of time with inspectors scheduling inspections that end up being canceled at the end of the day. So... Um, we're going to do this by putting this in Salesforce, bringing, pulling the data from the source system, communicating with the field office, communicating also with the property, um, and, and, um, and from there, we'll make those adjustments in the source system. We'll be updating the, source, uh, the data in our Salesforce system. These will be done with through automatic emails, and um, then when, inspe when the inspection happens, uh, we will have a, you know, a, a more efficient process. We're not in, in the um, uh, profile building uh, process. Also, what the property will see, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in scheduling, is you will have an integrated dashboard that will be in Salesforce. So when you get, when, and I'll talk about what, what that means, but we're going to collect a lot of these artifacts that the inspector collects um, on inspection day in Salesforce uh, rather than the inspector collecting on inspection day. So let me talk a little bit more about inventory management. Um, it's very important. Is we are going to be relying more on uh, what is in our uh, source systems in PIC. Uh, it'll be converting to HIP and what's in IRAMS. Uh, we'll, we'll get um, uh, the, the profiles, the, the building profiles will be sent to you as the field or in the property. You'll verify those in, um, prior to the inspection. There'll be a couple bites of the apple to look at that. We will refresh our data. And when the inspector goes on inspect in, inspection day, They'll spend less time doing, and I'll explain that later on in the in, on inspection day processing, but they'll spend less time doing all this profile stuff, administrative stuff, and they'll be actually inspecting on what the source system says rather than building that profile like you see today. Okay? And what's going to happen for us to follow up on this is we'll, we'll be able to say, hey, here's a variance report back to the field office. And what that field office, the field office will say, hey, we did an inspection on December 10th. We went through this whole profile verification piece, you know, where everybody's looking at it and saying it makes sense. Spectre went out there, and there was still some sort of variance. And then we'll kind of figure out why there's still a variance and, co and correct that for the next round. But, we'll, it, it, but we, don't, we won't have uh, the, the inspector trying to figure that out, trying to apply HUD rules. That, that, that's not their uh, field of expertise. So this is what we're trying to do. We're actually working on this now. We have a meeting tomorrow on that where we're working with the source systems, making sure we're getting the right downloads. We're going to have, uh, you know, as we build more of the capacity, we'll be uh, refreshing that data regularly. And then when the inspector goes out, they should see a profile that makes sense to them and can start inspecting. So another thing that's going to happen before um, the inspection is the order, right? So now that we got the uh, inventory management piece, right, then we generate the order because we know through the IFD date that um, it's, we're using the 321. We will know which properties need to be inspected and when they should be inspected based on that IFD date. We will generate an order, and the order is important for a couple reasons. Number one, we need to know what we need to send out to our different vendors or what QA is going to do. And then number two, uh, we will then um, send that out to the field office for them to verify. Uh, it should not be a you know, very extensive uh, review, but number one, it gives you a heads up that the inspections are coming, and number two, it gives you an idea of what the profile looks like Go into PIC or IROMS, we'll take a look at it. If it matches, great. If it doesn't, hey, work with your property to get that fixed. Same thing, the property will get their, um, their integrated dashboard, access to their integrated dashboard at that point in time, and they'll have the ability to upload all these um, other pieces of parts that I'll talk about in the next slide. So, um, but ordering is going to be very important, and we'll also have the ability to do one-off ordering. So in case con a congressman comes in or there's some sort of complaints from the media or whatnot, we will have the ability to do one-off ordering, and we'll send those uh, reports, those one-off um, orders to the field for verification and also to the property itself. 
So this is some of the upfront work that we're using our technology to do that we just don't have the capacity to do right now that we're building in Salesforce. And then I'll make our, uh, you know, our systems all talk to each other and make our system more efficient, uh, our overall platform more effective and efficient. So here's a really big change. We're working on it right now. And this is the scheduling piece. Um, so what's important about scheduling is once that inspection is scheduled, um, again, the, the property will have access to their um, dashboard. We'll get an email to say, hey, this inspection is scheduled for February 10th. Here's an automatic email. Please go into your, your dashboard and make sure that all of this information is um, correct. Number one, the property profile again. We're going to keep on emphasizing that. Does it make sense? Number two, those certificates that we talked about earlier in today's inspection, those artifacts we're going to collect in this profile, um, in, in this dashboard. So the boiler certificate, the elevator certificate, the lead-based paint uh, that, um, certificates that, uh, that Tara was talking about earlier, those will be all uploaded by the property, the people that have access to that information prior to the inspection, uh, that will have the file. So we actually have the paper now, right? Currently an inspector, they don't even collect the paper, right? They look at it and they go into wrap it and they'll check yes, no, or NA. Nobody, nobody knows if it's accurate or not because no one sees it other than the inspector, right? So now we have some paper. We have some documentation. It's more meaningful. Uh, it's more helpful. We'll also have the, um, the questions that Tara was talking about. Like, uh, I think we're going to ask for like, the age of some of the properties if, they're not, if, they're, if it's missing in our source systems. We're also going to be asking about the water. Um, if there's a water alert, that'll be a question that's in there. We're also going to ask for the property POC information. So... If you're an executive director for a large housing authority, right, uh, you know, you're not the one that's going to be closing out all the health and safeties, right? But that's the point of contact that we currently have that we send a lot of information out to. So now you have the opportunity to go in there and say, hey, for property ABC, it's Joe Smith. And for property you know, XYZ, it's Mary Smith. And you can put that information in there, and then we can send the information out to the right folks. Again, we'll have more timely information, and it goes to the right folks. I see we got a question over there, so... My name is Gabrielle Van Horn. I'm with Yardy Systems. I'm with one of the software vendors. So we would like it if you would give us an API so that we can just pull this information down. We already have in our systems who the work order point of contacts are and can route them to the proper places. That would be faster, certainly, and more efficient for not only the housing authorities, but for the uh, multifamily side too. All of us, MRI, Emphasis, RealPage, Yardi, we all want the same things. So can we also take a look at that because we are also a partner? Absolutely. Uh, Marcel, we got that written down. We'll, we'll Uh, one of the reasons why we picked the platform, oh, I guess we're on, thank you, um, is that the Salesforce solution already is API fluent. So it'd be different if we'd have to build on top of it. So it's good that, that the, the, the software vendors want us to be API literate, we are. I think the, the thing that's missing would be a data exchange standard so that what we say a field is you can understand what that field is and you can map to it and then vice versa so that we can have this common exchange. Does, does that make sense? Does, it does, except that we already have, for example, units and information and there's a published protocol here, right? So I think we can understand what it is if you'll just let us get the information. So there's a building and unit inventory system so that we know what those are, and those are housed in the system of record also. Yeah. So we get that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine every vendor has probably their own definition for, for how yeah. they... We are. have a HUD definition that HUD has told us. Well, then, then it's even easier. Yeah, I, I, my, mm -hmm. again, if, if there's a, a common way for us to communicate and those line up with our fields, perfect. Then it's just a matter of making it API enabled. API enabled. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, also, this is on the multifamily side. Um, if you can have multiple points of contact, like for instance, I'm the um, president, chief operating officer of my company. 
all of the emails come to me, it needs to go to my maintenance man and my regional manager <laughs> and, and, and not me. Absolutely, so. yes. We're going to be building that capacity in there, so okay. we'll have different points of contact and who should get what. So, like, you know, some of you just want the, like, the inspection report itself. You're not right. looking for the, the actual closeout or the, 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 the portal for uh, the case management system for the health and safety. That'll be something that does all your, your work orders, right? Right, right. So, yeah, we're going to have those type of personas built into the, um, the, the, the dashboard for you to identify those folks that we can. And so when those interactions hit after the inspection, the, the, the emails will go out to the correct people. Okay, and then currently, all the emails that are coming to me uh, or to our company um, identify the property by their nine-digit realms ID. Yeah. ID. Yeah. I, be you don't know. I don't know what that is. If there's any way you could just add a property name, <laughs> that would help a tremendous amount right now. Sounds so, good. Yep. Anyway. We got that as a, a requirement. Excellent questions. Any, any more questions up to this point? So this is the stuff that we want to do before an inspection. Uh, again, I'm kind of summarize this is we're using Salesforce, all right? This is, this is a, it's a new technology. So, you know, we've, we've used secure systems for many, many years, and it just doesn't, it doesn't have the scalability or we haven't invested in the scalability, one or the other. Uh, this provides us the opportunity to do this, and everything will be on one platform now. And uh, we'll, we, we will see, you know, we'll be able to do a lot more data analytics. We'll be, a lot, uh, be able to communicate more uh, frequently with you to the right folks, to the right personas. Uh, this is great feedback that we, back that we're getting today, but we want to change what happens up front in inspection. You know, I, I've been in a lot of inspections with our QA. Uh, we spent a lot of time doing those property profile building. It's just not there. It's that it's not, um, and we and we have a lot of rejected inspections based on that as well. Uh, so I think we're we're we're, we're going to cure a lot of those uh, capabilities because we're going to get information input by the right people, and people are going to be put in the right swim lanes. So the ex experts, whether it's a, the certificates, whether it's the lead-based paint, whether it's uh, the, the inspector, um, you know, they're, they're doing what they're, they're, they're paid to do, not trying to, you know, finagle things or, or, or do workarounds on inspection day. So this, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a, uh, an idea of the different look that Salesforce is going to give you than, than, than um, uh, what you see in secure systems right now. So. Um, we're going to do training on this. Uh, we have our training vendor here that's going to be working with us. We're going to uh, so there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of um, screenshots. We're going to do training on all aspects of when you interact with Salesforce. So um, I'm going to talk a little more about training later on in the session here. But please be aware that um, we're going to have a whole toolbox of training. So all your interactions, whether it's in ordering, whether it's in uh, the case management system for the health and safety, whether it's for scheduling. Uh, we're going to do a training on that. It'll be on a webinar like this. We'll have uh, infographics. We're, we're going to make sure that if you want information on it, we're going to have it ready for you before we go live on 7-1 and 930 if you're public housing. But this kind of just gives you a flavor of it's going to be a different interaction than you're used to in secure systems. So right now, we just want to give you a screenshot of it. So this is important. Uh, I want to just talk to you about what happens on inspection day which is gonna be very, very different than what happens today in UPCS because we're gonna be doing all this upfront work. So number one, we're, we're tr trying to get out of the whole profile building business. Um, and we talked about the uh, retiring the comp bulletin. You know, and the comp bulletin goes at great length, right, of trying to do, uh, explain all these unique things the inspector has to do on inspection day that we're trying to get out of, automate and get everything all upfront. Like for instance, uh, the, you heard Ash talk about the number of buildings may not be as important and in, in, in the future inspection, uh, I mean, a scoring model. Well, if that's the case, you know, they don't have to go running around and, uh, around every building, to all four sides of it. And, um, you know, so that, that, that's going to take a lot of time. We're not going to have to do all that, especially on that scattered site. They could take two, two days, maybe three days to even just go around verifying a profile, right? The other thing is, is defining what a building is. How many times you sat there for an inspector trying to figure out, oh, is this one building or is this two buildings and everything? Our, our source systems tell us that. And because buildings are not going to be as important in the new scoring model, we don't need to get into that realm anymore, right? So that'll help out. Um, and so all the data entry. So we talked about putting all those points of contact in there and verifying everything's right. So how many times have you seen an inspector and they're going through the rapid software typing really slowly because that's not their gig, right? And um, so you know, we're going to get out of the whole data entry piece of that or most of the data entry piece. 
And like I said, we don't collect, we collect some paperwork there, and then other paperwork, you know, we just click buttons to say yes, no, and it doesn't really give us a whole lot of value, uh, yes, no, or NA. And um, like I said, I'll, I'll speak about the next thing, even on inspect, on, on, at the end of the inspection, we, we, we make the inspector write, we, we, hey, let's go find the an internet, we gotta print out the health and safety report, the EH&S report right now, it's two copies, so someone's gotta make a copy, everybody signs it, and then nobody sees that piece of paper except for the inspector, right, and, the, and the, uh, the, the point of contact. It goes into my backpack, and I have to keep it for six months, and no one ever asks for it anyway, to be honest with you. But one day somebody will ask for it, and you don't have it. So here, we're going to automate all that. So um, that's why it's important to have this, is, this modern inspection software, and I'll go into the, that what happens at the end of the day. But what happens during the inspection, right? We talked about standards. We talked about you know, being, um, having more consistency from inspector to inspector and from inspection to inspection. Well, we think our standards will help us get there, right? Because they're more uh, thorough. They, they, we've had linguists. We've talked about all that at length today. We've got people talking about it right now. There's a lot of homework that's gone into standards. But the, the app has to be complementary to that for the inspector, right? So we have spent a lot of time, and we're going to continue to spend time, on building an intuitive inspection app. Some people will call it uh, a decision tree. We call it more of a logic model. And it's still growing. It's still ongoing. But I want to talk about that next is... This is what we're building um, uh, with the feedback from our QA. Uh, they're actually getting trained on it next week as a group. Uh, this is the uh, inspection app that the federal inspectors are working, gonna be working on when they start doing some inspections in February. Um, you'll see here, this is gonna tell you this is an inside standard, okay? Uh, here, um, you'll see here was an electrical GFI. So they just click that button. You'll see we're still using the NOD, uh, OD or an A if it's applicable. So here they, they, they clicked, it's inside, number one. They clicked, it's an electrical GFI. Over here, there's, only, there's a, a few selections they can, they can make. This, this was a GFCI outlet. If I remember correctly, this was in a garage. They hit next in the app. Um, here there's only one option, but you can have several options. So here, the test or reset button is inoperable. So, why is this important? This is, this is built on how the standard that Cliff showed you earlier, how the standard's built, the app is being built the same way to help the inspector be more consistent. So if they don't recognize this, and they want to, it, it's not the test button, it's something else, they're either in the wrong standard or there's no, there's no defect for them to, to, to actually uh, detect at this point in time. So here they hit the test button, it's uh, inoperable. They take their picture. We're taking a picture of every defect. Um, they put a comment in there uh, that does not test. You'll see in the comment area. And then they hit uh, report deficiency. And then um, at the end of the report, Kevin, uh, at the end of the day, this Kevin, will be the report that's generated. Just one thing. Can you go back a slide? One thing yes. I want to make sure. What Kevin just walked through was a decision tree example where you select the area, whether it's outside, inside, or unit, and then the standards that are then populated as an option are filtered by the selection you made in the area. So the inspector, if he's outside, selects outside, they will only see the, the, the standards that are outside. That inspector can choose parking garage. If they selected parking garage, then the filter would automatically go down to only the few uh, deficiencies that are tied to that standard. That's when, when uh, Cliff was talking about decision tree model and Ash was talking, that's the example. And what that means is back to the points that Ash was making before about the four principles, accuracy and consistency, right? So if we can filter things down for that inspector based on the area, based on the standard, based on the deficiency, this is gonna introduce less inspector error. And you can see also the corrective time frame will be, is, is generated for the based on the standard as well. So. Uh, so we're trying to, again, this, this is still iterative. Um, there's more things we want to build into there. So this is like phase one of how we're building an iterative app or a, um, um, an, an app that's more intuitive, I call it. Uh, and we'll learn and we'll continue to build more features into that app. Um, and so here, this is the, uh, end of the end of the inspection. This is what this will um, actually spit out. You can, you know, the, the inspector can print this out. Uh, we did this when we were just doing a test. But like I said, this was in the garage. It has the picture and everything that we just identified in the um, uh, in that decision tree or that logic model. Makes sense to everybody what we're trying to do. So the standards are more you know thorough. 
and the Inspection Act is, is built, built on that. And then that protocol document that we're working on right now is, is in relation to that. So how our technology works and how, uh, how the standards are built, the, uh, the protocol will then, will then uh, determine, will be written as a basis on that. So the protocol will be a, a living document based on how we do these iterative processes and uh, in the, in the uh, software. So if the software has more capability or we build more capability within our iterative process in Inspire, then there might be things that we need to change also in our pro protocol document. Um, so that's why it's gonna be more of a living uh, document for us going forward. So what happens after the inspection? Um, so I kind of talked about like right today in a UPCS inspection, what happens is, you know, we gotta print, we gotta print out the EH&S. We got, uh, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to find a printer or, you know, it's, it's hard to um, get internet access. So now um, here, our capability is, is we'll have the ability for the EH&S form or the health and safety form to be signed electronically on the iPad or their, or their, or their iPhone. And now we'll have actually the signature actually recorded somewhere. We, we, if it's not somebody's backpack just waiting for somebody to ask for it. We know somebody signed for it if anybody asked for it. It's part of our rec and the inspection record. Um, also, that we talked about the point of contacts earlier. We'll, we'll have somebody's a point of contact. Who should get the email for the health and safety case management system to be emailed to so they can start working on the, um, the case management? You know, because a lot of times, as you know, we're doing inspections, right? That they know it's a health and safety guy doing 24 hours. Somebody's already writing it down or radioing in their, you know, the tw uh, a, a work order. They, that person can also start, you know, looking at that because that link will hit our system, and then I'll I'll send it out an email, and you have access to the portal, uh, and you can start doing your work. Um, we'll also give automatic email reminders, stuff that you just don't get right now. That will so we'll say, hey, you've had these defects in here, you haven't put, put anything in for 72 hours. Better do it because the field office is going to follow up with you next. Um, we're going to give you more inspection, uh, robust inspection reports. So. As I told you, I was an end user for uh, UPCS for a long period of time. Uh, the inspection reports are very detailed, but it's, it's sometimes the value there is, is, I mean, how many times are you going to look at a, a broken electrical outlet or, you know, weeds growing through a fence, right? We, we want to give you more analytics to that, a more robust inspection report, cobbling the information in a different format. So uh, we have a, a team that's working on that right now, getting feedback from public housing and multifamily properties. Like, what would be more meaningful you, for you in a report? Like... I'll give you an example. When I was in the field, many inspection, many of us can't get out to some of our properties for years, right? Uh, so the, the, the only HUD person or HUD representative that actually goes out to one of these properties every one to three years is an inspector. So maybe getting some you know, panoramic views of what the property looks like would be helpful. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what, that, what is going to be most meaningful to you as a stakeholder, whether you're a pro program office or your uh, property that gives you an idea of what we're looking at and how your property condition score meets and what, what, what uh, you know, if there's any inquiries from the media, we can take a look at, especially if the field office can't get out there. Um, we're gonna have more dashboard ability and analytics because everything's now on one system. So, does that make sense to everybody? I, go ahead. So is, is the inspection report there right now? Because I cannot, I cannot get a demo? paper inspection. And, because that's so important, not only for us to manage all the findings on site, but I'm sending it to third parties, and so they don't have access to the the um, digital side. And we have an inspection report. It's not. Off. We're going to be getting it to you once we add the scoring element to it. Okay. Um, so stay tuned. But you will get that. So okay. You'll get the results of your demo inspection uh, along with the with the, uh, the advisory score or the practice score. I'll call it. Great question, though. Um, how does everybody feel before I go on to the next piece about like how we're trying to modernize before, during, and after an inspection? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think you know we've learned a lot, right? I think we're now we have the system capability. I think it's going to make a big difference of what happens on inspection day and making it more efficient and effective going forward to give you better information. Yes, come up to the microphone so we can hear you reiterate so that everybody understands today this doesn't integrate with anybody's system of record I'm going to ask again that you prioritize that for all of us so that people can just download the inspection do their work orders wherever they are if it's PHA web emphasis don't care and then upload it back to you 
So please, I, I implore you to work on those APIs. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. And, and um, I know we will continue to talk, but that is definitely a priority. Um, prior to the break, um, we had an all-day kind of meeting planning session. Um, we've started the process um, of uh, trying to public, uh, uh, publish our technical specs uh, as well as other information, including our decision tree logic. Um, and then we'll be doing those, um, that field UAT with you all, with other vendors that are interested so that they can start getting to see the software and, and uh, roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty as quickly as possible. Got a question come up now. Um, for the pre-inspection steps, do they start day one of the now 28-day notice, or do they start sooner and then at some point sooner. day one starts? So we talked about this yesterday. Uh, once we do the order, we're going to give you access to the, the, the property uh, dashboard right away so you can start inputting stuff at that point in time. So when we do the order and we're looking at the property profile, and we're sending it to the field office. We'll also send a link to the POC and say, here's your property, um, here's your dashboard. Uh, you, know, you can start looking at your profile. You can start putting in your certificates. But the inspection's not scheduled yet. It's just we're ordering at that point in time. But at least it gets us ahead of the game. Um, uh, so, you know, but we want, we, we want to give as much timeline. And you'll have access to that throughout the whole system. It, but we want to, you know, give you that reminder once the order is generated. Okay, so what are you thinking time? I mean, do you it have any be, sense of? It could be six months beforehand. Yeah. It could be, because um, uh, right now we give ourselves, if, if I remember correctly, Tara, right now it's six months before or after for the first year, and then I think it's 90 days? Yeah, yeah 90 days. So at a minimum, if, if the first year it could be six months, and then from that point forward it could be around 90 days or probably 120 days before your, uh, you know, your yeah. IFD date is. Oh, but still tied to the ideal date. It's not necessarily yeah. Yeah. tied. So you still yeah. really don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, no. so <laughs> yeah, I think um, the way that I like to think about it, I mean, we can we typically order our inspections between three and six months ahead of time. So let's say that order occurred six months before your ideal future date. The dashboard would be open. You could start doing the property, submitting the property profile information. And we could go through that process as early as that order occurs. But then sometime in that six-month window, you're going to get a 28-day notice okay. that says your inspection is scheduled for 28 days from now. Okay, done. Yeah, and you'll get a note of notice when an inspection is scheduled. Just right. says, hey, just go back in there and take a peek. Make sure your property profile looks good and your, yeah, you haven't a chance, had a chance, had, have not had a change in your POCs or, um, you know, or if a certificate that you put in there earlier expired, update your certificate. If that makes sense. So... So give or take, when you find out it's been ordered, yeah. you should assume you're going to have an, ins you're going to get an order, I mean, you're going to get a notice of inspection a few months, minimum, you know, yep. within a few months. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I, I would just say um, the way the new process is going to work, you'll still have the official, let's just say, I mean, we're not having any discussions of going back down to 14 right. days, so you'll still get that formal 28-day notice. But um, because we're doing some pre-work, you're probably going to mm -hmm. get a better idea earlier that your inspection is coming up exactly. within that right. three to six month window. Right. right. Thank you. All right. Kind of talked about this at length. I just want to make sure that, you know, um, that we emphasize that um, both public housing and multifamily will have access to this uh, closeout of the health and safeties. Because, as you know, we, we, we talked about this at length, that health and safety is our priority. Closing it out has got to be a priority. So we are built a case management system in Inspire for this. And you'll get uh, notifications from us, and there'll be follow-ups and dashboards. So uh, you'll expect that, and we'll do a lot of training on that going forward. Um, here's kind of how it looks. So when you're in there, um, this is... Uh, uh, if this is for a property, they submit the evidence of the mitigation, you'll get a receipt that says your property, uh, the evidence has been submitted. There's a um, place that you can put pictures in there, uh, but the, the evidence that we want is the work order. The work order's gotta make sense to what the inspector found and what the comment is and what the work order resolved. And that's what the property, and that's what the field office needs to do next, is they just look at it and say, all right, I got a defect. Uh, this is what the inspector said the defect was. Here's what the property 
put in as, as their work order? Does it make sense? Is it the right unit? If it is, we move on, and then they would they would get the same thing. They would just approve, or we might just say acknowledge, because uh, uh, the the mitigation at that point in time, and then that closes out that 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 piece of inspection. So we want to see at the end of the day we'll have analytics on this. Is that once these inspections start happening, and we see in, uh, defects that are identified, they have the 24 and the 30 day timelines in there. We'll be following up to make sure that there's a closure to all of this and giving reminders to, the, to you as a property and then the program officer, the field office is the monitor this as well. We talked a little bit about appeals. We want to do smart appeals. Uh, we want to use technology to help us with appeals. We want to get out of the business of you mailing, you know, big gobs of paper to, to react and somebody going through all that. So uh, we are in the process of working our way through um, uh, the administrative notice and how we're going to do this. but. Appeals will be submitted in Salesforce, and as Ash indicated, we'll either have some bubbles or say, here's your defects, here's what you want to appeal, you hit a bubble on there, and then you would submit the documents associated to why you think you should not be, uh, you should not have been um, uh, identified as a defect in your property for that particular defect. And uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have the ability now, because it's in our system, to track all those, monitor the timelines, and figure out if we're missing information, and have communications back and forth with you. So we're working on that. That should, uh, we will have that capability ready for our 7-1 delivery date. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of how we're going to pilot all that in a moment. Yeah, and I, I would say one other thing here. Um, you know, I've heard stories of appeals taking six, nine months. Um, we plan on cutting those down as well. Um, you should be able to kind of transparently see what step in the appeals process your appeal's in. And um, we need to hold ourselves to a better um, service standard um, in terms of processing those appeals. Um, so uh, that goes, the technology will certainly help in that regard, but um, that's also something that we're looking at. Yep, absolutely. So here's, an idea, uh, here's some you know, uh, examples of a dashboard that we can pull out, and we're going to have lots of types of these dashboards for you as a program office in the field. This is uh, one for our, actually the demo. Uh, just telling us how many inspections have we taken place, how many defects that, that, that have been identified in these inspections, um, and you know, uh, the inspection uh, frequency for a certain number of weeks. Um, and here, just to get an idea of just some of the things that we were talking about is like what we're seeing in the demo right now and learning. The demo is a, is a learning process um, and helps us with our you know, policy making. And so out of the 2181 here, it's about 24 health and safety defects in total. Uh, per a, a demo inspection, just to kind of ballpark it for what we're seeing right now. So, um, you know, as, as a program off, program officer, try to close these out, probably a cup of coffee, and go through, look at your uh, look, look at what was submitted by the property, and you should be able to close all those out very quickly. Here's some more analytics that we could provide out of this uh, that we that you know we just don't do right now, but uh, but we but we have the capability now. So you can see now the most time the most common occurring life life, life threatening defects. Uh, our smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. So you can see from our, from our questions that we had earlier with the standards, no surprise there, right? Because we're now we're requiring smoke alarms in every bedroom and uh, carbon monoxide. There's a lot of questions on that. And we're build, building decision trees. So, um, but we can continue to monitor this, see changes, and we can you know analyze our policy. Uh, this will be helpful for us, and we can share this with program offices. We can share it with industry groups as well. Um, so uh, this is, you know, we can break it down, as Ash indicated, by the different categories that, um, that you can see it's in scoring. So we can you know, provide special technical assistance on that, how we can start mitigating these things and make the inspection process a little bit more effective and efficient. But this is all the great information we can pull out without having everything all on one platform and, um, and, and using the technology to leverage uh, the information that we can share back with you and make good decisions. So. Um, in, in summary, uh, before I get to the next piece, is you know there's a lot of things that are uh, that I think beneficial for properties. Number one is you know, just more coordination up front, more coordination up front when inspection is going to happen, um, getting the right people, uh, not having a, an exercise on inspection day that's kind of choppy. And, you know, the inspector's not even starting their inspection at sometimes two, three hours in an inspection, and sometimes they don't even get the right inf information anyway. So this will help us get the right information. We're going to have smart appeals. We're going to have a case management system now for health and safety. Uh, we'll have a, a, a advanced uh, a analytics for you to monitor your portfolio, monitor where your closeouts, uh, have automated emails for reminders. It'll help us in React. It'll help the field to monitor this. Um, 
So there's a lot of advantages of properties, you know, once we get this all up and running. Um, and we're getting the right information to the right people in a timely manner so that they can make the right decision points. Um, and then for the field office, same thing. Better collaboration, you'll know when inspections are gonna happen. Same thing, you'll know what the status uh, is on your health and safety closeouts in the field office. Um, you can, you know, we'll have analytics for you to monitor your portfolio. Um, and, we'll, and for both public health, both for the field and for the properties, you, you should have an enhanced inspection report that gives you a lot more information rather than just a list of, of, of defects per, per building and per unit. Sound good? All right. So let's talk about preparing for day one. Got a couple slides here and then we're gonna wrap it up. Um, so this, there's a lot to this slide. I'm, I'm not gonna spend a, you can see we spent a lot of time learning. In fact, that learning July, August, and September is pretty much um, a lot longer than that. We've been learning for a while. Uh, we were learning during COVID, but we've done a lot uh, because uh, during that time frame, we were building a lot of IT. So uh, we did some IT releases uh, by the end of September. So stage two, we did some testing. So remember I showed you that inspection app. We went out and did some inspe uh, inspections with our QA using the federal inspection app. We said, hey, you know what? We're just not there yet. And we, did, uh, we went back and did our homework and we enhanced the app. So we just did a release on the app in December here. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on um, evaluating how it, uh, our, our protocol should be uh, designed and refining the scoring model. We were refining the standards as Cliff's talking about there right now. So a lot has happened in this stage two. We're getting to stage three, very close. We're, we're training our QA next week on the federal inspection app. We still have demo inspections going right now, so we're learning what's happening in, in the demo. And then we're gonna start testing our scoring. We're gonna start, and our sampling coming up here because it'll be released in February. And we're gonna start getting stuff um, uh, I, I call it a phase one pilot from like February to the middle of April. Uh, to see where we're at, we're gonna be using some QA on that uh, uh, to, to help us with that testing and the pilot stage. Then we're gonna pivot over with when there's another release that's gonna have all the scheduling, uh, ordering piece, um, all those upfront pieces I was just talking to you about and some of the back end pieces that are missing. That'll be a release in April. And we will actually be doing a dress re rehearsal from the end of April to, to probably middle or late June to make sure that we work out any bug. So if you're a public housing authority and you're gonna get a, an inspection in July, we're gonna use this pilot period, phase one and phase two to work out any requirement deficiencies that we, that, that we have blind spots on right now for. And we're also gonna be using the information that we're getting back from the demo and some of our test inspections to the pilot to make you know, tweaks to our standards, protocols, and app um, capabilities. Now. Uh, you'll see here um, that what's missing on this slide, and I'm going to go to the next slide, is our go live is going to be July 1st. And we are then, what, what we haven't talked about is training. So here's our next slide. It is we got a lot of training that's got to come out in the next four, four, five to six months. Uh, we're building a lot of that capability right now, so, uh, but it's, um, I would expect most of the training to be coming out in late February. Uh, to that April time frame, you know, where we'll start really uh, getting a lot of the information out to you. So we'll start training some inspectors on standards in February. We'll be doing some protocol training to inspectors uh, to get them associated with Aspire. And uh, that, that time frame, we'll be doing office hours. So those trainings will happen in the evening. So if you're an inspector, you're like, how am I gonna get training? We're gonna be Cliff, myself, Marcel, and the team will be you know, working with you at seven o'clock to eight o'clock or 8.30 at night on Eastern Standard Time trying to do some office hours with you to educate on standards, educate on the protocol, and eventually the inspection app to get you ready to go. Also, we'll be doing office hours with program offices when we start talking about what's your role in the Inspire process and with properties, what's your role in the, in the Inspire process. Uh, we'll also have infographics for you, webinars, so, so all the stuff that Tara talked about earlier when it comes to the final rule, the standards notice, the administrative notice, um, oh my gosh, the scoring. scoring notice, I knew I was missing one of them. Um, those will all have webinars associated with it. And um, again, uh, important um, infographics and we'll offer office hours for you to ask questions to our team here on you know, what, the, what it means uh, and how we can clarify things for you. We'll be posting it all on our Inspire webpage, if you can see at the bottom here. Uh, we will have a toolbox for you. Uh, so as we update things, 
uh, would be putting it on there for you. And um, you could go in there, and if you got insomnia and you want to read a whole bunch of standards, you can click on the box there and start reading about the standards or a protocol. But um, we're gonna we're gonna try and make it as, as give you as much information as possible from this mid February all the way to Jul um, July first. And if you're a multifamily, you'll have a little bit more time frame. Same thing with our Q, uh, our past. We, we uh, once we uh, our past team will be training them as we start rolling out these modules uh, during these releases. So there's going to be a lot we're, a lot of activity here in React about training, informing everybody what we're doing and uh, on the new IT system that's going to be driving the operations for our inspection platform going forward. And with that, I think we covered everything. Here's our key takeaways. Again, we're gonna have that enhanced tech, uh, connectivity and which will enhance our operations. Um, you know, like I said, we, the exciting thing about this is everything's all on one platform now. We'll be able to you know, share information, we'll be able to pull analytics. Marcel, is, he's a master when it comes to the data and data analytics. He shows me stuff, I'm like, I don't know how you did it. There's just too many numbers and equal signs and all that stuff that I don't get. <laughs> I, but uh, I just use my program. I'm like, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. but. It's amazing what Salesforce can do. I didn't know anything about Salesforce when I came over to React. Um, I just knew Salesforce advertised a lot on the PGA tour, and that sounded like an exciting thing. But now I've been in more Salesforce meetings than I ever thought I'd be in, and I'm a believer. I really believe it's going to really be uh, uh, beneficial for us in the long run, uh, and it's the right uh, technology for us to modernize our inspection platform going forward. And I think it's, it'll be exciting for us as we move together as we um, improve the inspection system going forward. A lot of people here, as I said at the beginning when I introduced myself, is, uh, are depending on for us to get it right. Uh, and we'll get it right. Uh, we need your feedback. Uh, we need cooperation. We need collaboration. This is a heavy, heavy lift. Um, I listened to Marcel talk and Ash talk before. Sometimes I sit in my chair. I'm like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, uh, I guess I must have gotten myself something good. I'm standing up here in front of you, That's again, right. in front of this HUD sign where all the VIPs that I watched for the last 33 years talk to us in the field about what we're gonna do that's unique and exciting, and now I'm doing it with you guys. So um, I'm proud to be here. I'm here to help. Um, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from Inspire that's gone up for, for a lot of us. I've been doing it for almost four years. Uh, I, I dream about Inspire, sometimes in good ways, <laughs> and sometimes in bad ways. Uh, but um, you know, I, I, I wanna see this through fruition. Um, and um, we can only do this in partnership and collaboration. It can't be done by a few people. And I uh, really want to appreciate your participation. I know the last thing you want to do is hear Marcel and I talk when you, when you guys could have been going home on the Metro or getting home to your families. But this was important stuff. This is, the, this is how we do it. And we're going to get there. Yeah. So, so thank so, you for your attention. So, so speaking of that collaboration and partnership, we've got two more QR codes. And then I, you guys can get going. Um, these are, uh, the, particularly the second of these two is the most important because it's the feedback on today's session. Um, while you're doing um, the QR codes, um, I want to give a special thanks to our amazing um, team here at um, HUD uh, that have helped us with um, this outstanding presentation today. Um, lots of people working hard behind the scenes, Ashley and her team. And so we are extremely grateful to them for um, helping make this such a professional um, uh, event. So, Thanks, guys. and they want to go home. So um, <laughs> we, we, uh, well, this is the last bit. But um, while we're waiting, you can certainly ask questions, and um, uh, some of us will stick around afterwards too if you have additional questions. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, so far, I've had about 15 Inspire inspections demos, and. They've all gone pretty well, and as far as the mitigation portion of it, I know the software recently is there, you have some updates going on, but it's been very easy to update the information and put it in and close out the mitigations. So I wanna say that part of it's good. Um, it does not look like the help desk is working on the uh, reminder email, uh, not taking any calls at this time, so I don't know if that's something you're aware of. And then my question is the chat box. So, is anybody monitoring? Because I've sent uh, some questions before. I was having a couple issues. Um, and if Which so, chat box? Sorry. Under the mitigation, when you're in your defect. I know what you're talking does, about. Yeah. Yeah. And are they interconnected? Or are they the chat only specifically for that one defect? Because if so, it gets hard to remember. It's for that one defect. Okay. And what I think that the, what's happening there is the field office is not receiving the chat. OK. So 
we'll, we'll connect those dots and through training. Right. So that's I, I, hopefully not, yeah. it's a new feature, and I don't think they're aware that it's even there. So right. yes, no problem. Uh, I thought there was one more question. I forgot now. Ah, Should have wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so there's a lot of servicing mortgagee properties that signed up to be in the demo. Uh, I don't know how many made it in, got called or, or anything, but I do know that right now those servicing mortgagee properties technically don't really have an ideal date because if they were done by demo, I don't know what date those were done. So I would assume they'd be done one, two or three years. Yeah. And if they were never done, they have an ideal date from their last UPCS that yeah. could be as 2017. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you have an answer for that, but I just wanted to throw that out there that those demo properties may or may not know when they're due next. Yeah. There's going to be a, a notice going out on, on a lot of the properties that still need a, an inspection. And some of those, a, a portion of those are the uh, servicing mortgagee. And we actually have a meeting on that tomorrow to talk about how we're going to slice and dice that and, um, and, and what our policy is going forward on that. I, there, there will be a, a notice uh, published on that. Or I think multifamily, did they publish it already? Is it, or not No, not yet. So, yeah, multifamily will be publish, publishing a notice on giving options to the some of these demo properties that um, and then we got a policy that's going to fit in based on those decision points so stay tuned your property stay tuned on the and uh, we're going to be covering that in the next couple of weeks okay yeah. um, um, I, I, I would just add that um, we will go through all of the demo properties um, with our program office partners in both multifamily and public housing and effectively uh, determine a a kind of future uh, ideal future date um, based on um, guidance um, so so we will have that that concept um, I can't say exactly what's going to happen but I would expect that a lot of the demo properties particularly the ones that are um, done in this calendar year will probably have an ideal future date um, not within the first 12 months of inspire and potentially into that two to three year window okay excellent and then do you have a plan or an idea of how future inspector training is going to go? Right now, you know, you guys do it. Uh, is this going to be something that everybody has to do on their own? Are we going to have to get senior inspectors and train them to be QCs or, you know, internal? Any, any idea on how that's going to roll? So, so I'm, I'm happy to take that question. And Kevin, if you want to jump in, um, we're working on that now. Uh, I mentioned previously um, our primary objective is to retain our existing inspector pool, um, both our quality assurance inspectors at HUD as well as our um, valued contract inspection partners. Um, but we're also looking at opportunities to expand that pool. Uh, I know in the past we've had conversations with entities that would love to offer their own training um, for inspectors, uh, and we are very receptive to that idea um, and what that potentially looks like. So um, I, I think more to follow. Um, I, one of those entities, for example, is the Mortgage Bankers Association. We've had multiple conversations with them. Um, we know there are other interested parties. Um, there, there's a, a whole industry, right, that provides housing-related training to folks, um, and a number of those vendors have also expressed interest. Uh, we're also looking at um, third-party certifications. Um, so. You know, we've been asked, for example, you know, if I pass the national home uh, uh, home inspection exam, you know, can I be a REAC inspector, right? And so we're evaluating that as well. Um, we'll be putting out a notice on inspector credentialing, um, but since I know we have some of our existing contract inspectors here, I want to reassure them that we're top priority is maintaining that pool. The last thing we want to do when we go live with Inspire is lose a lot of great inspectors. So, um, but we're we're looking at creative ways of expanding the pool and thinking about you know, how we, we make sure there's capacity. I know on the servicing mortgagee side, you guys have had a hard time scheduling inspections, uh, in part because you're competing with us and we're doing a lot of inspections right now um, to get caught up. Um, uh, we want to make sure that there's not those capacity issues in the future. Mm -hmm. All right, anything I can ever do to help, don't hesitate to call. Awesome. And I work with a lot of the MBA clients, so I can save you a step from, from, from all that. But thank you, this is very, very good. That's, this is awesome today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello. A uh, couple questions just on the voucher side of things. I know a lot of the, the app will be a question on how that will work, especially with the pass fail. And is it going to be required that agencies use the app and the data collection piece of, of that? 
And also, what about agencies that are on a two-year inspection cycle? How does that, and I know 321 doesn't really apply to vouchers, so how will voucher uh, scheduling be required? Oh, Georgie, you should have been in the other room. I just answered these questions. Um, no, it's good. Um, great questions, uh, obviously, on folks' mind. Um, we uh, will be working with um, our program office, um, uh, the Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs, and other stakeholders to kind of figure out um, the intricacies of um, you know, the inspection cycles and timeframes that are in PHA's existing admin plans. Um, I think you'll see some more information in the not too distant future on that. Um, also, uh, likely be putting out some guidance, um, letting folks know and hoping to answer some of those questions that people have about. So I'll just give you an example. I've, I've been asked, for example, if Inspire for the Voucher Program goes live on October 1st, can I wait to do all my inspections in September of 2024? Four. Um, and other people have asked, you know, can I spread them out? Other people have brought up the two-year cycle. Um, and so I think we, we, we need to address those questions and get guidance out well before 10-1. In terms of the technology, um, they will not be required to use the inspection app. And in fact, we've had a couple of agencies that um, are, have informed us that they want to continue to do paper-based inspections. So we will be updating the form uh, for that purpose. Uh, we obviously hope people use the inspection app or they uh, ideally um, have a great software vendor that they can uh, use the technology that they provide. Um, and and I, I said this this morning, I expect that um, the, the, the te te technology uh, folks that, that uh, do work in this space are probably gonna create a better mousetrap than HUD. All we're ultimately gonna care about is um, if we do decide to collect any of those results, we'll publish a uniform standard so that any technology platform, as long as they meet that standard, and that's what we're doing with uh, the housing information portal, um, which is the replacement for PIC, where we published a JSON. We basically say, hey, you know, this is the format we need to see the data. Um, it's similar to what Trax does as well. Um, and so as long as you submit it in that format, uh, we'd be good. But I, I would just stress that in the vast, vast majority of cases involving voucher units, we will not be collecting self-inspection results, right? Those will be maintained locally uh, for the PHA's benefit. Um, there may be some circumstances um, that we'll talk about in the administrative procedures notice. That, like, for example, if we have a, concerns about troubled voucher units or troubled properties, we may say, hey, you know what? Um, we could send an inspector back out to do an inspection, but if you in lieu of that, want to send us your self-inspection results, that might be acceptable. I remember what it was now. Um, under the mitigation portion of the dashboard, it does not give you an option for pending. So for example, uh, a GFI replacement is a 24-hour repair, and if it's one where you have to get a contractor out, or ah, in some yeah. cases it's the supply chain has put a delay, um, I'm yeah. continuing to get the reminder emails to do them, but there's no way to let you know that I'm working on it. Okay. So yes. if, if there is a, an option instead of just mitigation completed, uh, pending would be great. We, yeah, we're working on that. That's okay. one of the uh, elements that, that we're going to enhance that's currently in the demo that when we do a, a, a release and based on what you were just talking about, we got that, a, a lot of comments about the supply chain and saying I got a temporary fix, but I need to, you know, what's, what's the future data when you're going to fix that? We're going to have that in the um, IOC um, or the 7 one portion of the of the back end. So there's a Q, uh, this is the next QR code. This is the overall. Right. So, so just in the interest of time, um, you can certainly stay and scan this today. Um, but I do want to get our AV folks. Uh, they have some work to do to wrap up. Um, we'll be sending this out, and these QR codes will work after this session. So. Um, if you also are time crunched, I would just strongly ask that once you get the materials, go to the QR codes um, for this last module and uh, provide us some responses because these are really valuable to us yeah. in refining the materials. Okay. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you all so, so much. It was great to have you here today.